Welcome Woo. back to Amp Conf. Uh, day two. Day two. Yeah. Woo. Woo. 皆さん昨日の夜はいかがでしたでしょうかあのアフターパーティーも、えー、美味しいお酒に、えー、美味しい食べ物に、えー、あとは、まあ、もう最高の DJ ですごく盛り上がったんじゃないかなというふうに思いますが、so、Crystal, how was your evening last night? I mean, we had a great DJ, awesome food and a drink. Yeah, it was so fantastic. Um, the DJ was fabulous, the food was delicious, the drinks were many.、Um, but my favorite part was getting a chance to talk with some of you out in the audience. I got to meet people from all over the world, which again is one of my most favorite parts about AMP. So if we have not had a chance to talk yet, please come up and say hi、um, if you see me out and about. あの私自身はですねあのいろんな理由で全く人的もあの一滴もですねあのお酒飲めなかったんですけどあの今夜はですねもうものすごい飲んでもうグーグルアイオンまでずっと寝てたいなという心づもりで、えー、この二人も上がってるのでぜひとも今日一日どうぞよろしくお願いいたしますという話です。So I want to move on to a different topic.、Um, you said、um, it's your first time in Japan, right? Yes, that is true. So、um, how, would you, how would you describe Tokyo in a single word? Ooh, that is a tough question.、Duh. But、um, I did have some expectations coming into Japan. You know, I've, I've heard of the country before.、Um, but I would say overall, it's been surprising. Some of those expectations have been met, some of them have been more than exceeded, and some of them have been fl flipped completely over upside down.、Um, and then when wandering through the streets of Tokyo,、um, you'll just turn the corner, and all of a sudden, it's like a whole different city. And it's been fantastic finding little hidden gems of temples. So, Definitely surprising. ということであのクリスタルあのいい冒険ができているようで私はもう非常に嬉しい限りでございます。<笑> um, I think we kind of asked a similar question to the audience、um, yesterday. Do you want to go through yeah, it? Yeah, so、uh, we did ask yeah, if you could、here. describe AMP with a single word, what would it be? So thank you everybody who submitted it.、Uh, obviously, we are fast,、yes. but it was also nice to see things like flash and awesome and exciting. And which is this one in Japanese? Um, it's, a, it's really great. Really great. It's awesome. Really, it's awesome. <laughs> so, thank you so much for submitting those. Yeah, and But, I'm seeing like AMP is AMP. And <laughs> yeah, which, which, which yeah is that AMP. is an accurate yeah, description.、Right. AMP. <laughs>、um, so, speaking of exciting, we have some breaking、right. news. And、um, that is just launched yesterday under our documentation is we have development courses. Um, there's three of them available now, and these teach people who don't know anything about JavaScript、um, how to create websites. And they show experienced developers how to build things with AMP. The first course is now available on YouTube. There's other courses coming soon. I highly encourage all of you to check it out. And if you know anybody who's just dying to get started with web development, this is a great place to send them. They don't have to know anything at all, and they can start building websites with AMP today. Right now. So, big round of applause for Ben. Yay! For getting that in time for AmpConf. なので、この AmpConf が終わった後もいろいろ試せるようなマテリアルも用意しているので、もう非常に楽しい、えーえー、句ですね。AmpCon 今後も使っていただけたらなと思いますが、ちょっと私、心配していることが実はあるんですよね。あの昨日のやっぱり、もう繰り返しになるんですけど、お酒もすごく美味しかったし、DJ も最高だったんで、昨日のセッションの内容、みんななんか忘れてるんじゃないかなって、すごい、ものすごい心配してます。So, I'm a little bit worried. I mean, like, I, I just, I, as I said, since like, we had great food and a great DJ, I'm kind of worried that people might be forgetting about the actual content of day one. Yeah, I saw sake getting passed out in these awesome square little boxes. I mean, I didn't know that. And they were filled pretty high.、Seriously? Oh. So,、um, who here still has a good memory? Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> no one. <laughs> so, it's a great thing we put this refresher right. in. Right. So, I'm a little bit worried that people might be forgetting about the actual content of day one. Yeah, I saw sake getting passed out in these awesome square little boxes. I mean, I didn't know that. And they were filled pretty high. So, we're going to do a quick quiz. It's going to be easy, but we want, kind of want to check if you remember the announcement that we did、um, yesterday. So, oh, the first question will be、uh, What does AMP script use to emulate the DOM API in the worker thread? ということで、えー、AMP script というのがあ話がありましたが、AMP script が DOM の API を再現するためにワーカースレッドで使っている、えー、ライブラリというか、えー、ものは何でしょうかという話です。So, the option one will be A. Virtual DOM, B. Worker DOM, C. DOM change list, and D. Shadow DOM. Yusuke, 
I thought you said this was going to be easy. Uh, it's easy. It's easy, right? Um, who thinks it's A, Virgil Dom? Come on. Who thinks it's B, Worker Dom? Ah, uh, <laughs> we don't know the answer yet. Uh, who thinks it's C, Dom Change List? Who thinks it's D, Shadow Dom? Yes, yeah, so you, got, you got it right. You are awake. Um, the answer will be Worker Dom. Yay. Good job. ということで、えー、ワーカードームです。で、ちょっと、あのー、補足をすると、C のドームチェンジリストもすごく面白くて、えー、ワーカードームがやってることのように、ウェブのプラットフォームの仕様として、ワーカースレッド内で、えー、ドームの変更点だけをリスト化して、それをメインスレッドで実行するっていうのを、えー、実現しようと、今、スペック策定中です。なので、えー、昨日のクリスの話からも、ワーカードームの中でドームチェンジリストを使ったとしても、それに互換性があるような作りをしているよって話ですね。で、D のシャドウドームは、まあ、もちろん皆さんご存知だと思うんですけど、えー、ウェブコンポーネントを作る上ではもう欠かせない、えー、技術です。アンプも当然使ってます。HTML と CSS を、えー、カプセル化する、そんなあ技術になります。All right. um, これが、まあ、昨日出したスライドになりますが、まあ、見ての通りですね、アンプスクリプトと、えー、ワーカードム、えー、がお互い通信し合って、この、えー、複雑なものを簡単に、えー、実現していますし、1点だけ補足したいのが、ワーカードムはアンプのためだけのものじゃないんですね。So,、uh, I have to say, worker DOM is not just for AMP, you can use it for normal pages as well. なので、オフザメインスレッドで、えー、もし、えー、DOM を操作したいっていうようなことが起きた場合には、今後はワーカードムがもう一つのオプションになってくるかなというふうに思います。All right. All right, I think we're ready we... for the next one. All right. The next question will be. So, yesterday we had a really great talk on all the new features coming to AMP Stories.、Um, but what was not introduced as a new option that's going to be supported in AMP Stories yesterday? Was it going to be A,、um, AMP Sidebar, B, Attachments, C, Embeds, or D, VR Components? Can I see your hand if you think it was A? What about B? Anybody for C? And finally, D. Oh man, you,、uh. all were, you all were here. <laughs> The answer was D, VR components. <laughs> So, what I find just so exciting about AMP Stories is when they started, it was just kind of this tappable experience. But now that they're adding so many features, it's really a great way to immerse、um, users and readers into this full experience. There's just so many exciting new things coming, and I cannot wait to see what everybody is going to do with this new story experience and all of the different options that the team has been working so hard to make available. あのまさにその通りで、昨日私もなんかいろんな人と話してたんですけど、やっぱアンプストーリーズやりたいという人たちすごいたくさんいて、すごく大手のメディアだとか、まあ、大手の e コマースサイトの運営されている方も、もうこれすぐやるという話もあったので、ぜひですね、やっぱりこれ要チェックですね、えー、ぜひとも昨日のセッションも YouTube で流れているので、えー、もう一度こう、えー、見てみるのもいいかもしれません。So, the next one will be the last one. What was the name of the way we let use AMP components individually without the runtime? I know this was announced in the very last session of day one, and day one was a long you know, day. I'm kind, of, you know, I'm kind of worried that people might have been sleeping in that session. I don't know. This audience kind of seems on top of their right, game. Right, I know, I know, right? I know, right? So, A, Lunchbox AMP. B, AMP. Daba. C, Bento Amp. And D, Doshirak Amp.、Uh, this、oh, question this is, is making is, me、oh. hungry. <laughs> right, right, exactly. It's 9 a.m. in the morning. Yeah.、Um, so who thinks it's A? No one? B? C? Ah,、uh, D. <laughs> This is a I don't sharp see any、audience. Korean people <laughs> raising their hands.、Um, yes, so the,、uh, the answer will be C. And thank you so much for my Indian colleague to、um, provide the lunchbox translation for、uh, Hindi and also Korean. Um, awesome. So, yes, it's Pento Amp. In the past, AMP component was AMP runtime, and it was a game with life cycle. So, 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 it was a game with life cycle. ね、and it's really cool to see 
、えー、とある人がマルテに対してなんでアンプコンポーネントをウェブコンポーネントに使えないんだっていう話を5分間ぐらいしてたのをすごく覚えててあの私もまあその通りだなと思ったんですけどこのように進捗があってすごく嬉しいなと思います。So, I kind of want to ask you folks a question. Who here went to、um, AmpConf 2018 in Amsterdam? A、um, couple of you. So, I really clearly remember that in a QA session,、uh, a person was asking Malte that why can't we use AMP components like web components? And I was like, yeah, why can't we use that? <laughs> <laughs> right? But we are seeing progress here. It's a concept、uh, right now, but it's a progress. Yeah, and Bento AMP, I just want to highlight, is just such a great example of when you ask from AMP, you shall receive. Oh,、uh, yes, yes, exactly. So those community contributions, those community asks, those PR, those、F uh, feature requests, and those issue filing really are making a difference on the future of AMP. Yes,、uh, the feedback loop is very important. あーということで、ベントアンプを使うとですね、今までアンプの導入編が、えっと、いろいろまた別のオプションからこう、が生まれますと。なので、まず最初にアンプのコンポーネント、パワフルなコンポーネント、まず使ってみて、それで成果が出たら、実際にアンプページにこう、移っていくっていう、そういうオプションも生まれるので、まあ、非常にいいことなんじゃないかなというふうに思います。Alright,、uh, should we run through Quickly, yeah, let's、schedules. take a look at what we have going on today.、Um, it is another fantastic day, jam packed full of exciting content.、Um, obviously, you all are excited to be here. You got here half an hour earlier than yesterday at 9 a.m. You're in the seats. Thank you so much for coming. One quick difference I would like to point out is the panel is going to take place today at noon, right before lunch, instead of in the afternoon. で午後もですね、えー、かなり詰まってます、えー、一番最初にアンフォーイメールこれも多分みんなすごい気になると思うんですよねでこれから始まってサインデキシェンジの話が2つでその後休憩を挟んで Vue.js でどうやってアンプを使うかという話にワードプレスで最後に皆さんもう大事なテーマですよねアナリティクスの話がありますのでぜひとも午後も楽しんでいってくださいはい。Google search で AMP を今後どういうふうに使っていくかとかそれ以外のプロダクトをどういうふうにインテグレートしていくかっていうのを聞くのにすごくいいチャンスです、えー、スピーカーはですねモニーシャ、えー、こちらはですね、えー、アジアの、えー、ビジネス開発のリードですねあとベズはあのサーチの VP ですね良一さんは、えー、Google Japan の東京のサイトリードになります、えー、ディオンは Web デブレルですねあのあの YouTube のスターたちの Web デブレルのリードになってきますしそこにマルテが加わるという形になります。So,、um, the first session, the very first session will be the day two keynote. Please welcome Vamsi and Kat. Let's go. <laughs> Morning. I'm a blogger and I write about vintage toothpastes. But my site took longer loading than it takes you brush your teeth. Then AMP came around. Now my site is super fast. Users are happier and I make more money off of ads. Wow, that was amazing. I actually had a dance prepared, but I'm not going to follow that up. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Vamsi. I'm a product manager on the AMP core team. So, when AMP first started, we always designed it on top of user first principles. And advertising is no different. So, quick show of hands how many of you are happy with the current state of advertising? Not me. <laughs> so, there are many classes of problems with advertising on the web. But we actually think we can solve two of them pretty easily with AMP. The first one is around performance, and the second one is security. 
So today, we'll talk about three separate products to address those issues. But first, let's level set with some of the challenges we see with the display ads ecosystem. So this is the first earliest form of print advertising ever known to mankind. It is it's an ad made on a copper printing plate with high degree of skill. And an owner simply hung it on top of their store and had people come visit the store. It's a very simple model. It worked. Advertising on the web has become completely different, though. It comes with the own, its own set of challenges. The number of value-adding marketing technologies has exploded from spam detection to viewability to ad servers to measurement. Advertising on the open web brings a lot of transparency and efficiency, but there is a problem. As the number of, number of people increase in the ecosystem the, and, and delivering the campaign, the transparency decreases. It's hard to pinpoint who's writing inefficient code or who's causing malware. This is a study conducted by the New York Times where they measured how much it costs a single user on a per page data load. And you'll notice that the editorial content is one fourth of that of advertising content. And here's a different type of problem. Traditional ads do this thing called waterfalling, where the initial ad is able to request sort of infinite number of more uh, third parties into the ad. And the problem is, as a result, the ad is only str as strong as the weakest link in the entire waterfall chain. So you'll see things like on the left where seeing pop-ups or on the right having crypto miners mine your CPU off of your devices uh, without your knowledge via ads. So to solve these problems, we created AMP HTML ads. These are display ads written in AMP. Not only do they load faster, but they're also more secure. Let's see why. So since AMP is an open source project and a framework, it's perfectly clear who wrote the code and how performant it is. It's very easy to determine the performance of the code by just simply going in there and looking at it. But the nice thing about AMP is that it won't even get to that point, because if somebody is trying to commit a piece of code that is non-performant, chances are it won't even be merged into the repo. Second, all of the code in AMP HTML ad is declarative, which means that one can't dynamically load more code on top of the existing code, so no more waterfalling. This also allows the ad to be statically validated. So once an ad is valid by the creator, it is, that is the thing that is actually going to run in the browser. There's not going to be more third parties being able to call out and fetch more resources, and uh, we wouldn't have the same problem we saw with waterfalling. AMP is extendable which means that, A, you can build your core building blocks of advertising technology with an AMP. And on top of that, third parties can build their own implementations or third party support within, within uh, those third party building blocks. A good example is Moat, a viewability vendor that is one of the biggest in the industry. And they use AMP analytics, and they've built a Moat extension on top of it, just collecting the same information they need. So as you'll see, Google already serves a number of AMP HTML ads in the ecosystem already. And all of this functionality, which is highly performant, is wrapped into a single library. So the chances are the ad, whenever it serves to a web page, is highly cached in the browser. So for example, if I'm a user visiting uh, site A and end up seeing an AMP HTML ad, and when I go to site B, all of the core infrastructure and runtime is already downloaded for me. So I'm not essentially downloading more bytes. And finally, AMP HTML ads are run on both AMP pages, of course, and non-AMP pages. And mobile app support is coming in summer. So, so far, I've talked about all the wonderful ways AMP HTML ads are great from a user standpoint but they have to make business sense in order for advertisers and publishers to adopt them. So here's the punchline for my entire talk and the one key takeaway, which is that speed directly translates to revenue. This is true in general, right? You, on, on web pages as well. So for example, when you go to a website, if it doesn't load, chances are you're going to bounce. For ads, it's true because publishers lose impressions when ads are slow. And for advertisers, it ends up driving lower click-through rates and viewability. 
Because the chances are you're not going to be able to click on an ad that you don't actually view. So let's look at a bunch of real world examples of how AMP HTML ads drive revenue. So first, I'd like to invite Yasuda san from SoNet to share the experiences with AMP HTML ads. And note, at this point, Yasuda san is going to talk in Japanese. So if you want, please put on your English headsets. おはようございます。え、安田高弘と申します。えっと、本日はアンプ RTB アドバイングプラットフォームと呼ばれているビジネスをしています。日本中の広告枠をリアルタイムで買い付けし、広告を配信しています。サービスの名前はロジックアード、ロジカドと言います。Google 1ヶ月の取り扱っている広告枠は3000億を超えています。様々なデバイスに広告を配信して対応している広告のフォーマットはアンプ モバイルページには通常のHTMLで書かれたHTMページとアンプで書かれたアンプページがあると思います。同じように広告においてもHTMLで書かれたHTML広告とアンプで書かれたアンプ広告があります。私たちはGoogleのエンジニアと協力して
わかりました高速に広告を配信することで広告効果の向上が得られたと考えていますこれらの詳細な数字についてはソネットミディアネットワークスのホームページにも掲載しています広告配信にとってアンプ HTML 広告の利点は3つあると考えています1つ目はこれまで紹介してきたような広告効果の改善です良い結果が得られましたので私たちはできる限りアンプ HTML 広告の技術を使って広告を配信しています2つ目は JavaScript と似たような視覚効果をアンプで実装できることですこのような動きのある広告クリエイティブをアンプの高速で安全な仕様の範囲内で実装することができます3つ目はビューアビリティの計測です通常の HTML で実装するよりも簡単にビューアビリティの計測を実装することができますビューアビリティの計測は透明性の高い広告配信に求められている機能ですこれらの利点を広告主様と共有して私たちのジカドはアンプ HTML 広告の技術を積極的に活用していきたいと思ってますありがとうございました So let's switch to some examples how Google uses AMP HTML ads. So, this is interesting if you didn't know this already. When ads serve, they serve into cross domain iframes. And that's to protect the ad from the page and vice versa. <laughs> But turns out, cross domain iframes are actually pretty expensive to render. In AMP's case, since it's fully validated, There's no custom JavaScript in it, and therefore it can serve into friendly iframes. This speeds up the entire ad and, having,、uh, and ends up driving the AMP HTML ad version to be much faster. And remember how I said speed translates to revenue. So in Google's case, this resulted in 1% higher impressions for publishers, and this is an experiment that was initially run, but it's all across the web right now. Which means that publishers are able to get higher payouts from simply serving the AMP HTML ad version without any changes in the visual quality. And advertisers saw an increase of click through rates of close to 3.83% in CTR and 4.88% at the paid CTR level. So recently, Google Ads mandated that new advertisers coming on board who don't have a reputation history only use AMP HTML ads. And this is to prevent abuse from advertisers creating fake accounts and spreading malware through them. And for established advertisers, Google has begun automatically converting HTML5 ads to AMP HTML ads, by in, but ensuring that visually same whenever possible. But delivering smaller bundle sizes and better ad performance leads to overall just better revenue. Because speed translates to revenue. I'm probably going to report that, repeat that another five times. We've noticed that at the, 70, at the 50th percentile, ads were 17% smaller. And at the 90th percentile, ads were 55% smaller. So that's amazing. More than half the bytes saved for ads. As a result of many of the efforts across Google, similar to these ones, we're seeing that Google now serves 12% of all ads served to the web in AMP HTML. And this is across both, of course, AMP pages, but also non AMP pages because they make up a significant amount of the web today. We continue to get more advertisers on board just natively uploading AMP HTML ads by default. But in order to do this, we need to ensure that there's great creative tooling capabilities. So today, I'm really, really excited to have Ajay Shukla from Adobe Animate come join us to tell you about AMP support in Adobe. Ajay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.、Um, 
My name is Ajay Shukla, and I'm the product manager for Adobe Animate. And I'm very happy to be here to support the wonderful AMP project. So we all know that Adobe has, is at the forefront of creativity. You know, tools like Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Animate, and others have essentially defined what digital creativity could be. Talking about Animate, it has been a tool which is there for almost 20 years. And during this time, it has designed, defined, and nurtured animation in all its forms and on all devices. For those of you who don't know what Animate is, it's the same tool as Flash Professional, so you know, it has been there for, for that long uh, a period of time. Uh, and I'll talk about a little bit about you know, what's the difference between Animate and Flash Pro. It's a very simple tool, and this is just a sample of uh, examples where you know, uh, people who are professionals as well as amateurs have used the tool for creating different kinds of content. It's used in large studios and, and used in schools at the same time. It has many use cases, and one of the prominent use cases is advertising. Today, majority of the HTML5 ads are actually created with Animate. It's a platform agnostic tool. What that means is you can create animations the same way, irrespective of what platform you're tar targeting. And it's a multi-platform tool at the same time, because you can export your animations to any platform of your choice. And we partnered with Google to add support for MP AMP HTML. So why did we do that? Well, uh, we found that AMP is a very performant and secure platform. And from an AMP perspective, Animate is a very simple and visual you know, multi-platform tool. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to create, how to convert, and how to compare ads across HTML5 and uh, AMP. And there's a real-world example that comes from Digitas, which is a publicist company who were trying to create ad creatives for uh, Comcast, and the brand is Xfinity. So let me just show you. Now. Creating AMP-based uh, ads is very simple. What you do is you essentially open an AMP HTML document. And there are four things on this stage. I'm gonna, not going to you know, create the whole ad here, but there are four main things in here. You have the stage, which is at the top. You have the timeline. You have the tools on the right-hand side. And then you have the properties. And using just these four things, you can create any kind of animations including ads. And here's an example. And this is all uh, done in Animate, right? And I'll show you how this looks like. So there's the uh, AMP ad done with Animate. Here's another example done with Animate. So that's the creative aspect. How do, you, how do you create AMP ads from scratch? But let's say you already have HTML5 ad that you've created with Animate. You don't need to recreate that ad. You can actually convert it to AMP, uh, AMP HTML format. So the same ad is available as a, as a canvas ad. And let's say you began with this, and this was canvas ad, and the way I know this is because it says HTML5 canvas. And converting this to AMP is straightforward. You just go here, the file, convert to an AMP HTML. And it's basically converting everything from uh, canvas into AMP. And uh, 
There you go. So this is the AMP equivalent of the HTML5 ad without doing anything uh, or trying to do any animations by yourself. Uh, one thing you would have noticed is in the output panel, there were a bunch of things which uh, showed up. And this is basically when you translate from one platform to another platform, it will basically cut down any uh, features that are not available on a particular platform. So that way, it's a WYSIWYG experience for you. And you can see the difference, crea the creative difference between the uh, HTML5 and AMP. But the other thing to note is now that you have the same ad across AMP and HTML5, you can actually compare how the performance and other metrics are. And uh, we use one of the one of the plugins, which is actually not for uh, not meant for ads. Uh, it's called the Lighthouse plugin, and try to compare and contrast between the two. So on the left hand side is the AMP version, and on the right hand side is the uh, oh this is the Canvas version. So it says Canvas over here. So AMP version and Canvas version, and you can see the first Contentful Paint takes 2.9 seconds on the AMP side as, uh, with, you know, as against 3.7 seconds on the other side. And time to interactive is 2.9 seconds versus 7.0 uh, second on the uh, Canvas side. So obviously, you know, AMP ads are performing much better than the Canvas ads from this metric. Let's look at another, you know, another metric. and. Uh, I'll encourage you to try it out yourself and, and see the comparison. But the, the file size is 342 kilobyte on the AMP side versus 238 on the, uh, on the Canvas side. So Canvas ads are actually smaller as compared to AMP. And uh, we're working with, uh, with Vamsi, and, and he's promised me that you know, they're working on improving the payload size as well. So once that happens, you will have the benefit of the payload size and the performance both. So that was uh, uh, Adobe Animate and creating AMP ads with, uh, uh, with you know, uh, Animate, the creation, the conversion, and the comparison of AMP and HTML5 ads. That's all I had. I'm very happy to, uh, to continue supporting AMP. Cool. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you. There are also a number of other tooling companies adding support for AMP HTML ads. So here's a quick video explaining support for AMP HTML ads in Bannersnack. AMP HTML banner ads are the next big thing in online advertising technologies, which made implementing them a must for Bannersnack. Now you can create better banner ads using the AMP HTML technology in our leading banner design platform. Add images, buttons, or vector elements, all of which can be animated, and the ad for your next campaign is all set. AMP HTML banner ads are faster, lighter, and more secure than traditional HTML, so the demand was inevitable. You can download the whole banner set in AMP HTML with just one click, and it'll be ready to upload to your Google Ads account in no time. Besides, AMP HTML banner ads have smoother animations, an almost instant loading time on any device, and can be up to 50% lighter in comparison with a normal HTML5 banner. These ads are delivered only after being validated, making sure that they're built on high-quality code without any malware. AMP HTML banner ads are supported by a wide range of browsers and many different advertising platforms. That was an ad about creating ads. Very meta. <laughs> So here's the final creation options for an ad developer. Of course, you can just use images or text inside of AMP and have them uh, create simple ads. But we want to provide developers with great creative flexibility. So of course, you can hand code using CSS animations or take full advantage of the Web Animations API. But from a tooling standpoint, there's support from Google Web Designer, Saltra, Bannersnack, and uh, Animate, of course, as you saw. And here's a brief peek into what's coming. I'm not going to go through all of them, but generally, in Q2, we're going to be working on mobile app support. And therefore, an advertiser can create a single ad and have it run across mobile web, app, et cetera. 
In Q3, as Ajay mentioned, we're being, gonna be working on a lighter runtime. So right now we ship the entire AMP page runtime and there's no need because the ads use cases are much smaller. And in Q4, we're going to be supporting gesture support so for more sort of interactive uh, swipe uh, gesture-based ads, and also dynamic ads. So you can do things like fetch client-side information, like being able to load uh, the, the real-time weather in Tokyo right now as you're viewing the ad. So with that, I'm going to turn it on to Kat, Kat and uh, talk about monetization. Thank you, Ramzi. Okay, I'll talk about AMP monetization, and just to be clear, what we mean with that is putting any type of display ad on your websites to make money off of advertising. When we first started with AMP, we really wanted to strike the perfect balance between delivering the best-in-class user experience to users of AMP, but also giving you all the tools to make the most revenue for your business. So here are a few examples of how we do that. For example, any ad on an AMP page has to declare its size before the ad request can be made. That's to avoid content reflow. Interstitials that pop up and block content without any user interaction aren't possible on AMP. And another one which is more recent, when we um, launched FastFetch last year, FastFetch means we fast fetch amp ads on AMP now. They're um, fetched as fast as possible asynchronously, and the ad only renders when it's likely to be viewed. So these are some examples. Having said that, AMP monetization still performs really, really well. And I want to give you some stats, talk about some features, and then we'll look into some success stories. So we talked to our friends at Google Ad Manager and Google AdSense, and they have seen ads on AMP pages grow 300% year over year, which is pretty impressive. And keep in mind that this number does not include other ad networks. AMP supports over 150 ad networks today. It doesn't include direct sold ad revenue either. Um, so this number really shows that publishers using these platforms, they continue to invest in AMP and in AMP monetization. We've done a lot of work over the past few years to make sure that you as publishers that depend on display advertising have all the tools that you need to make the most revenue from your inventory. So I'll go through just a quick list here of things that they are, they're not all brand new, so you might have heard of them, but I want to make sure all of you are aware of these functionalities. For example, you can do ad refresh on AMP. You can do roadblocks on AMP. You can do fluid ads, responsive ads. You can do header bidding on AMP. Um, we actually work with a lot of the top header bidding providers today. They are supported through real-time config RTC. You can integrate with data management platforms and consent management platforms. I'll come back to that in a second. You can do video advertising. You can um, benefit from fast fetch, which I just mentioned earlier. And you can do auto ads. So these are just some examples. I want to continue by just calling out the top, um, the most recent four launches that we've done in this space, which you might not have heard of yet. So I'll start with this one. Um, we enhance the AMP consent functionality. Let me explain to you what that means. Publishers are facing an increasing ask for providing users with consent choice and consent notice, for example, due to the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, in the EU. So last May, um, we launched AMP Consent. It's a component that makes it super easy for you to manage consent flow on AMP inventory. What's really brand new is that we launched um, the capability to integrate with third-party consent management platforms, which we know many publishers work with. So if you work with one of them, tell them it's time to integrate with AMP because we got this functionality ready. AMP IMA Video is a component we launched over a year ago to, to make it really easy to do video advertising on video content on AMP with the IMA Video SDK. And you can do that with any of the ad networks that support that SDK. So we just launched a couple of enhancements to that functionality. For example, you can show control video controls when you hover over the video. You can mute, unmute the video. You can replay or loop the video. I want to thank Rebecca Close, an engineer at BuzzFeed. She contributed and tested all of this, which is really amazing. 
we launched iframe sandboxing for all ads on AMP. What does that mean? iframe sandboxing allows web developers to set restrictions to the capabilities an iframe can perform, like the rendering of display ads. AMP now uses this functionality to sandbox all ads on AMP, which completely eliminates the risks for auto-redirect ads, for example, and therefore protects the user. This is now working for all users of Safari, Chrome, and any other browser that supports iframe sandboxing, which is about 75% of the mobile web. And one more example is no more, uh, no more synchronous requests from ads on AMP pages. Synchronous requests um, are a really bad user experience. They completely block the user from being able to do anything with the page until the network request either succeeds or fails. Um, the problem is in display advertising, there's no incentive for for de de developers of ad creatives to write efficient code, right? So that opens up opportunities for bad ad creators to do things that they shouldn't. For example, um, something like trying to artificially drive up viewability by firing heavy synchronous requests to the page, which completely blocks the user to do anything when the ad comes into the viewport, and you're forced to look at the ad, artificially driving up the viewability, bad user experience. We don't want that. Thankfully, Chrome released a feature policy that allows deprecating synchronous requests on iframes. And we basically turned that on by default for all ads on AMP. OK, before I go on into success stories, I just want to make one point. We do a lot of work to give you all the tools that you need, as I just said, and I mentioned some examples. But at the end of the day, if you don't put the same amount of effort into making monetization perform on AMP as you do on your non-AMP inventory, you just won't see the same results. So this is a reminder for you to do your homework. And if you don't believe me, I have some really cool examples for you of publishers that have actually really succeeded and seen amazing results. OK, let's look into this. ET Today, number one news site in Taiwan. They um, have started with AMP, I think, in February last year. By April, they decided, let's do it for the entire website. And then a few months in, they started to really go into optimization. And they are a great example of a publisher that uses a variety of ad formats to make the most out of their monetization. So they, for example, implemented a sticky ad unit at the bottom of the page, which you can see in the screenshot. They also use auto ads to automatically place and optimize the ad formats they have throughout the pages. And they use AdSense match content, which helps place organic content and ads at the bottom of the page. So here are the results. They increased speed four times through AMP. Ad revenues were up 10 times, which is incredible pretty insane. And CPMs were up, up to 150% through the optimizations that they did. Next example, Jagra New Media, really big uh, media company in India. And they have several websites. One of them is the number one Hindi news platform, jagran.com. They are a great example of a publisher really going deep into the data to reshape their AMP and AMP monetization strategy. So what they did is they really looked into the Google Analytics data they had and the Google Ad Manager data they had for ad serving, and they tried to understand what's going on, how they can make more out of their AMP inventory. And they realized 90% of their article pages had AMP equivalents, but only 13% of their organic traffic actually landed there, and only 1.25% of ad requests were coming from AMP. So something was off. So they started fixing these things, and they increased AMP coverage on their website. They also put the same amount of ads on their AMP inventory that they had on their non-AMP inventory, and here are the results. 4.5 times more ad revenue, 15% higher revenue overall from all their mobile traffic, and 115% more AMP page views. Before I go to the next success story, I quickly want to hone in on one best practice that we often see publishers neglect when it comes to monetization. And that is making sure that all your ad demand that you have on your inventory also has access to AMP inventory. 
let's say your classic example, your large news publisher, you have some really high-priced, direct-sold advertiser campaigns come in on the one hand. Then you might do header bidding, and you might work with exchanges, and you might have ad networks, etc. Obviously, the higher de demand, the higher the revenue, right? Simple rule of economics. That same thing applies to AMP inventory. So make sure all your AMP inventory has access to the same ad demand. A great example here for a publisher that has really taken that advice to heart is Times of India. Times of India started implementing AMP first on a few sections of their site. When they saw performance go up, they then increased it to all of their site. And today, they actually use AMP on more than eight of their, their websites, which is amazing. And they are a great example of a publisher optimizing their demand on AMP, but also add density. And here are the results. Page load time on 3G increased 3.6 times. Revenue was up 1.5 times from advertising, and overall traffic increased six times. Last success story. This is a really interesting one. It's coming from Europe, where the Spanish language, number one Spanish language news medium, El País, part of the Spanish Prisa group, they collaborated with the German automotive company Volkswagen, El País is an early adopter of AMP technology. They have been using it from the very beginning, and they wanted to collaborate with an advertiser that was really interested in also trying to use new technology to make the most out of their advertising campaigns. And they've done something very unique that actually to date nobody else has done, but maybe that's going to change starting today, which is they combined AMP technologies across the funnel, basically, of advertising. They put an AMP HTML ad on the publisher's AMP inventory, and when you click on that, you would land on a landing page from Volkswagen, also in AMP. And they noticed the more AMP they added into the mix, the better were the results. So the results are... CTR went up by almost 90%, cost per acquisition dropped 40%, and the conversion rate went up by almost 80%. All right, I'll leave you with that, and I'll hand back to Bamzi. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. <laughs> Hi there, it's me again. So I'm so excited to talk about this section. I'm not supposed to pick favorites, but this is my favorite section. <laughs> So if you were here yesterday, you saw the amazing presentation by Hong and John on stories and their tremendous rise in bite-sized visual-first content. We think stories can be used as an opportunity to make advertising much more beautiful and immersive than the current state. So there's diverse ways of monetizing stories, and today we're going to talk about three of them. First up is story ads. So if you're a publisher who's created a story, let's say, 10 Great Things About Dogs, how do you monetize or fund them? To answer this, we actually look back to borrow principles from beautifully created magazines. When you look at a beautiful magazine, the ads are immersive and take up the entire page. The ads are placed tastefully in the right section, not very overloaded. And finally, they're flexible. It's a blank canvas, and an advertiser can mix and match the images and whatever else they need. With story ads, we want to ensure that ads were immersive and take up the entire real estate available. We also want to ensure that the ad is only available and shown when the ad is loaded fully in the background. So here's an example of BMW showcasing autonomous driving. And the placement of the ad is orchestrated by the AMP Stories runtime. The runtime op optimizes the ad in a way that it loads the ad in the background and only shows it, just like a magazine, when the user gets to that particular page. This has a really good benefit, which is balances, uh, gives the responsibility back to the runtime to balance the ad density with publisher revenue. So in that particular case, when the ad's ready, it just splices it into the runtime. Third, story ads are open and flexible. So basically, advertisers can use whatever they want to create in this beautiful real estate, be it images, video, timeline-based animations, and they're all based on top of, built on top of the AMP HTML ad framework. So the capabilities are endless. An independent agency also put story ads to test compared to regular 300 by 250s. And they did better in all metrics around, across awareness, consideration, and feature awareness. 
So story ads are already live for publishers using Google Ad Manager. So if you're an advertiser in this particular case, it's Intuit. You can basically go talk to any publisher that's serving stories or creating stories and uses Google Ad Manager and to have them deliver to those stories. So here's an example of a Washington Post story that is talking about dogs. And when the time's ready and the ads load in the background, the Intuit ad just shows up. In the future, in the sum, uh, later this summer, we are working on programmatic support. So advertisers can directly use DB360 to target any publishers across the world using Google Ad Manager and directly deliver their ads to those stories. And to make it super easy, we created beautiful story ads and put them up on amp.dev. So of course, the canvas is entirely flexible. You can do whatever you want with it. But we wanted to quickly get you started with a few common formats. And all of these are available today at amp.dev. So you can download them, customize them, do whatever you'd like with them. So next, let's talk about affiliate links. Affiliate links are links which allow a publisher to monetize their outgoing links when a user purchases something on the advertiser's landing page. In a way, stories already support affiliate links. You can add outgoing links within a story page. So if you tapped on Get Now, for example, you'd go out to the landing page. But we wanted to make the experience more consistent across users for all, all publishers. So affiliate links will uniformly pulse at the system level to show that it is an affiliate link. And when a user taps on them, the publisher can control what they show, including things like the price of the product or the domain that it's going to. So in this example, it's very clear where the user's headed to, on what the prices are, et cetera. We think it overall improves the user experience. So last of the last section, let's switch gears to sponsored stories. What we mean by sponsored stories are just stories which are created by advertisers for marketing purposes. For example, here's a sponsor story that was created by L'Oreal for promoting their new product, La Roche Passée. This works great for L'Oreal because they're able to tell a brand story across really quickly tapping through uh, bite-sized information about what the product capabilities are, features are, in a mobile-friendly way. So instead of creating a new web landing page, L'Oreal has just created a new story. And L'Oreal uses their offline to online strategy using QR codes to drive people to view these stories, either in the back of the box or using physical QR code stations inside of the store. Notice how quickly the AMP story loads instead of maybe you having to download an app from an app store to talk, you know, view more things about the story. And large publishers already have existing sponsored content businesses. And we think stories are a great medium to tell those editorial features, uh, ed editorial vo give an editorial voice to advertising. So here's an example from Telegraph, created a story on behalf of Guernsey, telling a rich story about Guernsey. And of course, since these are AMP stories, they also work beautifully on desktop. But the key question in advertising is, now you have this beautiful experience, how do you drive traffic to them? How do you get users to actually view them? Here's a few, a few examples. The first one is when you use a sponsor story as a landing page on Google Ads, it is automatically delivered from the AMP cache. And therefore, for, from a user standpoint, the experience is really snappy. Most social media tools already have a rich preview. So when you use a sponsor story, you already get a very rich preview for users to go to. And sponsor stories can also be embedded inside of regular web pages, because sponsor stories are just literally a landing page. So you can embed them inside of an iframe, have an experience where you can autoplay these stories, and when the user taps on them, they launch into this beautiful experience. Last but not least, you can also use, have users explore a sponsored story from a story ad inside of an organic story and have them view a sponsored story. So in this case, BMW has built an immersive storytelling experience in a sponsored story. This is just miles better, miles away better than, for example, if you loaded this in a regular text landing page. I'm, I'm just inspired. I don't have the money, but maybe I will buy a BMW someday. So to recap, we have three product offerings. Story ads to help publishers monetize story, affiliate links to help publishers monetize their outgoing links, and finally, sponsor stories for advertisers and publishers to be able to tell rich, beautiful, immersive storytelling experiences. 
And you can find all about all of this and more at m.dev slash stories. And I'd like to turn it back to Kat to summarize. Thank you, Vamzi. OK, I'll do a quick recap. So in the beginning of the keynote, you heard Vamzi talk a lot about AMP HTML ads. The one thing we want you to take away from that is that all the benefits and the performance improvements of AMP HTML ads really lead to a better ROI for advertisers, also for publishers. And on top of that, they lead to a better ad experience for the users. When it comes to monetization of AMP, Keep in mind that we always try and strike that balance between the good user experience, but also have so many tools out there for you to actually make really good revenue from AMP inventory. And last but not least, on story ads, I encourage you to watch that space. There's a lot happening there, and there's a lot of room for true innovation to create a really immersive, rich new ad experience. We're excited to be on this journey and have you be a part of it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Wasn't that ukulele performance just wonderful? Can we give Kat another round of applause? That was, I know I will be singing that in my head all day. And another big thank you to all of our day two keynote speakers. Um, understanding and leveraging ads and keeping them user friendly is so important to not just your AMP pages, but to the web ecosystem as a whole. Speaking of leveraging, our next talk is gonna cover some really interesting things about AMP, and that's gonna be about how you and your development team can leverage all the built-in benefits that not only AMP has, but that the AMP team provides as a whole um, to improve your development workflow. It's a, it's a talk I'm just so excited to hear because it's a side of AMP I don't think is discussed nearly enough. So please give a warm, warm welcome to Nana onto the AMPConf stage. Thank you. The good thing is I've already had my clumsy moment coming on, so we're all good now. Um, good morning, everyone. And to folks on the live stream, good evening, good afternoon, or just about good night. As Crystal mentioned, my name is Nana, and I'm a product manager on the AMP project. I'm incredibly honored, nervous, and excited to be here today to talk to you about how engineering teams can best use AMP to really accelerate their workflow while making the correct decisions for their users. Now, we know why AMP makes sense for a user. AMP helps engineering teams create an inclusive space for their users, regardless of device specs, network connectivity, or geographic location. And Kat and Mamsie just highlighted why AMP makes sense for businesses and how it helps them increase their revenue. But what I'm here to talk to you about is why AMP makes sense for engineering teams. Now, as the numbers of frameworks increase, engineers are often put into the position of picking a technology that best sets them up for success. This involves picking something that is easy to get started with, easy to maintain in the short term, and one that helps reduce the burden of long-term maintenance. And we believe that AMP is that well-lit path that allows engineering teams to make the best decisions for their users. And much like any other software as a service, by using AMP, engineering teams can really help accelerate their workflow. Now, to better understand how AMP can help you as an engineering team create a great product, Let's look at a product life cycle. First, the product, engineering, and UX teams will get together in a room to create and then validate their minimum viable product. And then based on those results, these teams will work on the MVP to then migrate it to a fully viable and validated product. This means they have to ensure that they retain the value of the MVP while also providing users with a great experience. And once the product is out to market, engineers will spend a large part of their time doing long-term maintenance. This includes fixing bugs, releasing new iterative features, or just dealing with growing tech debt. And during the rest of my talk, I'm going to walk through the different stages of a product and convince you that AMP can be a great solution as your product moves from one stage to another. So let's get started. Now, as a team, when you're kicking off a new project and picking the set of technologies to use, you're trying to look for something that can help you prototype and iterate on feedback really quickly. 
Now let's think about what actually hinders this process. The first problem that engineering teams often face when working on their MVP is being pulled away from working on core product logic by infrastructure needs, such as updating dependencies or two third-party components, components just not working together. And the second problem you'll often face is that you spend a large amount of your time poring over large amounts of documentation or looking things up on Stack Overflow as you just try to debug issues that seem simple but turn into their own beasts. Now, we believe that AMP is a great tool to help you get started working on your MVP because it solves these problems. And let's see why. Now, the increasing number of web technologies that are up for offer have made the learning curve for web development incredibly steep. But since AMP pages are essentially HTML pages with limited CSS and JavaScript, they help reduce the time that an engineering team spends ramping up on a project. And this allows them to focus on one thing and one thing only, the product and the product's users. And we, in fact, help you along this process a little bit more by helping make really hard web development concepts easier to deploy on ARM pages. And one example of this is this push these days for websites to merge the speed, the performance, and the offline capabilities offered by apps with the meritocracy and the easy access that is provided by the web. And one way that developers do this is by using progressive web apps, or PWAs. Now, PWAs essentially harness the power of service workers to provide great offline experiences to users, regardless of their network strength, their device, et cetera. Now, usually, setting up a service worker is really hard. However, when you actually think about service workers in relation to other frameworks, that's another beast to understand altogether. But as Malta mentioned yesterday, we're releasing something called OneLine Service Worker a tool that promotes your AMP pages to a fully network-resilient PWA AMP experience, helping boost its performance straight out of the box. And this is how simple it is to get started with a, with a one-line service worker. Right? Within your service worker file, you'll actually import the AMP service worker library, and then you'll initialize it. Now, who here noticed that that's at minimum two lines? I did, um, and I was quite upset. But turns out that there's this really cool short-circuiting trick that you can use to actually make that one line. And you can rest easy just like I did. Now let's take a look at what a demo would look like when you do deploy a one-line service worker. Here's an example that we pulled out from amp.dev. It's an art gallery site. It's a pretty good-looking art gallery site, right? It has a great home page. It has some great images and fonts. And what you can't see in here in this demo, because I'm lazy, is it has some great animations as well. And here's what it looks like offline. Not a great home page, not great fonts, and not great images. Now, if you were on Chrome, the offline dyno experience would make this a little bit better, but nothing is as good as your site. However, when you fix this by deploying a one-line service worker, you get this. Your online and offline experiences are the same, and all it took you was two lines. It's, I still can't get over the fact that the one-line service worker is two lines. Now, in order to understand how the one-line service worker works and will be helping you, let's see how a site usually evolves into a PWA AMP experience. Right? You've got your phone, you open up the browser, and you enter a URL, which then makes a request. This request is received by your server. Now, usually, you, you have to host all of your site's resources on this server. This includes your markup, images, fonts, and other assets, but it also includes analytics configurations that you honestly don't really understand, and third-party JavaScript that's just adding bloat to your page. And then your server will respond with all of these resources, and the browser, upon receiving them a little while later, will finally render a page onto the device. Now let's actually pause to think about what's happening here. Usually, each engineering team that is deploying a product to the web has to wear two hats. The first is that of a product engineering team one that writes the core product logic that, that is implementing the web app. And the second is that of an infrastructure team, one that ensures that the product is secure, accessible, and up to date with the web development best practices. Now, we on the AMP project believe that we're best suited to take on the hat of the infrastructure team. Why? Because AMP is at its core an infrastructure team that is providing you with the components that create the best user experience, as well as the tools that are needed to create the most performant site. And it does so while abstracting away really painful tasks, such as dependency management and long-term maintenance. And which is why, when you switch to an AMP-first site, you're able to focus on just the product and only ship assets from your server that are specific and custom to your product. 
and you instead trust the AMP team to act as your infrastructure team and focus on shipping the infrastructure that is needed for your site to not just function, but function performantly, function securely, and function accessibly. And AMP does so by serving the AMP runtime that governs all AMP pages and ensures that we have viewport management and security, but by also serving the components that make up a rich AMP experience. This means that the AMP CDN is helping share the load of the assets that need to be served for your site to function correctly. Now again, when you start to evolve your AMP for site into a PWA AMP experience, you're once again starting to think about the infrastructure needs of your product. And this is such a shame, since you just trusted the AMP infrastructure team to take on these infrastructure needs, and you were just focusing on the product. But by using AMP's one-line service worker, you're once again able to trust the AMP infrastructure team to handle this bit of logic while still getting the benefits of a network-resilient PWA AMP experience. And to see the one-line service worker in action, you can just go check out uh, amp.dev. Here, the AMP team has deployed the one-line service worker to make it truly network resilient. And this site is a true testament to the fact that you can deploy a service worker to a site that has responsive assets, dynamic content, and complex animations, and still do it easily. And actually, let's take a look at what the amp.dev service worker looked like. Right? They imported the service worker module, and then they initialized the service worker module, as you've seen here. But they also added some other value on top of it to really help move forward the default service worker experience. And so they decided what, uh, what assets they wanted to cache offline, and they specified a caching strategy. And then they also specified what the offline experience needed to look like. Now let's take a look at another way that AMP makes it easy for an engineering team to get started. Documentation is one of the first places any engineer will revert to when debugging implementation issues. That is after we banged our head against the wall for a bit. And documentation is often hard to understand. It covers the getting started part of any project, but it doesn't actually help you understand how to deal with the complex issues that you're fighting with on a daily basis. Now, AMP documentation is not just filled with examples of how to use AMP extensions in their isolation, but also guides and tutorials on how to create really complex experiences, such as checkout flows, for example. And then this documentation is further localized and internationalized to help large international teams have a shared understanding of the AMP code base. And one example of us getting documentation right is animations. Now, animations are a difficult to grapple topic at best. And the fact that the web has about three and a half standardized ways of animating a div from left to right doesn't make this topic easy to understand. In fact, how does one animate things? What is a performant animation? And what's the difference between a CSS and a JavaScript animation? Crystal had the same questions and actually put together some excellent resources on how to create simple and complex animations in AMP. And both of these are resources you can find on amp.dev. Now, the AMP project doesn't just create great documentation. We also believe in reducing an engineer's reliance on this documentation. And one example is our Visual Studio Code extension that makes authoring AMP documents really easy by checking your documentation for validation errors as you code along, helping you iterate really quickly. Now, once you've read the documentation, you've written up your MVP, and you've actually validated it, the next step is to scale this MVP into a fully-fledged viable product that retains the value of the MVP, but adds some great user experience on top of it. And some of the things that are top of mind for any team at this stage are the fact that as you write more code, you're taking on the responsibility of ensuring that your code meets all of the web development best practices as and when they're discovered. And in fact, these best practices become really hard to maintain as your project goes on and will often lead to a growing tech debt in your project. And secondly, imagine this. right? You're trying to create a product details page, and you found two components that work well together in theory. But then you start writing the code, and you realize that their APIs don't just line up together. And so you hack them together. And guess what? Five months down the line, you'll have more tech debt. And the last and most painful task that any project that needs to keep top of mind is dependency management. As you Im import more third-party libraries, more components, your infrastructure team needs to start thinking about dependency management actively to make sure your product is secure, is accessible, and even just usable. Now, we believe that AMP can be of great assistance here, and let's see why. 
the one benefit that AMP provides you over other frameworks is the guarantee that all AMP components meet a certain benchmark of performance, accessibility, internationalization, and security by default. And the AMP team guarantees that the code we produce reflects the best UI practices as and when they're discovered. And one example of this is our ability to ensure that all components released meet high accessibility standards. Now, the web content accessibility guidelines that are set out by the W3C set out this tiered criteria to measure how accessible your site is. And by at least maintaining a WCAG AA rating, you're best set up to meet the accessibility standards of your country. Now, this could be Section 508 in the US, EN301 guidelines in the EU, or the relevant accessibility laws right here in Japan. Now, AMP components go through extensive accessibility audits by the UI and Accessibility Working Group, which allows us to ensure that all AMP components enable you to meet not just WCAG AA compliance, but go one step further and help you meet AAA compliance as well. Now, we also have the Performance Working Group that is responsible for monitoring and improving AMP's performance for all AMP pages. And members of the Performance Working Group, for example, are the ones who worked hard on making the one-line service worker a reality. And it's through work like this that the AMP project ensures that not only do we perform optimally on our end, but that we also provide you with the tools that are necessary to make your site performant. And another way that AMP helps you create great user experiences is by leveraging AMP's working groups. Now, AMP consists of working groups, as you've heard, that specialize in creating great experiences within their domain. And this gives AMP an edge in being able to ensure that all of AMP's offerings work well with each other and help you create great end-to-end -end experiences. And a large, part of our a large part of our process here is actually facilitated by our design review and our intent process. Now, design reviews allow us to ensure that all concerned working groups are able to use their experience within their domain to ensure that all components that are shipped by the AMP project are performant, accessible for the user, but also profitable for businesses and developers. And a large part of this design review process is seeded by our intent process, where any contributor wanting to ship uh, ship or deprecate something has to document their thought process so that all stakeholders have the relevant information needed to make an informed decision. And the last way we help you create great user experiences is by actually just helping you offload some really painful tasks such as dependency management. Now, like I mentioned before, AMP is at its core an infrastructure team. It helps you provide as it helps engineering teams provide it helps provide engineering teams with tools to offload other tasks such as dependency management and other compliance that is needed. And a lot of this is made possible by our infrastructure working group. Our infrastructure working group ensures that all packages used within AMP are always updated. And this allows developers to gain productivity by allowing them to just focus on their core product logic and offloading these painful tasks, which can usually be a huge expense in terms of time and money. Now, speaking of dependency management and actually keeping things up to date, a large part of AMP's value proposition, like Malta mentioned in the keynote yesterday, is that we have an evergreen release where every week we update the runtime that governs AMP, as well as the components that help create a great AMP experience. This allows us to offer cutting edge updates and features to all developers using AMP. And how are we able to do this? The first way we ensure that our code is of the highest quality is by creating a really strong infrastructure that allows us to create end-to-end -end integration tests that thoroughly check how components work in isolation as well as with other components. Next, we also automate as many tests as possible on our end to make sure that we're catching issues as we iterate on code. And the third way that we ensure that we ship only high quality code is by making sure that we cut a canary with all code the week before we cut a production release. This way, partners that are using AMP can actually test their sites and their use cases against the AMP runtime and add their feedback to our heavily QA process. And at this point, I just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone who does opt into the Canary. It really helps us get gain incredibly valuable feedback, and your friendly AMP infrastructure team really appreciates the feedback you're giving. Now, because I can't stay on stage for more than 30 minutes, and because there's a coffee break right after, let's just say that the AMP infrastructure working group works a lot more to make sure that AMP's releases are always stable, secure, and offer you the most cutting-edge features. 
Now let's take a look at the last stage in a product development lifecycle, and the most painful stage. It's long-term maintenance. Now, if you asked any engineer, they would tell you that their code doesn't age gracefully. It's quite the opposite, in fact. And why is this the case? First, as you start using a, a component from one project and then you add in another component from a different project, you realize that they don't work together. And then you don't really know where to file an issue, and so that languishes forever, and eventually you'll hack around it. But later, one of these components will change their API, and once again, you'll have to hack around your code. Uh, all of this is leading to increasing amounts of tech debt in your project. And secondly, while adding in, and while adding in best practices at the start of a project is a hard task, Folding in, folding in best practices over the duration of a project is a much more difficult task, in fact. And this is why engineering teams will, towards the end of their project, usually just uh, scrap their entire project and start a whole bunch of refactoring. And this is how AMP helps here. We do so by maintaining a closed feedback loop with developers using AMP through conferences like, through, uh, conferences like the AMP Conf or through AMP Roadshows or through GitHub. Now, we believe that we do a great job in releasing high-quality components that help developers get the job done. But we also make sure that we have this closed feedback loop so that we can make sure that we're improving our offerings in the long run as well. And let's take a look at some of this feedback loop that we've had with developers deploying AMP experiences. Now, the first example of this is us implementing element-level infinite scroll. This feature is incredibly useful for users because it helps create an engaging experience by making sure they don't have to click for more content. Now, this work was actually kicked off by members of Pinterest engineering team based on their experience creating infinite scroll for Pinterest. And then the AMP UI working group picked up this work and built it into AMP list in close partnership with AliExpress and other partners who were part of our origin trial process. And because of this process, gave us near real-time feedback as they deployed infinite scroll onto their sites. Now, at this point, again, I'd like to take the chance to thank everyone who does opt into our origin trial process for working so closely with us and being such a rich source of actionable feedback. Now, we believe that regardless of what vertical you're using AMP for, be it publishing or e-commerce, two of the most important thing for things for your users to be able to do is find content quickly and then take action on that content quickly. And this is where autocomplete becomes the bread and butter for creating a great search and form-filling experience. Now, we originally had an example of how you could create a great autocomplete experience on AMP.dev, and this used the magic of AMP bind and AMP list. However, that didn't fully express the powers of an autocomplete feature because it missed things like type ahead, client side filter, et cetera, which is why we're excited to announce that we're working hard on releasing a new component called AMP Autocomplete. Now, members of the UI working group are actually working on creating this component and drew up this demo where you can actually see how, to, uh, how far two airports are. Now, it turns out that AmpConf has traveled 5,789 miles east since our last AmpConf in Amsterdam. And if you want to find out where the next AmpConf is, please find Paul and then let me know what the answer is. Now, we have over time received a large amount of feedback regarding Amp Carousel. And we hear you. And as Andrew mentioned in his talk yesterday, we're working on releasing a new, new set of carousel primitives that help de developers address real business use cases with great ease. And some of these use cases are a news gallery that helps you really, really, uh, that helps you really highlight the powerful images that accompany a news article, a homepage carousel that allows you to quickly highlight the new information on a site, a product gallery that will help users understand more about the product they're about to buy, related lists to help keep the user engaged, as well as other experiences such as recipes, et cetera, that rely on a horizontally scrolling div. Now, we're working hard on AMP Carousel, and we promise to have it ready for you very soon. Now, switching gears to how developers serve AMP pages. AMP Toolbox App Optimizer actually currently helps you generate transformed AMP pages that offer a better loading experience for AMP pages that aren't served from the cache. However, publishing AMP transformed AMP pages has been incredibly tedious because they're considered invalid AMP by the validator. Now, as was mentioned on the TSC panel yesterday, I'm also excited to announce that we're starting to work on ensuring that the AMP validator will support the validation of all transformed AMP pages. And once this has launched, 
Publishers can choose to tra can, can choose to publish transformed, transformed AMP pages in a paired AMP approach or in an AMP first approach while making sure they get great performance even if their documents aren't served from the cache. And speaking of loops, let's actually close the loop on one line service worker by talking about some upcoming features. The first is an ability to force an update for the service worker if you believe that the deployment has gone wrong. And the second is the ability to automatically deliver optimized AMP pages from the service worker, which really helps given the change we're making to AMP Toolbox Optimizer. Now, one of the best decisions an engineering team can make is picking a technology stack that helps make dealing with growing tech debt easy by helping you stay on the correct path. By using AMP, engineering teams can leverage the learnings of all engineers that are, working to, that are contributing to the AMP project. And you get these learnings for free. And these learnings are, are actually informed by not just bugs that are being filed or features that are being raised, but also as the team incrementally iterates by uh, incrementally, uh, incrementally improves the experience offered in AMP based off of experimentation or research that is conducted by our, by our great team. And these improvements are then offered to your products and users without any involvement from your engineers. Now let's take a look at how AMP helps you fold in web development best practices for free. The first way we do this is by working closely with standard bodies to ensure that engineers who are using AMP are always getting cutting edge technology fast. And one of the projects that we're really excited about working with is Animation Worklet. It is something that allows you to write programmatic stateful animations that will still run at the device's native frame rate. And this will help you create jank-free smooth animations. Now, we're currently working with the Chromium project to actually deploy Animation Worklet under the hood for all of our scroll-bound animations. And this means that all position-bound animations will be running jank-free on our worker thread soon. Now, we've also been iteratively making changes to AMP components that are already released. And some of these are images and lightbox gallery. And let's see some of the improvements we've been making to this. Now, one problem that developers often face when creating a really responsive site is dealing with responsive assets. And in the attempt to deal, to actually provide a great experience to users, what developers will often do is load unnecessarily large images for very small devices. Now, we've been making improvements to AMP image so that developers are always downloading the right size image for all devices, which makes images, image loading much faster on mobile devices. Another problem that our team observed was that currently images are seen as static content that can't really be interacted with. In fact, rich images with great detail are hard to engage with on small devices such as mobile phones. And which is why the AMP team will now automatically add the lightbox attribute to all images where it makes sense. This means users can tap on this image to interact with it and see the great rich details that publishers have been actually, that, and the great rich great details on images that photographers have worked really hard on. And then while the content is in lightbox mode, we're incorporating more app-like polishes for all AMP pages, which will help increase the delight of using an AMP page for your user. And one example of this is us improving our swipe to dismiss interaction so that we are reducing the jarringness when the image is transitioning from lightbox mode to the inlined article. Now, another project that the AMP team has taken on is that of refreshing our loaders. Now, currently, while you're waiting for content to appear, you'll see these three dots for all content, except for ads, where you'll see the ad badge. Now, if you haven't seen them, don't worry. That's a good thing. You have great network speed. But not everyone does. And we interviewed people who interacted with the web and realized that these loaders neither created the perception of speed, nor did they make our users happy. And so we've been working on revamping our loaders. Now, the first loader that you see here is one that will be rendered for all AMP components, regardless of what it is. It could be iframe, lists, or carousels. The second loader that you see here is our revamped ads loader. And the third, and the one that I'm the most excited about, is a content-aware loader that will help your users understand what kind of content to expect. Now, here you can see the Pinterest badge indicating that the content about to load is an AMP Pinterest embed. And we'll also scale these to other content such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. Now, we're very excited, and we're hoping to get these new loaders to use soon. And speaking of loaders, while AMP, component is uh, while AMP components are being loaded, they currently display this static loading indicator, as you can see. 
However, this, this creates an immediate jump from the indicator to the fully lendered component. And this is usually really jarring for users, especially if they're on slow network speeds, which is why we're adding a new mechanism, whereas we'll transition from a blurry image to a full-sized full image to help reduce the jarringness of actual content being loaded. Now, this was a whirlwind tour of all the components that AMP has to offer that will help you stay on the well-lit path by folding in web development best practices into AMP. Now, let's take a look at that product lifecycle again. AMP helps your engineering team create and then vi validate your minimum viable product with great ease by allowing you to focus solely on product development. Then, as your MVP evolves into a fully validated product, AMP works with you to make sure that this version of the product not only serves users' needs, but provides them a delightful experience. And then once this product is out into market, AMP lightens the load of long-term maintenance for, for this product by helping you iteratively fold in web development best practices while having to offload really painful tasks such as dependency management. And all in all, I have demonstrated to you that AMP is a valuable tool for all engineering teams, and this means that you're excited about using AMP and have questions. So to learn more about all the content that I have shared with you, you can first of all go to the design and the UX booth if you want to engage with our amazing design, uh, UX designers and researchers who work on the AMP project. Now, as was mentioned yesterday, we're incredibly eager to chat with developers about their experience with AMP and just learn about your thoughts. And if you have questions about how to make your site interactive and performant, you can go to the interactivity and performance booth where folks from the UI and accessibility working group as well as the performance working group will be eager to chat with you. And with that, I first wanted to just thank all the members of the AMP project, especially those from the UI and accessibility working group and the performance and infrastructure working group who have made this all possible. I'm here merely as a messenger communicating their incredible hard work. And also thank you to you sitting here as well as folks on the live stream for allowing me to share this incredibly exciting narrative with all of you. I hope you have a lovely rest of the conference and thank you. Anna up there asking the hard questions like, where is AmpConf coming next? Um, and while we can't answer that for you today, I did release um, a question in the Sladu, um, which is asking where you would like to see the next AMP Roadshow going. So if we haven't come to you yet, now's your chance to let us know that um, you'd like to see us there. なのであのスライドとデューのところにえっとポールとして次のアンプコンフどこで開催されたいですかってオープンクエスチョンがあるのでぜひとも どしどし投稿してもらってどこですかねなんかば裏ではアラスカとか行きたいみたいなそういう話とかしてましたけどあのええあのぜひとも投稿していただけたらなというふうに思いますはい<笑> All right, well, that was an awesome um, kickoff to our morning here at AmpConf Day 2. Coming up next, we have a coffee break, and uh, we hope to see you all back in here at 11 a.m. Alright, thank you so much.
Kelly, where would you like to see the AMP Roadshow go next? So I have the poll results. Uh, Mumbai, India. Uh, Taipei, which is awesome. Toronto, uh, Paris, Moscow, Hawaii, and we have two Tokyos. So <laughs> uh, it's really great that you, uh, you like this place. Um, but yeah. Um, it'd be really great if we could have another AMP, uh, AMP, AMP Conf uh, next year. Um, ということで、あのいろいろなあの、えー、回答してくださってありがとうございます。来年も AMP Conf できるように頑張ります。So, uh, okay, so now the next session will be how we migrated our entire site to AMP without the user noticing. Please welcome Andrea. Hello, everybody. My name is Andrea, and I'm part of the Ineventos team. What is Ineventos? Ineventos is a directory of supplier for events. It was created in Costa Rica, and it's present in 13 countries today. We are a very small company, integrated just by two people, Hernan, who is the developer, and myself. Being so small, we have a few competitive advantages over our big competitors. One of them is the ability of making decisions fast, thanks to how reduced we are. However, to take advantage of this, we must be aware of the opportunities offered by new technologies. Doing some research, we came across AMP. And with AMP, we knew we had the opportunity of going a step further. Once we made the decision of using it, we started amplifying our site. After two months of gradual changes, we managed to uh, migrate 100% of our main landing pages without the end user noticing it. During the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. We started with our blog with no intention of going much further. As almost everybody did, we started creating an AMP page linked to a non-AMP version of each article of our blog. This AMP page was a simplified version of the non-AMP page, with the content displayed in a horizontally centered column in order to show static content on the screen of a, of a smartphone. In this way, AMP allowed us to create a version of our blog that ran very fast on mobile devices and stood out in Google searches. However, we were maintaining two versions, and we asked ourselves how feasible it would be to just have one version uh, that could, be, that could properly, properly display on smartphones and laptops and get all the benefits of AMP at the same time. Here we ran into some difficulties. In the first place, our blog shares the same layout as our site, the same header, footer, menu, behavior, and appearance. So we had to create an identical site, uh, an identical layout using AMP. Sorry. Secondly, our blog uses uh, our site and blog use columns and are fully responsive. So we needed a responsive CSS framework that allowed us to create grids with rows and columns. The one column horizontally centered approach was no longer useful. Fortunately, all the official AMP sites are fully AMPed, and this helped us understand how they solve some of the difficulties. We saw that AMP Start uses a lightweight, responsive CSS framework called Base CSS, with which we could easily create columns and replicate the responsive behavior of our non-AMP pages, adapting to multiple size, uh, device sizes. Besides, AMP is responsive by design. And almost every AMP component can be marked as responsive by setting its layout attribute to responsive. These allowed us to have a single AMP version of the blog with an identical layout to the non-AMP. These pages looked the same as before so that the user could navigate the site and jump between AMP pages and non-AMP pages without perceiving the difference. These pages were responsive. They looked, felt, and worked exactly like their corresponding non-AMP version. But they were much faster. They stood out in searches. They were easy to implement. 
and they helped us avoid the use of heavy libraries. As a result, we understood that AMP was much more than a tool to display static content. So we started using it as a powerful framework to build the rest of our site. We started with the content pages that, due to their static nature, did not present any major difficulties. A new challenge was presented with the interactive pages. We had to build fully interactive user experiences while maintaining the user-friendly nature of them. And if possible, we had to do it without the user noticing, because the user already knew the appearance and behavior of the site. So we had to do it as seamless as possible and keeping the functionality intact. We continued with the home, product, and category pages, pages that drive the most traffic and are fully interactive. To build these pages, we used AMP Bind, which in combination with other AMP components, gives support for the creation of amazing interactive experiences, achieving awesome results. Let's start with the home page, where we can see a Show More button and a search input field with Auto Suggest which is present in every AMP page header. They were implemented using the same AMP components, AMP bind, form, mustache, and list. Let's start with the show more button code. When the user presses the show more button, it submits a form making an AJAX request. The data returned by the server is cached in an AMP state and then populates an AMP list using a mustache template. When the user types in the search input field, here in the auto suggest, a request to the server is made, loading search results into an AMP state. An AMP list linked to a mustache template is populated with the search results returned, rendering the links. In the product pages, we can see request quote, contact, reserve buttons, which we'll, we'll explore their implementation later on. We can also see social share buttons implemented through AMP social share. We can also see a photo gallery implemented with an AMP carousel. We can see a YouTube video implemented through AMP YouTube and a Google map implemented through AMP, an AMP iframe. In the category pages, we can see the same buttons used in the product pages to request quote and book. We can also see the Google map of each company profile. As you can see, on the same page, we use multiple buttons that implement the same functionality for different listings. For example, all the request quote buttons display the same form. AMP bind allows us to bind the form with the company being contacted dynamically. So we have just one instance of the request quote form in the page instead of, of having one for each button. Moreover, Exactly the same code is referenced by both product and category pages, avoiding code duplication. These quote requests, uh, which were originally jQuery dialogues, are implemented with a properly styled AMP lightbox containing a form. We use CSS classes to give the AMP lightbox the same appearance and behavior that the former jQuery dialog had. The form contained allows us to validate and submit user input to the server. In here, we can see how we replace the jQuery dialog with AMP Lightbox and some CSS classes. Using, using the custom validation reporting attribute, we specify the type of validation performed by the form. And through the visible when invalid attribute, we implement it in a declarative way. 
Below, we can see how when the user presses the request quote button, after setting the state that allows us to dynamically indicate the name and ID of the company contacted, the light box is shown. The reservation form allows the user to book a day and time. For this, we also use the AMP light box bind and form components with the same purpose as in the previous case. And we also use the AMP list and AMP mustache components to display the month and day availability. Here in the reservation form, we used three AMP state instances, one for availability check and the other two to hold the date and time selected by the user. When the user changes the month in the calendar, it triggers a request that retrieves available days in an AMP list with a mustache template. In the same way, when the user selects a date, it triggers a request that retrieves the available hours for that date. With AMP bind, we toggle visibility of month, day, and form views. And perhaps one of the biggest, or let's say the biggest challenge during this adventure was the implementation of the photo attachment, which was present in the non-AMP version, and we had to keep it when we committed to maintaining uh, the functionality of our site intact. For the photo attachments, we use a third-party JavaScript library that simplifies the loading of multiple images from client site. However, there is not yet an AMP component that allows us to solve this requirement. So we chose to isolate just that part of the page on its own non-AMP and include it with an AMP iframe. By doing this, we were able to keep the same user-friendly experience of the previous version. In here, we can see the AMP iframe that allows us to incorporate the functionality of attaching photos to the quote request form. The logic for sending the photos is implemented in a non-AMP page, which uses uh, the um, jQuery and other third-party libraries. This non-AMP page is linked to the AMP iframe by means of the source attribute dynamically. Since in the query string, Parameters necessary for the identification of the contacted company are sent. And that was it. All main landing pages were amped after a few weeks. Today we have more than 15,000 AMP pages with zero errors. Page loading time had a decrease of more than 40%, and this resulted in an increase of more than 10% in conversion rates. Regarding the difficulty, once we changed the mindset of building with JavaScript to building with a more declarative framework, AMP was much easier, required less coding than previous versions, and this resulted in cleaner and less complex code. We believe that AMP facilitated our decision-making process since we do not have to keep comparing different options of JavaScript frameworks and responsive CSS frameworks, trying to figure out which one is the most suitable one or the most appropriate one. AMP offers what we need. We believe in AMP because we know it's based on solid principles, pushing the web forward and backed by a large community. In behalf of Hernan and myself, I would like to thank the AMP team, this beautiful country for welcoming us, and all of you. I hope this was useful. Thanks. Woo. Now, uh, that was such an outstanding talk. Being able to switch your entire website from non-AMP to an AMP-first approach right under your user's nose without them even noticing, that's absolutely incredible. Another big round of applause for Andrea and her team. <laughs> from being such a success, I know they're going to be a big hero in the AMP community. We're absolutely stunned by that. So, 
I have a quick question for everybody. Um, what do you do when you're confronted with something you just don't want to read? Something that's completely boring and off topic and not quite engaging. Just kind of skim over it. And something that I'm finding really interesting and something that's going to be fascinating about the upcoming talk is how they're leveraging AMP stories to build an engaging experience for readers to, um, to really enjoy this content, um, to get information out where it needs to be. So please join me as we welcome Hans to the stage to talk about boring content, excited users, the power of AMP stories in emerging markets. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Good morning, everybody. I'm Hans. I am, um, I am CEO and uh, founder of Tappable. And I'm afraid that what you're looking at, the cane and the limp, is not a gimmick to draw your attention. It's not an impersonation of Dr. House either. It's sadly enough a uh, souvenir of a recent skiing trip. Tappable is an AMP story building tool that will be launching as a SaaS product in about a month. It is a it is a spin-off of our fintech activities in Africa. And over the next 15 minutes, I will try and explain why AMP stories were instrumental to our business in Kenya and how they can be instrumental for your business. As I look around the audience, I see a lot of people that are probably active in the more mature markets. So what I would like to do is actually put a little bit of a broader perspective on things. This is a demographic map of the world. It focuses on the median age of the main um, regions in the world. And if we just compare Africa to North America, Africa has nearly four times the population of North America. The median age in Africa is under 20 years old. In North America, it is just over 38. If we work that back, there are now 600 million people young people under 20 in Africa, but there are only about 80 million people under 20 in North America. Now you may ask, what has this got to do on a technology conference, right? So let's have a look, a closer look at a few countries. This is Indonesia. And Indonesia is leading the world in e-commerce. No less than 87% of the Internet users made a purchase online in December 2018. I'm sure if there are e-commerce people in the room, they'd be pretty jealous. Or a bit closer to here, the Philippines. For four years in a row, Filipino Internet users lead the world in Internet consumption. More than 10 hours per day on average. 99% of the Internet users are on Facebook. Or let's go to the other side, to Brazil. 98% of internet users in Brazil are watching video online. That means that in Brazil, YouTube easily outperforms Facebook. Now, what do these three countries have in common? Well, very simple. They all have a huge population that is young and that is digitally savvy. A population that adapts to new technologies easily and very quickly, that wants new technologies. From this perspective, I'd like to ask you now, where do you think that your customers will be in 10 years' time? The home market for our fintech activities is Kenya. We're working there on improving financial capabilities of people through data and technology. We currently have two products live on the market, and I will talk about them in a minute. But why did we actually choose Kenya as a product for our fintech activities? Well, that's very simple. Kenya is leading the world on mobile wallets. Now, you may see from the slide that 49% of you are saying, that's probably, you know, why is he talking about that, right? But in reality, this comes closer to a nearly full 100% mobile wallet penetration. Why? Because you need to be 18 years old to have a mobile money account in Kenya, and because the median age in Kenya of the people is under 20. Right? Do the maths yourself. So let me introduce you to Paul. Paul exemplifies the average working population in Kenya. 78% 
of the adults in Kenya work in the informal economy. They have no monthly salary. Their revenue flux fluctuates from day to day. Paul is a driver. He drives for Uber, for Taxify, and also for LittleCap, which is a local platform. He continuously switches between platforms to get the best rides. His customers pay him with mobile money from their phone onto his phone. His smartphone really is the nerve center of his business. Every single day, Paul uses about 500 megabytes of data, and he calls for about half an hour. And that's just to run his business. Like most other Kenyans, he buys his airtime and data on a daily prepaid basis. And he has a dual SIM phone, and he switches between operators to get the best deals that are available. But the problem is that there are more than 200 bundles on the market in Kenya at any given time. Information about them is very difficult to get by. And when you get it, it is very unclear and very often even misleading. So we build Boost. And Boost is our comparative website and chatbot that allows people like Paul to select, to analyze, to compare, and to purchase the best bundle that meets their requirements and that meets their budgets. But here comes the problem. How do we tell Paul which bundle is the best for him? How do we inform him that he can save money or get better value for money? How do we send Paul tips and tricks? Well, we tried it, as you can see. We tried it by publishing 800-word blog posts, and we failed absolutely miserably. So have you ever tried to read a long text on a small screen of a $35 smartphone in Kenya? Well, we did, and it wasn't the best user experience. So we had to find a different way. We had to make our content attractive and easy to read. So we started testing AMP stories with our users. We condensed our content to only a handful of pages. We focused on visuals that would appeal to young users, which are our users. We really cut the text down to the absolute minimum. And that is far less than a tweet. And we started sending out these stories as notifications in our chatbot. But we had a major issue with that, because we had to code every single story from scratch. And that took us three to four days. And that's hardly a scalable solution in a business, right? The result of our AMP stories was way beyond our expectations. It just blew our socks off. Our content got finally read. We went from a session time of 20 seconds for our blog posts to nearly four minutes for our stories. People just automatically connected to our content. And what's more, 87% of our users clicked through to the very end of the stories. So at this point, we started to understand the power of AMP stories. And we also understood that we needed to develop a story building tool first so that we could scale. So it was at this point that we decided to launch Tappable as a spin-off of our fintech activities. So let's take a clo closer look at the power of AMP stories. In this presentation, we focus essentially on the effect that, power that AMP stories can have in emerging markets, right? But don't forget that all AMP story design principles apply equally to mature markets, so don't just run away as yet. Emerging markets are smartphone markets. Only a minority of users access the internet from a desktop, as you can see behind me. Smartphone ownership continues to grow double digit year on year, and this will continue. We all know that stories are the ideal format for smartphones. And using stories to communicate with, our, with your audience in these markets is simply a no-brainer. But in all of these markets, there is an enormous variety in smartphones, smartphone brands, models, and versions. Through second-hand sales, old models hang around for years and years. Screen sizes are between 3.5 and, and 6.5 and inches. So how on earth do you design content for, these, for this variety of, um, of screen sizes? Well, not the way that social media is doing it. If you have a recent uh, smartphone, this will be familiar to you, right? 
In three of the four formats you see behind me, the text is cut off. Your user is put, is, is put off by this, and he just clicks away. And that's not the case with AMP Stories. The AMP Story format is responsive, and it fits all screens perfectly. The content is permanently visible, and the user is kept fully engaged and clicks through to the end. This has been one of the main success factors of our activities in Boost. If I take Kenya as an example, the mobile network inf infrastructure of operators is rather weak in some areas. Broadband internet is mainly limited to the big cities and to the roads that are connecting the big cities. Because AMP stories are responsive, are loading responsively, our users aren't looking at the spinning wheel for minutes. They start consuming the content as it is loading on their screens. This again has been a major contributor to higher session time and completion rates. Posting our content through social media was simply not an option for us. The Facebook algorithm decides who will see our content. That is, unless we pay for ads. But we can reach our entire contact database with AMP stories. We can segment as much as we like, and we can send specific content to specific segments. We can connect users to more in-depth information of relevant topics by means of specific call to actions on pages. And this has been an incredibly powerful tool for us. Most of the information that we put in our stories has a long shelf life. Network operators don't change their bundles every 24 hours, right? User recommendations don't change overnight. The 24-hour life cycle of social media stories is just an impediment to our business. We want to keep our stories online for as long as we want, and AMP stories allow us to do so. We started making stories because every story has a link, and because we can send that link to our customers. How do we do that? Pretty much any way we like. We often put the link in an SMS message for the simple reason that SMS is still the marketing tool of choice in Kenya. Let's try and see how this works. If you're staying in Tokyo for a few more days, I suggest you just send an SMS with Tokyo to 1470 460 6460, and we'll send you back a tappable story guide of the coolest places to visit in Tokyo and the hottest restaurants and bars. But our choice of distribution channels is practically endless. We put links in stories to our chatbot and in emails, in our tweets or in our WhatsApps. We embed stories in our app and also our website, or we send push notifications. We link to stories from a QR code. So why should you use AMP Stories? Because it is simply the ideal format to have your content read on smartphones. And all across the world, more and more users are accessing the internet from their smartphones. You should use AMP stories because they're versatile. Whatever the phone, whatever the speed of the internet connection, the user will always have a good experience. And a good user experience leads to engagement, and engagement leads to higher conversion rates. And most importantly, you should use AMP stories because you are in control. You decide who receives your content, you decide the distribution of your content, and you decide how long your content will stay alive. With AMP Stories, you are in control, not Facebook. We create a tappable to solve our problems that we, specifically, that we specifically had, and we're putting it out, and the product will be live very soon. So get the Tokyo Guide, you can scan the, bar, the, uh, the QR code, get the Tokyo, Tokyo Guide and just find out how powerful the story, the tappable uh, story builder will be. Or you can sign up for early access on tappable.co. But most importantly, enjoy your day in Tokyo. Thank you very much for your attention. はい、えー、いろいろな企業からのアンプがアンプいろんな企業でアンプをどういうふうに使ってるかっていうまあ事例をいろいろ紹介できてすごく面白いかなと思います。こういったやっぱり、えー、実際にどういうふうに
アンプが使われているのかっていうのはすごい参考になると思いますしぜひ皆さんもさあの、えー、見てみてください、えー、次のセッションはですねちょっと打って変わって、えー、Google のー Chrome チームーが入っていきますであのこの中でどのくらいの方がご存知かわからないんですけど、えー、と東京にも Chrome チームがあって例えばサービスワーカーだとか、えーえー、とモジュールだとかえー、もしくはですね今回トピックとしても上がっているサインで ACTB エクシェンジなども東京も行って一部開発していたりしますなのでそういった中の PM もしくはエンジニアが次のセッションを話してくれます。Alright, let's move on to the next session.、Um, Chrome and AMP in 2019. Please welcome Kenji and Kinuko from Google. Right. Kenji to Imasga, Nyonji ne Monaku, Half de Monaku, Tonalu, France Gines. I'm a product manager on the web platform team、uh, in Chrome. Konnichiwa, Kinuko to Imas, Pure Nihon Gines, Nihon Sodachi. Kyoa, just a present, a ego de Arimas. Hi, I'm Kinuko, software engineer, also on our web platform team in Chrome. All right. We are thrilled to be here for the second time at MCONF.、Um, last year in Amsterdam, We announced a big collaboration with the M team,、um, and this talk is just an update on that collaboration. So, we'll cover a lot of things today, but don't worry, there's going to be a short link to a document with a lot of pointers so that you can learn more and get started on a few things. All right, I'm wondering how many of you saw our first talk at MCONF in 2018. So, or if you were there, please raise your hand so we can get a sense of how many of you have some context. はい。It was born with this desire to make it easy for publishers to create consistently fast and high performing user experience. And so that's like something we share in common speed and simplicity. The other thing we share in common is that we both strive for open ecosystem through open source projects or standards. And so, since we essentially share the same ideals and wanted similar outcome, we felt that it would be interesting to try to see、um, like working together on like common projects. What would come up on,、uh, out of that?、Um, and so we announced a big collaborative effort to do essentially three things. The first one is to help、um, like improve your productivity as web developers. The second one was to make AMP more straightforward for publishers like you. We've heard your feedback about the things you don't like about AMP, and we've been hard at work on trying to fix those.、Uh, there w a s a big announcement yesterday. I hope、uh, this is part of、like、the story, and we have more to, to talk about. And the last one is to enable more great user experience on the whole web. So, more concretely, for speed, we talked about investing in instant and seamless navigation, similar to what AMP does, but for the whole web. And also, smooth user experience, where websites scroll fast and respond quickly to user input. For simplicity, we talked about this idea of helping you avoid errors, so reducing the opportunity to To fall into traps、um, and also putting you on a path to success. We feel this is really important because, as you probably know, the web platform has a long history. And so it's bound to have rough edges, things that don't work quite well. And sometimes there are APIs that we shipped in the past that turn out to be a bad idea,、um, like maybe bad for performance in hindsight. And also, as we make more progress, like we better understand use case, we have more modern ways of addressing long standing use case. And so it's not a surprise that without guidance or like very strong expertise,、um, like developers like you tend to fall into traps. And it's kind of like our fault. Like the web platform is very complex, has a long, very,、uh, very long history. And for the standard piece, we first thought that there are lessons to extract from AMP and bring to the web platform for everyone's benefits. And we also thought that it would be useful to explore what a great user experience entails and help developers measure their performance and keep things in check. All right, before we go any further, allow me to take a short detour. 
I really like bookstores and books. Especially here in Tokyo, if you have the time, do look around. There are some very interesting places that have kind of like redefined what a bookstore experience is about. For instance, there are places where you can just go grab, borrow a book, and go to the cafe section of the store, and like just see if the book is for you while shifting, uh, shifting sorry, while drinking a cappuccino. Let's not <laughs> use complex words. <laughs> um, really, it's the best of both worlds. It's very interesting to experience. But even without these refinements, um, there are fundamental things about bookstores and books that makes it a great way to discover and consume content. For instance, the store layout is there to help you find something if you already have an idea of what you're looking for. And even if you don't have an idea of like interesting things you want to check for, uh, there are sections in the store that helps you find interesting things like staff picks, new release, trending books, and so on. Um, the other thing that is interesting to note is that the books cover and the wrap around, like the thing that, um, like the books come that kind of like gives you an idea of what is the theme, the style of that book. It gives you a quick idea of like whether or not this will be interesting to, to you. Um, the other thing, obviously, is it's very effortless to just grab a book on the shelf or from a pile and like read a couple of pages to see if it's if it's interesting to you. Um, so if you ignore the part where you actually go to the store, the whole experience is seamless, smooth, and fluid. And best of all, everything works offline. Okay, I like the story as well. But by contrast, discovering and consuming content on the web, in particular the mobile web, it's not as great as a one experience as it could be, despite a vast pool of content to draw from and the ability to access to the content wherever and whenever the user experience it's, isn't reliably instant, nor smooth, nor seamless. Surely we can do better. This belief has guided many of our projects. So all right, let's dive right into how much progress we've made. So our top priority has been to fix what we believe to be a fundamental gap on the web platform. Instead of the bookstore-like experience, we sometimes feel the experience on the web is like uh, maybe an empty, like, cold library. Oh, it's sad. <laughs> All right. You know that there is great content out there, but it's still a lot of effort to find and consume. We tend to think that links are very low friction. But if you think about it, today with mobile devices and mobile experience, our users ex expect a lot more. And so, especially if you look at native apps, I think it's pretty clear that those, app, those apps have found new ways to like, facilitate content discovery and consumption without ever showing a loading screen to their user. And the web doesn't really do well on that. The good news is that AMP is the proof that we can deliver those kind of user experience that are fast, seamless, and smooth. But to do that, AMP had to work around gaps on the web platform, as you all know. Uh, like, for instance, the URL is not correct, right? There are a few things that are not quite right. Um, and so we had lengthy discussion with the AMP team on how to make sure that we can deliver this kind of user experience like in general, not necessarily like through AMP, for the whole web, finding ways to achieve that without all the downsides that you are aware of. Eventually, we realized that a key reason behind AMP's ability to, de to deliver fast instant page load, for instance, was the fact that it, is, it has like, the ability to cache and serve M content from its M cache, right? And what this means is that M can use that cache to, to do things like privacy preserving, prefetch, or pre-rendering, which like, speed up load dramatically. OK, going back to our book metaphor, personally, I think that a book is, in a sense, like a distribution mechanism. Right? If you think about it, that's what it is. It's the reason why a bookstore can offer an instant and seamless experience. Imagine for a moment that there was no books in bookstore. They would have to send someone, or maybe even you, to the publisher's like, office or a warehouse. Right? And sometimes the book would come in like bits and pieces, and you would have to go to different places to get it done. Right? It's kind of odd, but if you think about it, that's sort of the model that we have on the web. So, but don't get me wrong, right? This has some major advantage. It's not like imperfect, it's, it's actually good. But sometimes it gets in the way in, in terms of like delivering some sort of like user experience that we, we've seen with AMP. And so in short, I think the web doesn't have a proper distribution mechanism. And AMP trying to close that gap with the AMP cache, which is kind of like a make-do distribution system. 
And luckily, uh, we were also exploring other use cases that could benefit for, uh, from a proper distribution mechanism. And so with the M team excited about this concept, we decided to properly start this project. And uh, yes, we are talking about web packaging. Web packaging enables distribution on the web. It separates attribution from delivery, and it also enables a wide range of interesting use cases, like privacy-preserving instant page load, sharing between users, or performance and ergonomic swing by bundling multiple resources in a native format, and maybe many more. So web packaging is comprised of two primary technologies, sign exchanges and bundled exchanges. Here, an exchange simply means that a pair of HTTP request and response. And a sign exchange is an exchange with the signature vouching for its provenance. For example, example.com slash slides slash amp.conf.html or something like that. This signature is used by the browser to verify the origin and the integrity of the exchange. Bundled exchanges are a convenient way to batch several multiple exchanges in a single native format. And as was announced, we've recently shipped sign exchanges in Chrome 73. Let's see what this means for you in particular. So without sign exchange, AMP articles are loaded within a Google domain because resources are delivered from the AMP cache. This results in having the confusing URL in the address bar. To mitigate this, the AMP team has added an ad attribution bar in the content area to communicate the true origin of the AMP article. And then, with signed exchanges, AMP articles can finally load under the correct origin, also letting you access your cookies and the data as a first party. So, no more confusing URL in the address bar. No need either for a second address bar in the content area, and uh, you can more easily personalize your content. Yeah. The other thing that this does, and maybe it's not obvious to a lot of people, is that today you have to trust Google when you give them the, when you give your article to the MCache, right? The MCache could do whatever it wants with it. There is no restriction in terms of like being able to modify the content. But with sign exchange, because there is a signature, it's no longer possible for someone to modify your content. And what this means is that you don't know you no longer have to trust someone to distribute your content. You can expand the scope of like who is able to distribute to distribute your content. And I think this is very powerful. All right. We understand that this is something you've been long waiting for. And so I'm really amazed because the adoption that we've seen so far has been incredible. All the companies that you see over there have either launched or are in the process of launching their Sun Exchange AMP article. And we have a lot more coming soon. So I'm sure that like, uh, this wouldn't have been possible without the partners and the people who have invested in this new technology. So maybe could we give a round of applause to the people who have invested Thank in this? Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. A few of these partners are actually attending this conference. Um, I've heard that um, people from NDTV are here. There is also Yafu Japan, who is going to give a talk later this afternoon. I highly recommend that you attend the session. There will also be a short session about how to get started on this. And so if you are interested, please come at the session. All right, let's talk about simplicity. AMP's ability to deliver consistently great user experience, I think, is partly explained by two things. The first one is that it comes with rules about what you can do and cannot do. It also has a validation step to make sure that you, you follow those rules, right? And these rules were designed to avoid ending with a bad user experience. It is by design avoiding you to like fall into traps. Um, and so in a sense, AMP provide a safe and easy path to success. I think it's a great model. At the same time, we understand that not everyone wants the same rules or the same like safe paths. And sometimes when you know what you're doing, it's actually OK to go outside of those bounds. So we designed something called feature policy, which, which lets you define your own rules. Think of it as content security policy, except that it gives you control over features. What's more, you can also define rules on a per document basis, so that the, you can set stricter rules on third party iframes if you want. Let's look at a few examples. At last year's AMPConf, we gave you a bleeding edge preview of the unsized media feature policy. It's currently available behind the flag, and we expect to ship soon. 
It allows you to control the behavior of images and videos that lack proper dimensions or size information. The result, more stable layouts. Let's look at a demo. First, without the policy enabled, you can see that as the page loads, the text moves around. Yeah, just right now. That's because the browser had no idea about the size of the image when it did the initial layout. But with the policy enabled, you can see that the text doesn't move around anymore. Images without dimensions are assigned a default size, resulting in a stable layout. A few more examples of image policies. In Chrome 75 to 77, you can experiment with two new image policies, unoptimized images and oversized images. Unoptimized images is for images that use too many bytes for the intended display area. And the oversized image is for images that are too big for the intended display area. If you enable these policies, Chrome will automatically replace the pro pro sorry, problematic image with a placeholder, like on a screen. It's actually great because poorly optimized images and oversized images are a very common reason behind slow page loads. Um, I, I guess, yeah, it's <laughs> great, but at the same time, like, you are going to break your own website with like those like very weird placeholders. Well, yeah. So we realized that it's actually a valid concern. <laughs> so especially if like uh, if you don't know how many of your images to yeah. be affected, it would be a little bit scary. But fear not. We have a great news for you. So in Chrome 73, you can experiment with a report-only mode. Any policies you enabled can be switched to a report only so that you can find and address issues without having to worry about breaking things. So you don't need to break things. <laughs> you don't need to break web. Our recommendation is that you start with report only and get things right, and then switch to enforcing the policies to avoid regressions. We also recommend that you enable all the policies on your local development machine to establish a good uh, baseline as you implement new features. OK, fair enough. <laughs> all right, all of these projects that we have are essentially motivated by our desire to see a lot more great user experience on the whole web, and not just AMP in general. But what do we mean by that? Like, How do you know that your website has a great user experience? How do you measure this? At Google, as you probably know, we love metrics. They keep you honest. They also help you keep focused. And it's a great motivation when you have a goal that you want to reach for. At the same time, defining what a great user experience is is really, really hard. And so we started with just some basic principle. The first one is that we believe that a great user experience is one that gives the user what they came for as fast as possible. The second one is that when the user is trying to use your website, it responds quickly. Right? You want to help the user get things done as fast as possible. And the last one is you want also to avoid any annoyances that would like, slow down the user. Right? We mentioned it a couple of times already, but for instance, when you show a piece of content, having that piece of content move around is really annoying. Right? And so you should do, our best to, you should do your best to avoid that. Um, this is just like the basic things that we have, and we love your feedback on this framing. If you think it's not quite right, or maybe there's like missing things down the road, like, please let us know. The other thing we know is that metrics only make sense if they are available across a wide range of product and like steps through when you develop a new feature. So for instance, when you are development time, it's super important to have the same metrics available through DevTools or Lighthouse. When the product is deployed, you also want to get a sense of whether what you saw on your local machine is actually delivering the same user experience for all of your users. And so that is what Chrome UX reports gives you. It gives you an insight into actual user-like metrics. And finally, if you have already your own solution or you are using um, a real user metric as third-party service, we want to make sure that you can still keep using those, right? Because that's what you're used to. Overall, the sooner the feedback is, the better your chance of avoiding shipping a regression, right? And then the more representative the feedback is, the higher your chance of delighting all of your users. And so when we build a new metric, we do our best to make it sh to, ma to, to kind of like expose it in all of those places. Currently, we have two loading metrics available. First paint is the time at which the browser was able to paint something on the screen for the first time. 
This might not seem like much, but it's really important because it gives the user the reassurance that your website is indeed loading, whether or not it's not like stuck, right? Um, okay. Second one we have is first contentful paint. Again, this is the time at which the browser was able to paint a piece of content, right? Not just some random pixel, something that is potentially useful to the user. And this is where it starts to get interesting because potentially this is what the user came for. So I hope that the user agrees that the, we've made a bit good progress on the things we talked about. But we also have a lot more coming, some of it quite soon, actually. Since there's a lot, we are going to cover only a few highlights. So first, on the metric side, we'd like to highlight two new projects in particular. The first one, a metric to capture how stable your layout is. And another one, a metric to capture how good the first interaction is. So we've talked a lot about the importance of making sure that the content doesn't move once displayed. I'm sure that you've all experienced something like what's on the screen, so that content relatively loads fast. But after that, there's a series of layouts that move the text and the content around. The common reason behind these page jumps are unsized images, slow loading web fonts, or iframes that resize themselves. The layout stability metric will reach you now if your website has layout stability issues. We expect to have something ready by the end of this year. And another one, we've also been working on a metric called fast input delay. It measures the time it takes for your website to respond to the fast user interaction. Making a good fast impression is very important, especially when you're trying to convince a new user to stick around. It's very frustrating to have a website that looks like it's loaded, but it doesn't respond to your input at all for a while. So as we were assessing this metric, we found that some pages on a very well-known site actually had request on fast input delay. This animated logo is an illustration of that regression. The menu icon, it took about 10 seconds for the menu icon to respond to the user input. So it's a bit too long, so we reached out to the website owners and they're actually working on a fix. If anything, the lesson here is that the relations can happen to the best of us. And also, this metric could have helped prevent shipping the regression. So we are also very interested in hearing your feedback on this metric, which will be available via an origin trial, hopefully in a few weeks. All right, that's it for metrics. Now, let's go back to my metaphor about like books and bookstore. Don't get me wrong, like a book is a great medium, but it's not perfect. Like for one, it can wait a lot, it takes space, right? And surely the web doesn't have this downside. Well, I mean, each year, if you know the data, you, you probably like, are not surprised, but the median size of web pages is increasing. And today, we are roughly around two megabytes. Two megabytes, really? Yes. Are you sure? <laughs> and that's just for a single page. It is not counting what happens after the load event. Wow. <laughs> To put things in perspective, um, since this is Japan, like smash hit video games made in 1985 were feeding into 32 to 64 kilobytes, and they were delighting families for <laughs> hours on end, right? And then with 2.4 megabytes, you can actually fit a well-known late 90s game, not the actual title. <laughs> we have several projects meant to address this issue, but today we just present one of them. Mm. OK, in Chrome 75, we are adding lazy loading capability to the web platform. Lazy loading is a technique that AMP uses a lot. It's basically about prioritizing loading of images and iframes that are currently visible, and also deprioritizing the load of elements that are out of view. Our plan is to enable this lazy loading by default for the users who have enabled Chrome's data saving mode. And we also want to give you control fast via a loading attribute with which you can control the behavior on a per element basis. And then later, we plan to ship feature policy with which you can modify the default behavior so that you can default to lazy loading everything and uh, only, flip in, only selectively flip important elements to eager loading with the loading attribute. Here's an example showing the impact of lazy loading. Without lazy loading, the website pulled like 10 megabytes of 10 images. megabytes? Yes. Wow. <laughs> it's impressive, right? And it took about six seconds to load. Then, 
Yes, with lazy learning enabled, the browser only had to pull 250 kilobytes of images to get the same visual outcome. All right, that's pretty close <laughs> to 3264 kilobytes, but not quite there yet. <laughs> You're getting close. All right, let's switch gear a bit and talk about seamless experiences. Um, seamless experience is this idea that at no point in time you should be able to tell that a page is loading. I think today on the web you can tell, oh, this is a web experience, like you can see a page being loaded at some point. And if you come from a background of like native apps and like those kind of user experience, it's kind of like frustrating that you, you can feel, oh, this is like different. It's not the same what I'm used to. On the web, it's really, really hard to achieve. And essentially, it kind of forces you into a single page architecture, which has its own set of downside and higher complexity and cost. Another situation where seamless experience would be a game changer, especially on mobile, is when you need to use multiple websites. Today on mobile, you have like a very tiny screen. And you wanna, if you want to do something that like needs multiple websites, you have to go back and forth between different pages or juggle around with like multiple tabs that you can't see at once. It's not a great user experience. And while this seems impossible to do well, we know that it's not. Because again, we've seen with AMP News Carousel, for instance, that it is possible to deliver a great user experience that spans multiple websites. But then again, like the reason AMP was able to do that is that they, they just went and like walked around a bunch of gaps that we had on the web platform. And so it's not perfect. Um, and so we've been trying to find ways to make that like better, like identifying what are the gaps. And I'm pleased to announce that we have something we think will be uh, enabling this like seamless experience on the web without major downsides. For the last year or so, we've been working on a new API that will enable proper instant and seamless navigation. We call it portals. It's a bit like an, like an iframe because you can use it to embed things, but unlike an iframe, you can actually navigate to the embed. Um, so there's a twist, right? Let's look at two use cases. The first use case shows that it's possible to take a multiple page architecture app and make it look like a single page app. This is the user experience that people would like uh, have today without polons. You can see that at the end of the chapter, there is a navigation that occurs to load the next chapter, right? It breaks the flow. This is um, a demo that we made in collaboration with Hatena for their Tonali No Young Jump view comic viewer. All right, with polons, you can use polos to embed the next chapter as you reach the end of the current chapter. And when the user touched that embed, you can trigger an animation of your liking that you can design it the way you want it, and then use the portal activate method to do the navigation, resulting in a seamless experience. The second example is about seamless navigation between multiple websites. This is user experience that everyone is familiar with, right? You have a feed of article, and when you want to read one of them, you can see that there is a navigation. It breaks the flow. Now, with portals and sign exchange, this is how it could look like. You could use portals and sign exchange to pre-render in a privacy-preserving way an article that you know the user is going to tap on. And when it does, you can use a, an animation of your choice to do a seamless transition. OK, as you can see, <laughs> Ken is pretty excited about portals. Yeah, are you not? <laughs> I am too, sorry. But like. Uh, it's sometimes easy to forget about like low-hanging fruits and just focus on the shiny opportunities, yeah. like portals. So as humans, we tend to assume that like uh, decade-old behaviors are based immutable practices. For example, Chrome basically eagerly render pages when page loads because it gives the users that the reassurance the pages are indeed loading. However, with page loads as fast as AMP, we found that like uh, this behavior is sometimes detrimental to the user experience. Let's see how. So this website is using AMP and also has very fast navigations. However, as you cannot somehow still feel junky. Right, right there. Oh, yeah. You saw the black thing? Did you notice? Yeah. So this frame by frame analysis shows why. So we have a black frame between navigations. And this happens because of Chrome's eager rendering behavior I mentioned. To address this issue, this issue, we changed our belief about Chrome's eager rendering and started to work on two projects with the, with the idea that it's sometimes better to hold off painting, especially when a page is fast enough. There's no need to rush. We can just let it settle before starting to paint anything. 
And the first project is the change we're making in Chrome, and the second project is about giving you a control via an API that generates the concept. So the first change, we are making a change in Chrome for same site navigations, where we basically hold off painting anything for a short duration. This change sounds tiny and might sound easy, but it wasn't. And as you can see, it actually addresses the flash of black paint. This results in smooth navigation on fast pages. You can try it out by enabling a flag in Chrome Canary, and it doesn't require any changes on your site. And we think that this works great in general, but it will never be perfect because only you, the website owners and the developers, will know when to, it makes sense to roll the camera and the sharp pixels. So we also want to give you control over how and when the browser renders things. So we are introducing a new API called Display Locking. This is a very cool API. It's currently available behind the flag in Chrome Canary today. It basically lets you lock an element to prevent visual updates. It's not limited to page navigations, but you can also avoid, use this to avoid doing super fresh rendering where you update elements on the documents that's already loaded. I got so excited about Polos that we are slightly over time. <laughs> um, time flies so fast. There is a lot more interesting product happening in Chrome. And so if you want to learn more details or find out what else we've been working on, I would encourage you to watch the session we'll have at I.O. Or if you have a ticket, please come to our session at I.O. in May. And to close, we'd like to thank you all our insightful partners. It's really hard to design the right API without any interested parties. And so we've been very lucky to have you work with us on APIs like Sign Exchange. Thank you so much. えっと。もしも今日話したいペアやプロジェクトに興味がある方がいたらぜひこのリンクをチェックしてください。今日はどうもありがとうございました。Okay, everybody, we are going to start setting up for the Google panel. So thank you so much for submitting all those great questions. Now is the time that they're going to be answered. Um, so this panel is going to be moderated by Monisha, and she is a representative from the product partners team at Google. Currently, she's responsible for building external partnerships that enable the rollout of modern web technologies such as AMP and PWA in the Asia Pacific region. Um, she joined Google about six years ago and has been navigating the crossover between product and partnerships, supporting teams like Search, Assistant, Chrome, and Web to build and launch magical yet relevant products for all of Asia. So please give me, um, please join me in a round of applause as Monisha joins us on stage. Good morning, everyone. Well, maybe it's afternoon, maybe it's evening, or even late night for some of you on live stream. Welcome. Welcome to the Google panel. For the next 30 minutes, we have a chance to ask our leaders all sorts of questions. Now, as some of you may know, Google has been instrumental in the creation of AMP and now actually employs a full-time team to contribute to the open source project. And as you all know, AMP helps publishers be successful on the web. So we thought it was appropriate to ask our leaders, who can now come on, yeah, um, their thoughts on Google, AMP, how Google thinks about the content ecosystem, and the future of content experiences on the web. Thank you, panelists, for joining us today. So let me start by introducing the team. We have with us David, or Bez, who's the VP of Engineering for our search product and the executive sponsor for AMP at Google. Ryuchi, who's our engineering director and the site lead for Google Japan. Dion, who heads um, director of web developer relations. And finally, Malta, who needs no introduction because you know him from the keynote, um, is our tech lead for AMP. My name is Manisha, and I lead web partnerships for APAC. So thank you so much for sending in all the questions. We've received all of them. And we've tried to pick the ones that have been voted the highest. We've also tried to pick the ones that are most relevant for most of you in this room, and the ones, of course, that are suitable for this leadership panel. So let's kick off with the first question, which is fairly pertinent, and I've been asked this a few times. Is there a risk that Google will abandon AMP like it has with some of its high-profile projects? 
So I, I can, I'll give a technical answer to this. So, um, I mean, I think the, uh, as the technically, I have to anticipate that no software lasts forever. And so there's all kinds of safeguards built into the AMP um, to, to outlast even Google Incorporated, basically, as a company. Because it's, first of all, an open source project that um, is licensed under Apache 2 license. And so like if Google, for whatever reason, would decide to stop working on it, it would still be there, and, and, and folks could, could continue working on it. And then there's other, um, I think, thoughtful aspects to it. So for example, the AMP cache's URL format is designed such that you can actually just turn it into a redirect to the underlying document um, with like an Apache rewrite rule. You know, you don't even need a database. And so it's extremely easy to maintain backwards compatibility of the URL space um, into eternity, um, independent of the existence of the entities that used to run this, this, these um, URLs. So the, um, I think that's the technical answer that um, anticipates possible futures without making a comment about possible futures. Is there a non-technical answer? Anyone wants to have a go sure. at? Sure. Uh, we are obviously very committed to AMP. It's something that we really believe uh, very strongly in, uh, primarily because if you know, if you look at the way we view Google Search, uh, which is one of the most ob obviously important projects at Google, one of the most important products we have, um, when a user comes to us with a question, it's really the entire end-to-end -end journey that we optimize for. And it's not just enough to make our part of the journey, our applications and our website, super fast. We need the entire journey to be fast, the entire journey to be an excellent experience, which means your sites have to be great too. So. We have a long history of investing in the web, investing in, in everything from training to making our own browser with Chrome to doing things like AMP on the format side, tools. We, we strongly uh, believe in, in a high performance and modern mobile friendly web. So it's something that we'll, we'll continue to invest in. Cool, thank you for the answer. Um, the second one here, maybe one for Malta. Will Google address the security concerns that Mozilla has raised about signed exchanges? I'll hand over to Dion. Sure. So, um, uh, signed exchanges, it's all about, you know, building standards. And so we obviously work with those different standards groups. Uh, and that's actually been going really well. We've had great relationship with the WebKit team, uh, with Apple, Mozilla's been pitching in. We're trying to balance the privacy side of things, the performance side of things. And there's different trade-offs on, if I sign this package, how do I know that, you know, it's, it's not going to be expired and out of date or something's gone wrong there? And so there's different proposals going on where we're, we're working on, you know, do we go back and have a call to the server so you, the publisher can have control over um, actually understanding what's in the package and the like, but that's a performance trade-off. Uh, so there's still work to be done, uh, but so far, you know, things are going really well. Um, and uh, you can kind of watch in the different, uh, you know, GitHub issues and the like to kind of see what's progressing there, but I'm uh, feeling really positive about it. Thanks. Ryuchi, question for you. So Google has a significant presence in Japan, um, and you're the site lead over here. What are some of the developments you're working on? What are the, some of the things that you can tell the audience about that might excite the developers in the room from Japan? Sure. Um, maybe I can recap on the, how we started this office. And we actually started on Google Japan as the first international office of Google in 2001. And we have grown to, so the, and that implies the importance of the market. And we have grown to over 1,000 people um, in this building. And the, we have on the multiple product and the teams on the search and ads and the uh, Geo, which is Google Maps, and then Chrome browser, and as you saw in a previous presentation, and the Chrome OS. And in addition to that, we have a research group on the Google Brain had started last year. So the, we have very diverse set of engineers on the, from the, on the systems design to the, on the machine learning type of engineer. This in the really small on the area. So that, that allows us to do the, the much correlation uh, so the, what is maybe most exciting for me right now is the col collaboration with the Chrome browser team. Now the under Mauti and me are the sister, sister team and they're reporting to the same manager here. So the under, we have the opportunity to work together um, between us as well as under with the Chrome browser team in Tokyo. Exciting, I look forward to more. Um, so in my role, as I speak to a number of partners, um, I get this feedback about the fact that it's really hard to build consistently great experiences on the web. 
Um, so my question to, to any of you is, what are we doing to make it easier for developers to build better experiences on the web, and how is AMP part of that vision? Sure. So um, we think people build pretty amazing things on the web. It's a really creative pr platform. Uh, we're really proud of, of what you all are able to, to do on the web. But we're also really frustrated with um, how hard it can be to build some of these experiences and the, uh, the end performance results. Uh, and so AMP is one fantastic way to kind of uh, rail in the right constraints and make sure you have a good experience. Um, you've heard today uh, about different tools like Lighthouse uh, and the like. For right now, it's, it's vitally important that you're running Lighthouse consistently, you've got it in continuous integration, you've got performance budgets and the like, because it's just too easy to kind of get off of the rails. Um, I see this actually kind of as a bug, um, even though you know, I work closely with the Lighthouse team. Um, we need to get different, better rails in place for you where it's not as uh, needed for you to kind of make sure you're not set up. Uh, it's been great to kind of take some of the ideas from AMP and kind of bake them into the web platform so everyone gets to benefit from them. And we're working now really closely with uh, all of the major frameworks and the like to make sure that we can get you know, all of the good things that they're innovating on uh, and baking those into the platform as well. Uh, so we've got a lot more coming, uh, kind of pairing up with some of these frameworks, like you heard about Next on the AMP side. We've got other things that we're working on as well. Um, and we're doing more on the kind of dev tool side um, and the like. Finally, uh, we have uh, created web.dev uh, as a way to kind of give you clear guidance. Uh, it's early days, but we're you know, really hoping to get a lot of the, uh, the correct guidance baking in our tools so you can use Lighthouse directly and kind of see things tracked over time uh, so you can make sure that you've got one place to go where you know what to do to deliver great experiences. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Anyone else want to chime in? No? Cool. I love this next question. It's one of my favorites. Because again, you know, we have a lot of um, people in the countries that I work in ask me this question. So this one says, I'm an AMP lover and I want to do AMP, but we don't have an in-house engineer. Should we use an agency? What is your suggestion? Many of us are in the same situation. Can you give us some advice? So a lot of people really keen on the product, understand the benefits, love it. But it's hard if you don't have a development team in place. Uh, I can take a cr uh, crack at this. Uh, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, energy on supporting AMP in the CMS uh, ecosystem, which uh, we are pretty excited by uh, because it enables people to get the benefits of AMP without having to have in-house engineers. So AMP has been uh, well supported by WordPress, and you'll, I think you'll see later today um, a really nice uh, presentation from the internal team at Google that's been working on, on the WordPress code to make this, make this plugin um, awesome. Uh, but there's lots of of different CMSs and different technology uh, stacks out there that do, in fact, support AMP. So, you know, if this is something that's important to you and you don't have an engineering team and you're not building the pages yourself, ask your your CMS tool and and see what you can do. Um, you'll find that in general, a lot of the middleware from this, everything from the CMS to the ad networks to the analytics networks, um, and everything paywalls, etc. All that stuff has been a big focus of uh, outreach for us for the last few years to help bring them on on board so that these tools are available to people who want to want to use them in, in the AMP. Yep, so that's a good starting point. Look at your CMS to see if there's some. And Go ahead. hopefully you saw the new training course that was out there, so maybe you want to kind of pick it up and play with it a bit yourself. Good plug. And another one for AMP.dev. Um, thank you for that. When will AMP pages reach desktop search results? Um, so we would love them to, I think, uh, in, in principle, AMP pages work on desktop today, first of all. Uh, if you look at amp.dev, which is our uh, web page for, for the AMP project, um, it is a, just an AMP first, AMP canonical page, so it obviously it works on desktop, it works on mobile, it's responsive. Uh, it's a beautiful page on desktop. Uh, so AMP pages do work well on desktop. But they do need to be designed for desktop. You do need to use responsive design. You need to think about users loading in on desktop. And early on when AMP was started, uh, we didn't talk much about that. In fact, the name of AMP, uh, the M stands for mobile. So it's uh, maybe in some ways we kind of hinted maybe, maybe it's more focused on mobile. Um, and so a lot of the content that's actually out there isn't designed responsively in AMP today, which is, a, which is a little bit of a problem. If we wanted to use it on search on the desktop, we'd wind up redirecting users to content where there'd be a very 
you know, thin slice of content in the middle with large gutters on both sides. Uh, so it's hard for us to, to send a lot of uh, traffic that would, pages that wouldn't look very good. Um, but for AMP Stories, this is an area where we're really excited by this because as we look at stories on the desktop, they just look beautiful, especially the work you saw um, John and Hong show you, uh, yesterday. It, it, it's actually quite a lovely format in landscape uh, and on the desktop. And so there's an area here where we have a new start um, with the format because this part is, is pretty new and it's explicit. So there's a tag you can leave in the markup that says it's responsive and built to be responsive. And so maybe that's an area we'll start to look at on search if we get content there that would look really good on desktop. Uh, but in general, we're, we're very excited by AMP um, in search and we will use it where it makes sense. Thank you. Um, the next question I'd love to throw to both Search and Chrome. So Search has obviously evolved in the past few years. How does Search view their role in the open web? And in a similar vein, how does Chrome view their role in the open web? And I know some of you represent both teams, so. Yeah, okay, uh, let me start. So the, I think primarily on the, we have playing two roles, on my understanding, on the Search and the, to the open ecosystem on o open web. And the first is on the, our long-standing mission that and connect on the users and the content creators. So the, the, it started, it's, it's evolving, of course, and the, it started with on the U-type search query, and then we showed the, the 10 results, and that was a starting point, but it, now we're evolving to the, the query less, like on Discover, or the more visual format, et cetera. But on the fundamental, what we're doing is the connect on the users to you guys. So this is the primary thing and that we can contribute to the, the in this way. And second part is the and a little bit more opinionated, but on the, for example, on the in the past we did on the mobile friendly ranking change, uh, which on the rank the pages that on the friendly to mobile uh, to be higher, and the this is on the massive change on the, in terms of ranking, and the, and the we followed by the under we have the interstitial on the page demotion or recently under we launched the slow page demotion, and these are. Our second role that and uh, we want to carefully nudge the web ecosystem in a way that and that will benefit both users and publishers, content creators in the long term. So the, we are really, really careful and uh, not destroy or distract the under too much. But and, uh, when we see the under, there's a something that an opportunity for the long term and uh, we sometimes use, play that role very carefully. Cool. And then on Chrome, I work on the web platform within Chrome, and it's kind of like. Uh, working for Tesla, wanting electric cars to, to take off. That's kind of how I feel a little bit on the Chrome side. You know, our job isn't about just getting people using Chrome. Uh, it's more about making sure that all of the users out there are meaningfully engaging on the web and having a great experience. And so we get to push the web forward by pushing the platform forward uh, and obviously making sure that Chrome, the browser itself, is really a, a compelling uh, application to actually get that engagement. But that's really what our, we see our role is, is just making sure that the platform itself is ready and that the content is fantastic for users and then obviously for Google as well. Cool, thank you. So we do many things at Google. We've got many teams at Google, um, but it's not so clear perhaps to the external world. So I'd love for someone to articulate uh, the relationship uh, and how the future looks for search, AMP, and news. So that kind of complex interrelationship. Not sure what you mean, but so, so at the, another question that popped up on the on the um, on Slido was, uh, you know, what is the relationship between AMP and Google News, for instance? Sure. Uh, so uh, Google News uh, is a product that that we uh, we make at Google, um, which has on has a mobile version and a desktop version, um, and on the mobile version, it prefers AMP as the uh, publishing format because it makes the experience uh, much much better for users as they're reading content. So you can see this today if you go use the Google News app on, on your phone. Uh, whenever you click an article, it opens up you know, very, very quickly. Uh, and so we've been very excited by, uh, by the development of AMP and being able to use it inside our own products at Google. We use it inside Google News. We use, obviously, we use it inside Search. Um, and so that's an area that's pretty, uh, pretty important to us. Uh, we also are publishers of AMP documents. Something I hear often is, does Google use AMP um, not only do we consume it in, in most of our products, we actually do produce it as well. Uh, if you look at our official company blog, for example, it's in AMP format. Um, so we, we do like to, to use AMP as well. Cool. Did you want to? 
can talk about the kind of general vision of uh, where we see things. So like three years from now, we've kind of got three major pillars in the way we think about things. Uh, one is the web content pillar. And so AMP lives very much uh, in this pillar. And it's ju just about making sure the content experience is fantastic, that you've got you know, great experience within just the content they consume in. But more than that, like we heard earlier talking about portals and the like, you should be able to just kind of float through, through the web like you're just going through a magazine. And right now, that magazine is really slow to turn pages at times. And so we just want to kind of blow past that and just make sure there's a great experience, seamless transactions, all of that kind of good stuff is the base level. Uh, then we have the, the web app side of things, which is more about making sure that you've got all of the rich capabilities you know, on mobile, on desktop and the like. So we have desktop PWAs now across all of the browsers. We've got trusted web activities to get you fantastic experiences that can get you know, really well uh, embedded into the Android side of things, and then obviously across mobile in general. And then we have a developer success pillar, which is really just making sure that you can get the best possible ROI when you're developing on the, on the web. So you get this full reach across all of these devices, you know, globally, everything else, and we have fantastic tools for you uh, to make it as easy as possible. And obviously, uh, AMP fits into that. Nice segue into the next question. So just a bit like Dion did, I don't mind if you would put on your visionary hats to tell us what you think the future of the web and content experiences might be in the next two to three, five years. I'll start so everyone else gets to say the same. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, so I want to pick up, I mean, uh, obviously um, what Dion just said with the, the portals as the new primitive to make navigation from side to side on the web just feel more seamless and more integrated. Um, that really is aligned with what we were trying to do with AMP in the, in the first place, and it now kind of finds its way into web standards, and then um, also to like a larger percentage of the web beyond, beyond AMP is certainly something that, that um, we're working towards and, and want to see in two to three years. One of the things that I mentioned in the keynote yesterday was how I see stories as this, uh, I think I said, like first, um, medium that was truly designed for like the portrait phone experience and so I think along those lines what my what I'm thinking is that that we're actually still like le learning how to use phones and that what we've done so far is that we you know thought we knew what the web was and then you know it just made it smaller to fit on the screen with responsive design, but we didn't, there was no, no, no transformation going on. It was mostly an application of, of, of the existing stuff, which is very reasonable because we were, work, you know, we knew it was already working. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's the greatest, uh, like first approximation of what one, one might do. But I think that as, you know, the phone and portrait mode becomes the primary consumption mode for, for content, we will see that things are evolving in that direction. And so that obviously M Stories is, is going you know, with that trend, but I also don't think it's the end of the road and then that we'll see other things like that emerging from, from folks who you know, grew up on their phones and, and have never you know, used the, the internet any, any, any other way. Richie? Yeah. Um, I'm seeing this on the, I work only in the search team and in these 10 years and the, I'm seeing this as, from the search users on the journey perspective, like on the, yes, on the weekend as a search team and uh, can make them search and result page on the beautiful and the fast to load. But on the, in the end, the user clicked on the result and finding the content on the, on the landing page. So the, on the web search is on the, like on the closer loop on the when actually users have a great experience on the landing page. And the, that is the reason the, the as I mentioned before, the, we try to sometimes play a role to influence on web system. And, what I'm excited about an AMP is uh, some best practices, or the most of the best practices already embedded. So the, the, we try hard to under, like, influence webmasters, uh, no pop-ups, or the, the distant latency implement, et cetera. Um, but the, by using the AMP, and the, most of the things is just there. And the, this is important because the, and the, if you think about on the user's experience, and the, even if the, you make your site really excellent, but and the, if the, some other sites are not really doing great, and the people's perception about the web is like, and the, okay, and the web is slow, and the, only affected by like on the small fraction of bad pages. So then the, what I really want to see in the, in the near future is a web and a search as a general, like on the really snappy and a good experience as a whole, and the user never uh, 
felt like under um, frustration or the under friction um, in their journey. And that's not what I want to see. Amazing, thanks. Sure. Uh, so I think one way to think about where the web is going to go is to, is to really think about the user's expectations in their day-to-day -day life of computing and what kind of experiences that they are used to. And what we're seeing as a trend is more and more users are coming online uh, where their first computer is a phone. Their phone is their experience with the internet. And this is, this is happening worldwide in, in, in new, uh, and in existing markets as well with the youth. The phone is just taken over as the primary computing device. So to understand what users are going to expect, you really have to understand what their experience is today. And most users are spending their time on phones in games. Like if you look at where they spend their time, they spend their time on their phone in messaging apps and productivity and, and surfing the web, but a lot of time is being spent in games. So to us, uh, you know, uh, we might think of the web uh, and might think of the phone as basically a web browser. It's, an, it's a device for productivity or for, for navigating the web. But to our users, increasingly, they think of it like a PlayStation. Like their phone is a game console. That's a lot of where they spend their time. So how does that change the expectations that they have when they go to look for content? Well, they would expect it to be more interactive. They expect it to be more you know, visual, more rich. They expect it to be faster, obviously. Um, so I, I, I think you'll see things like stories that have emerged that uh, play into that model, that they're, they're much more full screen. They're not you know, scrolling-based things. They're, they're full screen at a time. They have a lot of motion. They have a lot of animation. Um, and new interaction models that are more touch oriented, you'll see just that increase as a trend line over the next few years as, as users who are habituated to, to treating their phones like game machines um, start to navigate your content and your applications. So I, where that will wind up, I have no idea, but it's actually very exciting to me because we really haven't had a big change of, of user expectations and interface in a very long time. And I think that's coming. I think we're actually on the vanguard of that. Amazing, thank you. We've got a few minutes left. I just have one last question. Um, we've got lots of amazing things we've announced at AmConf yesterday, and we will do today. Um, new things that are coming out. What are you most excited by? Can I say two things? Of course. One, well, so I'm most excited and really uncomfortably excited about AmScript. Um, I think. <laughs> Many of you will be like it's a it's a big change for AMP, and we will. I'm I'm, ex, I'm excited not as much as a web developer uh, that wants to use it, but I'm excited to see what it does to AMP um, and how it changes how people use the format. So that's I think just intellectually really interesting. And then on the other side, much more forward-looking. Um, Rudy yesterday in his talk talked about Bento AMP. Um, the I think what we didn't mention so much is that this is really an, an uh, the first time we're rethinking the architecture of the M JavaScript library from the ground up. Uh, so technically a rewrite. And literally the state of the engineering project is that this, this is a prototype, but we're giving ourselves a year to land it. Like that's how big of a change it is. Um, so I'm you know, excited because we announced it here, <laughs> and, but we haven't really you know, done all of the work, which is also great because it's an open source project and you could see it anyway, like it's happening there, right? Um, so I'm always, pro telling people about these things. Um, but um, I'm definitely excited to see whether that actually turns out to work. But I'm also very confident about it. I was actually going to lead with Bento M2. I just feel like with you know, HTML, there's like all of these tags that you never use that are like really d random document-oriented tags. And then we just kind of stopped. And we stopped adding these, these features. And now we're in this mobile world where everyone just wants a nav drawer or some tabs of these basic, you know, carousel and the like. And, uh, you know, it's kind of painful to me to watch developers like searching on NPM, you know, where you get variable quality. There's amazing stuff there and there's some other stuff. Uh, and so you download this thing that's got 50 megs of dependencies and it's just, ah, this is a hellish situation. So get into a world where, uh, you know, the work that goes into building a high quality component that's general enough, can be styled correctly, accessible fast. Um, every, uh, you know, every developer shouldn't be having to do that for uh, the things that they're building. So I feel like adding that into the pool from the AMP side uh, to come along with things that are coming on material and lots of things that are out there in the community. Um, I'm really excited about that. And then uh, portals for that vision of I can't wait for a world where 
I'm sitting on Slack or Hangouts chat or something, someone posts in a URL, and it's kind of the live thing actually in there. And I kind of like could just zoom into that world and just navigate and really get back to kind of browsing the web again. Uh, many exciting things, but if I choose one, probably I'm going to choose on AMP Stories still. And uh, yeah, I visited many on the different countries and uh, to uh, know more about on the user, especially young users, and the, and the, as Beth said, and the, how different they see on the, and the, their phone and content consumption. And they do a lot of search, information seeking search on YouTube, for example. And we really need to move towards a visual uh, because uh, that's the end of where users are already there. So then the AMP story is one step forward and we allow, allow us to make another step. That's really exciting to me. Uh, obviously, I echo everything that they said. I, I would add uh, AMP script for me, I think, is uh, also uncomfortably exciting. Um, but the possibility it opens up is quite profound to, to make some new kinds of experiences on AMP possible that weren't just weren't possible before, especially in e-commerce, where you can do it. Uh, folks like AliExpress are doing it. Um, successfully making an AMP first uh, e-commerce site, it's just way more difficult than it, than it really needs to be. And things like AMP script open that up uh, to make it a lot more accessible. And I'm pretty excited to see what will happen with that. Thank you. If you'd ask me, I'd probably just say amp.dev because I'm just excited that we have one place with everything AMP. Um, thank you so much for your answers. Sadly, we've run out of time, so we've got to wrap up the panel. Thank you for being amazing panelists. Thank you for being an amazing audience and sending in some really sharp questions. Um, and with that, we have to wrap up. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day and enjoy the rest of AMP Conference. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. え、それではもう皆さん、あのもう映ってると思いますが、あ、続いては、え、ランチ、え、お昼の休憩になりますなので、え、次は2時半にここ戻ってきていただけたらなというふうに思います。I and we'll see you back here at 2.30. Enjoy. Awesome.
Welcome back from lunch, everyone. After all of that talk about Bento Amp, I definitely tucked in. I'm feeling very full. How are you all doing? Still alive? Still awake? Still ready to go? Let me hear it. Woo! Yes, thank you. Thank you. So we've been hearing a lot of talk about email and how it's been launched. And I'm so excited that the next session is going to be AMP for email. And I really want people to start thinking about um, what's happening outside of the box for what's coming into our inboxes. So please welcome to the stage, Akash. Thank you, Crystal, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Akash Sani, and I'm a product manager on the Gmail team at Google. I'm super excited today to tell you more about AMP for Email, what it is, what you can do with it, and how you can get started. So I wanted to start this session off by talking a little bit about email itself. We all use email for a wide variety of our communication needs almost every single day. We use email for things like making plans with our friends and colleagues, for checking out promotions from places that we shop, for getting the latest updates from social networks that we use, for uh, providing feedback on products or services that we might have purchased. So many, many different use cases uh, that, that people use email for um, all the time. In fact, email is so popular that one and a half billion people use Gmail every month. And last year, over 280 billion emails were sent every single day. So it's hard to overstate how critical email is to people. It keeps them connected. It keeps us connected to a bunch of the things that are important in our lives. But email has also been around for a long time, a few decades at least. And over that time period, the web has evolved really significantly. We've gone from static articles and content on the web to dynamic interactive apps that support complex interactions. For example, in the early 2000s, no one thought that you'd be able to run a full spreadsheet application in your browser, but that's exactly what we can do today with Google Sheets. Over that same time period, though, email has stayed roughly the same. Yes, there have been lots of innovations to how we manage and process our email, but the actual contents of email messages have largely stayed exactly the same over this time period. Emails can include text, images, and links, nothing much more. The content is still static. It still gets out of date, so users might be looking at uh, inaccurate information and stale content. It's not clickable and interactive like users have now come to expect from the rest of the modern web. So to recap, email's been around for decades. It plays a central role in our lives. And during that time, the rest of the web has evolved really dramatically. And yet email has kind of been left behind. The messages you, the messages you can send still just contain text, links, and images. It hasn't really kept up with our expectations from experiences around the web. So that's why last year we introduced AMP for email. AMP for email uh, allows email senders to include all of the richness and interactivity of AMP right there inside of their email messages, bringing email into the 21st century. <coughs> AMP for email can make your emails more interactive with components like AMP Carousel, AMP Accordion, and AMP State that let you build clickable interfaces inside your messages. Using AMP List and AMP Bind, you can keep your email messages up to date so that users are always seeing fresh content, fresh information, and accurate information when they open the message. And with components like AMP Form, users can actually take action right there inside of the message. Like they can respond to a questionnaire uh, or an invitation, all, without, all from the email message and without opening up a new tab in their browser. And with all of these features, from the carousel accordion stuff to the AMP List and the AMP Form, uh, uh, email senders can actually build rich miniature applications inside of their email messages. So a ton of new use cases uh, and impact is possible with AMP for email. And the last point is that AMP for email is compatible with your existing email programs. Uh, it's, it adds to the overall email standard rather than replacing it. So a bunch of never before possible use cases are opened up with AMP for email. And as you might have heard, a few weeks ago, we announced that AMP for email is now available in Gmail. So email senders can include this dynamic, up-to-date content powered by AMP in their messages today. When we launched a couple weeks ago, we announced a number of really exciting emails from senders who had early access to AMP for email. They have already started including AMP inside of their campaigns. They've built some really awesome features for users using AMP for email and have seen some really impressive results. So we'll run through a few examples here. We'll start with commenting in Google Docs. 
<clears throat> as, as one example. Instead of receiving comment notifications that go stale and that require you to open up a new tab, <clears throat> now with the new AMP emails from Google Docs, when someone mentions you in a comment, you'll see an up-to-date thread in Gmail where you can easily reply or resolve the comment right from the message like you see in this, in this screenshot. Pinterest has made it easier to discover new ideas and save them to boards in your Pinterest account. So when uh, Pinterest sends you a notification recommending new ideas to you, you can quickly browse them and save them to whichever boards you like, all without opening up a new tab uh, in your browser. Equid makes it really easy to browse catalogs and shop for items using AMP Carousel and AMP State. Uh, so you can, you can uh, hear about the latest sales from your favorite retailers. Uh, Indeed is a job search website that has a new AMP-powered job alert email. So these emails uh, notify users about jobs that they might be interested in. And their new AMP-powered uh, email fetches the latest recommended jobs and inserts them into the message so that the user sees uh, jobs that are more relevant, jobs that are still available, and jobs that are more personalized. Now with these emails, Indeed has observed two times the clicks on their job alert emails compared to the static equivalents. So a pretty massive improvement in uh, in the key metric that they measure for, um, for interactions with their, uh, with their emails. Oyo is a popular hospitality and travel booking company that sends users travel recommendations uh, where they can browse suggested accommodations and view details. So in this example, you can see the user browsing through uh, proposed, um, proposed accommodations. They can see details like user ratings, whether there's Wi-Fi and whether breakfast is included, and they can make their decision about whether to book, uh, book this stay. Not only are these messages super cool and more useful for users, uh, in a pilot that Oyo recently ran, they're also seeing massive improvements to click-through rate and conversion on these emails. They're seeing 57% higher click-through rate and 60% higher conversion, uh, which is sh sort of showcases the massive potential when you add this interactivity and up-to-date content uh, to your email messages. And we'll hear a bunch more from, uh, from Anirudh from Oyo in a little bit. So that's just a handful of the senders who are adopting AMP for email already. Many more are coming soon, including Redbus, Freshworks, and Booking.com. It's very early, but we're excited about the impact that AMP emails are having on use cases that users experience every day, and also bringing real measurable value to email senders who adopt it. So we knew that when we created AMP for email, that for it to actually meaningfully modernize email in the way that we wanted, uh, the, in the way that we envisioned, we also had to engage the email ecosystem to ensure that AMP emails could be delivered and tested using the right tools. <clears throat> and there are a lot of pieces to this puzzle for email senders. Many senders use email delivery services to ensure that their messages reach users reliably. They use a service for testing their emails to ensure that they render properly across devices and clients. And to have the most impact possible, AMP emails had to be compatible uh, with as many email clients as possible. So we're really excited to share that we've partnered with some of the most popular players in each of these areas. We've partnered with the email delivery services, SendGrid, SparkPost, and even Amazon AWS's simple email service and pinpoint service all support AMP for email. Litmus is a very popular testing platform for testing your emails, which also now supports AMP for email. And last, we've engaged with other email providers. AMP for email is supported today in Gmail and in mail.ru, both popular email services, and is coming soon to Yahoo Mail and Outlook.com. So with AMP for email, you can bring engaging experiences to your emails, shifting them from being static, flat messages to dynamic, interactive, mini applications. Your emails can fetch up-to-date information and allow users to take action right from the message. And with all of that, you can build, you, uh, AMP for email unlocks a whole range of new use cases that we never thought were possible inside of emails. So a lot of impact and a lot of power. And we're also seeing, like I mentioned earlier, uh, some really impressive results from the sender's perspective. Uh, so not only are we making uh, these experiences more useful for users, they're also having a massive impact on the effectiveness of uh, email campaigns. And for email is also compatible with your existing email program and a bunch of different delivery tools like SendGrid and SparkPost, as well as Litmus, uh, and available in two email providers, Gmail and Mail.ru, coming soon to Yahoo and uh, Outlook.com. So we're really excited about AMP for email, and uh, we can't wait to see what you all build using AMP for email. And it's easier than ever to get started. Uh, you can learn how to build your AMP emails, test your AMP emails, uh, and register to send your AMP emails to Gmail users uh, at the link that's on the screen, g.co slash dev slash AMP email. 
and we'll put that back up on the screen at the end of the presentation. Um, and now for the rest of the, the session, um, we're going to focus on uh, sharing a bit about how you can get started. So we'll start with a, a session from Philip from, from our team um, who will show us how we can get started with some simple examples uh, on Infra Email. And then we have a few other uh, partners who will be coming up to share uh, some more complex uh, tips and tricks for, for um, uh, scaling and productionizing your AMP emails. So uh, to start with, I'd like to invite Philip Stannis up on stage to walk us through some simple examples uh, of AMP for email. Hello, everyone. My name is Philip Stannis, and I'm a partner developer advocate working on AMP for email at Google. Now, you heard from Oti yesterday, and you've heard from Akash just now, AMP for email is here. And I bet many of you are wondering, how do I get started with it? How, do, how can I send an email that contains AMP? Good news, that's why I'm here. So like every good AMP development, uh, we're going to start with going to AMP.dev, specifically playground.amp.dev. This is the familiar AMP playground. And the first thing that we are going to do here is change the format to AMP for email in the top left corner. What this will give us is the simple email boilerplate that we'll start from. And we're also going to expand this window so we have more space to maneuver. Now, let's break down this boilerplate a little bit. This is the minimum uh, amount of markup that you need for a valid AMP email. First things first, you have the HTML tag with the AMP for email attribute. This is similar to the lightning bolt you use in AMP for web, except in this case, you're just mentioning that this markup is an AMP email. Next up, we have the meta character set. This just tells that, the, uh, that you'll be using the UTF-8 character set. And uh, this is mandatory, just like AMP for the web. Next up, we have the title tag. Uh, this one is optional. It's there for compatibility reasons. Uh, so you're free to keep it, but emails have a subject. So we don't really need it. We'll just remove it. Coming up next is the AMP runtime the famous v0.js. You'll notice this is the exact same one that you use for the web. And this is the same AMP runtime that powers emails as well. Up next, we have the AMP for email boilerplate. Uh, again, you'll notice it's similar, but much simpler than the one we have for the web. Really, the only thing need, we need to do here is make sure the body is not shown until v0.js kicks in. Finally, we have the style tag. And this is where you can put all your custom CSS. Here we'll just put in some margin on the H1 tag. And of course, the most important part of the email is the body. Now, uh, one good thing about using the AMP playground is that it's real time. So we can just immediately make this uh, email a little bit friendly to AMPConf and say hello to everyone. Now, this is a talk about email. so. What I'm going to do next is open my Gmail account. And what I prepared here is an email that uses HTML that just has some simple markup that we're get, we'll use to get started. You'll see a couple of images, some text, nothing special there. And we'll use this as a starting point for our AMP email. We'll upgrade this email to be a bit more dynamic. The way we're going to do that is go back to the AMP playground, and I'm just going to copy paste the markup that I used to create this HTML email. And this looks quite similar to what we had in Gmail. Now, some of you might have noticed there's a problem here. We have a few of these uh, red circles, and there are some errors here. This is not valid AMP. And the corporate is, of course, the images. Uh, we're using HTML images, so what we need to do is change them to AMP images. It's a simple fix. We already have a width and height, so all we need to do is replace these images with AMP image, and let's not forget to close the tag. Another thing I want to bring your attention to here is that all URLs are absolute. We cannot use relative URLs in emails. Um, this is simply because relative URLs don't really make much sense since you'll be in your email client and not on a website. So just keep that in mind when you're making emails. All URLs will need to be absolute. Now, once we've done that, 
we're back to having this email that we started from, but now it's valid AMP, which is really good. Another small tweak we can do is move this CSS from the style tag, from the style attribute to the style tag up top. This is not really necessary, but it will make the whole thing a little bit more manageable. So we'll give this uh, div a class, and we'll just move the uh, CSS attributes we have up top. There we go. And we might as well give it some padding while we're at it, because why not? And uh, yeah, this is now a valid AMP email. Unfortunately, it's not very exciting. It's still just HTML with some uh, valid AMP markup and some CSS. So we're going to fix that. One easy thing we can do is add an AMP accordion. The good thing about AMP accordion is that we're already following the correct markup here. We have sections and headings. So all we really need to do is wrap this whole email inside an AMP accordion, and this should just work. And I'm going to do that uh, right now. Of course, never forget, we're using a new AMP component here. We need to make sure it's included at the top. Luckily, the AMP playground did this for us, so nothing else ne we need to do here. Um, this seems to work. Let's try it out. We can try out the live preview on the right, see if this accordion collapses and does its thing. Yep, this seems quite good. We have a working accordion. Now, many of you have used AMP, so I'm pretty sure this is not very exciting. We should probably take this to Gmail instead. Now, to do that, we're going to use a different tool. We're going to use the Gmail AMP Playground. Uh, to use it, we can just navigate to amp.gmail.dev slash playground. This is the, uh, this is the tool by, made by the Gmail team that's similar to the AMP Playground. And you'll see that it's quite similar in appearance, and there is a preview and a markup. But one thing that's different about it is the send button. The send button allows us to immediately send this email that we've drafted to our Gmail account. It will use the account of the currently logged in Gmail user to do that. So it basically always sends the email to us. And let's try that out right now. Let's go back to the AMP Playground. We're going to copy our markup, go back to the Gmail Playground, and paste it there. And if we've done this correctly, the accordion should still work. Seems good. Let's give it a better subject line. Maybe photo album and amp. And I think we're done. Ready to press that send button. OK. Now, if this worked, I can just go back to my Gmail account. And there's a new email right there. Oh, that's not good. It's not an AMP accordion. Now, uh, Gmail has this um, requirement. If you'd like to use AMP inside of Gmail, uh, you need to be registered with Gmail as an AMP sender. You can learn more about the registration process from the Gmail docs, or you can just approach us in the AMP for email boot after this talk, and we can tell you more about this. But right now, we, we just want to try it out. We don't really want to send this accordion to a billion users. Um, so there is a quick thing we can do. We can enable developer settings for AMP, uh, for dynamic emails. And this will allow us to render this AMP email inside of Gmail right now. So let's do that. Let's head over to Gmail settings. Now, the one we are looking for is called dynamic email. And the first thing that you need to make sure is uh, you need to check that dynamic emails are enabled. And you can do that by checking this checkbox. And after you've done that, there's the dynamic email development button right below it. Press that, and you will see this pop-up box. Now, this is the important part. This pop-up box allows you to type in a single email address that will be an allowed sender for AMP emails. This means that any email sent from this address will, be, will arrive into this one inbox, even if it's not registered with Gmail. 
which is very nice for testing. And in fact, we can just put the email address of the playground right there. Uh, what's the email address of the playground again? Uh, you should probably check the documentation. You don't really need to know this by heart, but it's amp at gmail.dev. This is the email address that the playground used to send us the email that we already received that's currently not displaying. We're going to press OK and save our settings. And this will also refresh Gmail automatically for us. And if we've done everything correctly, we can open this email again. There we have it, our first dynamic email. It's an AMP accordion rendering right in the email inbox, right before, right, right before our eyes. Now, this is dynamic, and it's definitely something you don't see in email every day, but it's not very exciting. We can probably do something better here. We can make this email a bit more dynamic, and to do that, let's first delete what we have. We're going to start over. We'll try using a more interesting AMP component. I'm thinking the component that would be great here is AMP list. This will allow us to fetch content from the server and render it inside of Gmail. So as a source, I'll use this JSON endpoint we have on m.dev, which has some images and some descriptions. I'll give it an ID, and we also need to give it some height, let's say 500. Now what this will do, as you're probably familiar with AMP list, is fetch this JSON endpoint, and it will allow us to render it inside an AMP, a mustache template, of course. And the template we're going to use here is pretty much the same one that we already had. So we we'll put a section there, a title to it. We can wrap the rest of it in a div, put an AMP Im image, set the source. We're going to need width and height, of course. And as you can see, this is all being updated live on the right side. So we have some nice images here, and we just need to add the description as well. OK, this looks good. This looks like the original email we had, except this one is rendered using AMP list, so it's all dynamic. Let's do another thing. Let's put a button up top. Uh, this button will call refresh on AMP list. Now, this endpoint is a bit specific. It will return random images with some random text every time. So if we refresh AMP list, we will get different results. And that's quite nifty, because we can, we can then just get different results every time we press this button. I think this looks good. We have our original email, but now dynamic. So I guess we, all we need to do now is bring this to Gmail. And you know, you know the drill. Copy this, go to the Gmail playground, and paste it. And uh, hopefully it still looks good. Everything still works. So I think we're ready to give it a subject and tap send. We'll use a different subject so we don't, uh, so we can differentiate it from the previous email we sent, and we press send. And if this works correctly, we'll see this email in our Gmail inbox. So let's go back to Gmail. There's a new email right there. And would you look at that? All dynamic. This email is rendered fully from our server endpoint, and all of these images are loaded after the email is opened. So it's completely dynamic, and it comes from our server, powered by AMP list, using AMP inside Gmail. But there's one more thing. We can press the uh, Load More button, and you'll notice that this will refresh the list. So this email can be kept evergreen, depending on our server, server content. We can update this email content uh, by simply updating our server, and there's no need to send another email with the same content uh, with, 
uh, thanks to our good friend, Ampuist. Now, I hope you enjoyed this demo. It's quite dynamic, but it's also quite basic. There is not, uh, it's still just images and text. So, uh, what, what I'm going to do now is invite on stage Michael from Doodle and Anirudh from All Your Rooms. They have created some more advanced emails, and they have some really nifty tips and tricks they can share with us about the emails they've built. And by the way, these emails are already in production, and they are sending these emails to their users. So they have some real experience with this and some really useful things to say. And with that in mind, I'd like to invite Michael from Doodle on stage. Thanks, Philip. Hello, Tokyo. My name is Michael Wergler, and I am an engineer at Doodle. Doodle is a company that is focused on solving the problems around scheduling. So Doodle can help you book and schedule your meetings faster and easier. You might already be familiar with the polling functionality of Doodle, um, where you simply supply a set of options, invite some people to participate, everyone votes on a time that works best for them, and from there, a clear winner emerges. But now with Doodle, you can find the best time to meet a person simply by using the new one-to-one -one meeting invites. Simply offer the times that work best for you and either send a link directly to your guest or you can send them an email invite. You can even send this event to multiple people and let them choose their favorite option on a first-come, first-served basis without fear of ever being double-booked. So no matter how you participate, the meeting can be instantly booked on your calendars. Boom. Doodle 101 just saved you some time. So this is where the story where AMP for email begins. We wanted to make scheduling one-on-ones even faster. So we created a dynamic email that lets the user pick a time directly in their inbox. When the invitees open their inbox, they are greeted with a powerful dynamic experience that is always up to date. This means the time options that your recipient sees are always valid. So they're incapable of double booking your calendar and incapable of showing you time options that have since expired. So for a scheduling company, this is huge because it means that the emails that we send can be smart about scheduling. It means they can adapt to the context of time. It means they can adapt to the, the, the context of your booking. And so for us, this is huge, but it's really the users that benefit because dynamic emails align with our core mission, which is to make scheduling faster and easier. Dynamic mails can also do unprecedented things like let you decide which time zone you want to see the time options displayed in. And again, for a scheduling company, this is amazing. Because these emails are dynamic, if you've already booked the event, then you will only ever see the confirmation email instead of the time options because these emails are smart. They know the context of things. So what did we learn when we created this dynamic email? Let's take a closer look at how we built the dynamic features and how we're able to navigate around a few obstacles when dealing with some of our advanced use cases. First stop was AmpList. It is your best friend on the dynamic side of AMP, but your relationship will be a little different than what you know from AMP development because AMP list in AMP for email has a few key differences. First important difference is that AMP list component does not let you bind to source in an email. Similarly, the form component cannot bind to the action. The ability to set the source attribute is a very powerful AMP feature. But since it's not available in AMP for email, it is safe to say that this is where some of the complexity in your emails might be introduced, is it kind of navigating around this limitation. Here on the left, you see an example of a single AMP list and template that does allow dynamic binding to the source attribute. So this is where new data can be fetched and fed to the template as often as you want. But things can be slightly more complicated when you can't bind to source, so you might find yourself in a situation where you have to manage a lot of side effects to pull off some advanced state changes. Luckily, AMP kind of handles all this complexity for you, so in the end, it's actually quite simple. And don't worry if you can't read this code. This is really just to illustrate the fact that we were able to pull off quite some advanced use cases with very little boilerplate. So in my mind, this is a testament to the power and simplicity of AMP. You can do a lot with very little. 
So let's walk the structure a little. Uh, first, we have three hoisted templates. Uh, these can get somewhat complex um, because they are sometimes shared, which means they need to account for the different states in your app. But hoisting them means that you can reuse and share them, which is really cool. So in our case, we were sometimes sharing our templates between our AMP list and our form components. Next, we have three hidden forms. These can be dynamically submitted, and their inputs can have their values bound to state. And by the way, using forms that you can programmatically submit are not only a workaround for this limitation, but they're a very strong pattern all on its own. You just programmatically submit a form whose hidden inputs can bind their uh, value attributes, and then the form can consume a shared template. It's a very strong pattern. Finally, we have three AMPLIS components. These just so happen to share the same endpoint for data, uh, but they were in different parts of our app. And here you see some chained actions. Uh, you can do a lot of really powerful and advanced stuff very simply by chaining uh, actions together in AMP. Uh, the main takeaway from this section is that some marginal complexity can be expected because you basically have to roll your own internal routing mechanisms. And the uh, chain side effects are probably the trickiest part to manage, in my opinion. But again, AMP takes away all this complexity from you and keeps things pretty simple. So AMP makes complicated things simple. You can quote me on that. And in case I scared you away, let me just emphasize that you can still do a lot with a single AMPLIST component. Our very first working demo of the Doodle 101 email loaded everything into a single AMPLIST component. It wasn't until uh, we introduced time zones into the mix and we needed to account for variable height um, or variable length user supplied content that things started to get a little tricky. Next focus for us was responsiveness. And initially, our misconception with AMP lists uh, layout equals responsive attribute. Um, the label responsive was a little misleading for us at first, because what it really means is that it will force the relevant container to honor the aspect ratio of the required width and height attributes. This is great for AMP image and AMP video components. And it's also fine if you know the height of the incoming content, but it's less than ideal when you're trying to build a responsive layout um, that can handle variable length user supplied content. And this was exactly our problem. The Doodle 101 email allows the creator to supply custom messages. And these messages can be very long or very short, depending. So we had a tricky time trying to fit these variable length messages into a container that needed to have a fixed height um, or aspect ratio. First way you could get around this is to set a really high height attribute that can fit all of your content. This is an OK workaround if the AMP list component is the last component in your stack, uh, like you see on the left. Otherwise, the AMP list is capable of clipping the content of the elements below it, like you see on the right. But again, this is still very manageable if you're very careful about the, the heights that you set. And this is just to show why the clipping can occur. The component will take up the entire height you set, leaving you with this kind of uh, clipping space below the component if the, if the content you supply is not big enough to fill the fixed space. So if the AMP, com the AMP list component uh, can be the last component, or you know the height of the incoming content, then you can totally get away with this option. Second option, we could use scroll bars, but no. Emails have always known how to scale to its content size. And we wanted to respect the email as a medium, uh, but we also don't want to do unforgivable things like put scroll bars within scroll bars, so no. Our current solution was to swap the AMP list for a form when needed. The AMP list and the HTML form can share the same template, so they are effectively copies of each other. Uh, the only difference is that the AMP list might have the responsive quirks with a fixed height, and the HTML form is naturally responsive. So swapping one for the other is a pattern that we use a lot only when needed. The main problem with this approach is that it only works if you make a network request. 
So you remember this slide. You can see how you can programmatically submit the form, and then you can assign it a shared template. So this might be seen as a drawback for some because it requires that extra network request. But it does work, and it is currently solving some problems for us kind of on the more extreme edge of things. That's a nice pattern. Currently, given all these constraints, we have concluded that the best of all worlds scenario is just to mix and match these solution sets. So what we'll do next is we will try to fit more into the initial AMP list um, that, that fetches the up-to-date data, then swaps itself out for a copy form as early as needed. Um, in our local test, we found that the clipping space underneath the AMP list is totally manageable. Another area where we spent some time was learning the difference between AMP's mustache templates versus the original mustache templates. So let's take a look at m the mustache documentation to see what we should expect. If you notice the top paragraph, it says, if the person key does not exist or exists and has a value of null, undefined, false, zero, or NAN, or is an empty list or an empty string, the block will not be rendered. So given a key value with person false, and a template where we would print never shown if the person was set to true, the output we would expect to see in this case is the text shown, because this part of the template would only display if the person value equals true or is truthy. So an AMP on this case will actually render the never shown text, because AMP mustache doesn't read the value of the key to infer truthiness like you would expect. Instead, it sees the existence of the key as truthy. So the bigger implication for us here meant that the server needed to do a lot of conditional checks and only attach the variables to the response JSON payload if the value would have been truthy. Um, so for us, the general rule of thumb was a key that does not exist will always be considered false in AMP mustache, and it's worked well for us so far. Next topic is an important one. Uh, let's take a moment to consider that websites are evergreen, but emails are forever. Web, op web apps have the benefit of continuous delivery, so new features and bug fixes can be made instantly available to your users. But emails are different. Once you send an email, you are forever committed to this email as a fixed version because it's an email, and you can't change the front end of an email that you've already sent. So let me just be clear. AMP for email lets the content of your email be up to date. Every time you open the email, fresh new content to your users. What is fixed, though, is the actual markup, the source code that you had to type that ships with the email. That's fixed forever. You can't change that. So the strong recommendation here is versioning. Just start versioning your front-end templates and your APIs from the very beginning. This will protect you. Um, guarantee that you'll be always backwards compatible because your emails will be expected to work no matter how old they are. So versioning can help us not hurt the user's inbox experience. Next big consideration for us was tracking. I won't go into too much detail here. Just suffice it to say that you can still use tracking pixels and click tracking on URLs the, in the exact same way you would in an HTML email. I know my slide says same as HTML, but I meant to say same as HTML email. And all your other meaningful tracking can be done through the server. You're basically just taking advantage of the fact that your front end is in constant communication with your back end. And uh, so there, from the back end, you just dispatch your analytics. So those are really the biggest considerations for us when creating an AMP-powered email. Other than that, it was all just typical AMP development. I may have made things sound like they were complicated, but AMP really takes care of all these complications for you. So everything was really very straightforward for us. Just a few bonus items in closing. Use the AMP Playground, which has AMP for email support. You just saw Philip demo it. It has built-in validation. It can instantly send you an email for live testing in your inbox, and it can really help you to prototype and test and troubleshoot your emails. Next, don't skip the tests. And I just want to be the very first to officially welcome you to this new age where you get to start writing integration tests for your emails. If you have hash development equals one in your URL bar, then you get access to the print state method, um, which is on the AMP global. 
This will print your current application state and help you to debug your applications. This is not AMP for email specific. This is something that you can also do in AMP, uh, but it's, it's really nice when you're building your emails. Finally, another big tip, the ordering of your MIME types matter. Uh, the RFC spec will tell you that the order should be plain text, then HTML, then AMP, but due to a limitation in some email clients, we have to be a little bit naughty and break spec in order to get this email working everywhere, but by magic, it does work everywhere that we've tested. This means that the MIME type order that you should use today is plain text, then AMP, then HTML. And I also wanted to mention that some of the email service providers out there that are already AMP enabled um, are aware of this, and they do this for you behind the scenes. So those are really bi the biggest takeaways for us in creating our dynamic email um, at Doodle. We're very excited to be a part of this process, and we're very excited to see the positive user engagement that has come from the inbox. So we're also very excited to see what the rest of you do with this really cool technology. So thank you very much for your time. I will now bring on Anirudh. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Anirudh, and I work as a software developer at OI Rooms. We are a tech-based hospitality company where we enable our users to be able to book an awesome stay with as less number of taps on the screen as possible. You can mostly find me working on exciting web projects, such as AMP for email, AMP in general, progressive web apps, and so on. So this winter, we had a lot of fun uh, experimenting with AMP emails and proud to announce that we have finally welcomed them into our production systems. But before I begin describing about all that, let me put forward some points regarding what, what issues we face with normal emails. So number one, emails with dynamic data, such as uh, ratings or room prices, once you send those emails, there is no way updating those dynamic pieces of information. So suppose a visitor comes to Oyerum's website, browses some hotels, makes a search, and leaves without creating a booking yet. In those cases, we might want to send them an email stating that, hey, here are some recommended OYO rooms that you might have left behind. The problem here is that many of those rooms might even get sold out by the time uh, they open their emails. As a result, emails frequently get obsolete. Also, the layouting options in emails are pretty limited these days. They are limited when compared to your normal web pages, and they are limited when compared to the out-of-the-box layouting options that AMP can provide. So all in all, we can say that emails with dynamic data are like a mayfly. They live for a day or maybe even a few hours. But thankfully, today, everything changes. AMP steps in as that long overdue revolution in emails that we as content creators, as email campaigners, did not even know that we needed. And this elegantly solves most of the issues that we just mentioned. Because email is not just email anymore. So here is, this, uh, here is one of the example AMP HTML email that we created back at OU. You'll, uh, so what this does, what this does is it, uh, it lists out some of the recommended OU rooms for, for a user. And you'll notice that when you open this email, an API call actually goes and fetches the fresh data from our servers. So it cannot get stale. Also, the interactivity in this email is off the charts when compared to a normal HTML email. We have a beautiful AMP carousal. When you click on one of the items in the carousal, you have the ability to go to the next screen, uh, show the hotel, uh, view the hotel details, and you, you are not basically thrown to a new tab like usual, usual emails. Uh, also, when you click on the ratings uh, in the hotel details, it pops up and shows, uh, shows the expanded view of the ratings, which are also freshly, fe uh, freshly fetched from the API. So, Let's see a minimal version of uh, this code, this AMP HTML markup, to see uh, what, goes on, uh, what goes into creating one of these beautiful email experiences. 
So suppose you want to uh, include an API call into your emails. You just pick an AMP list and give it a URL for, for uh, fetching the data, and then throw the data into an AMP template. And then you can use any number of interactive co AMP components to create amazing email experiences. It's as easy as that, and your, your AMP skills really do come in handy. So moving on to uh, one of the more specific examples, the one where you click on the ratings and it pops up and fetch, uh, fetches the data from an API. And this is happening inside of the details which just came in from an API itself. So how do we do that? Again, pick, uh, there's a parent AMP list which fetches the hotel details. And you have all the details in the template, along with which there is an aggregate rating which is also a button by which you by on the click of which you can expand the uh, the rating details, and you'll notice that the button is actually enwrapped in an AMP form, and the form has that endpoint which can fetch the uh, the details, the rating details from an API. So uh, on the click of this button, two things are happening. For one, the form is getting submitted, and you can also uh, see that there is uh, an update in the state so that a pop-up can be opened. And then once your data is here, once your rating details are here, you can, use, uh, you can use your imagination to show in whichever way you want them. So this is pretty awesome, right? But you should be asking questions like, how secure is that? How robust is that? So I'd like to say that API calls can go only to the sender's domain, so if you trust the sender, you thereby trust the API calls. We also have uh, no chance for adding any external scripts into the, into the AMP emails, so only AMP components are allowed. And we have graceful fallback to plain HTML in case your email clients do not support uh, AMP HTML yet, so that the recipients never come across any broken experiences. And here's the great part. We actually did a pilot program uh, and sent AMP emails to actual users, and the results were profounding. 57% better click-through rate was experienced, and what's even better is the 60.20% conversion lift for visitors coming via AMP emails. So let me summarize all of that. You can have the power of AMP emails via interactive components, the various layout options that AMP can provide, uh, responsiveness is baked in, so that's a big plus. The power of making API calls. Form submissions, which can help us in modifying the booking of users, maybe uh, making a search or gathering user feedback right within the email itself. Graceful fallback, like I just mentioned, and the endless potential to create unique solutions right within your uh, recipient's inboxes. So uh, by this time, many of you know that uh, integrating AMP emails requires you to uh, play with a new MIME type, right? Uh, but let me emphasize on what actually goes into integrating AMP emails into your existing email systems. What steps do you, need to, uh, do you actually need to take? So uh, suppose that you have your new shining AMP HTML template ready. You need to bring it into your uh, email systems. And you need to set its content type as X AMP HTML. And secondly, and finally, you just need to attach that part into your existing email message or the MIME tree. Now, I know these two steps seem very brief right now. So if you want to go deeper and get your hands dirty with integrating AMP emails and this new MIME type, we have a script ready. This is a Python script. This URL will take you to it. And you can use it and uh, re refer it for sending AMP emails via Amazon Simple Email Service, or SES. So thank you so much for listening to me, guys, and keep amplifying. Nice job. Thanks very much, Annie Red. Can we get another round of applause for all of our uh, demos? Those are really strong. Thank you. So um, we saw a little about how we can get started with AMP for email. And we invite all of you to start, use, start trying AMP for email today. You can use the playground in uh, the, the AMP playground. You can use the Gmail playground. And um, all of the documentation is available uh, on the links on the screen, g.co slash dev slash AMP email. Uh, can, uh, 
details how you can get started testing, um, as well as uh, details how you can register with Gmail to actually send your emails at scale when you're ready to do that. Uh, Go.amp.dev slash email has all of the more detailed reference on the components you can use, uh, the MIME type ordering, and all of the other details associated. So I uh, invite everyone to um, uh, visit the documentation uh, on the screen and uh, uh, get started with AMP for email and start building uh, new interactive dynamic experiences inside of their emails. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much for listening. え、いや、大変アンプイメール面白かったと思います。ちょっと時間が押してるので、え、ここは手短に、え、ここから今から、え、2セッション連続で、え、サインドHTTPエクスチェンジの話をします。まず最初は、え、アンプキャッシュがど
The AMP cache can't provide that real-time TLS connection, as it doesn't possess private keys for any domain names except Google.com. Therefore, the AMP cache URLs must be on Google.com. So this is a very simplified version of privacy-preserving pre-rendering. In order to preserve privacy, we have no choice but to load a document from Google server, the Google AMP cache. This provides a buffer between the user and the publisher until the user has chosen to click on a link and indicate that they're interested in that content. This set of constraints leads us to the URL problem that we started with at the very beginning of this talk. The question we have here is, can we achieve privacy-preserving instant preloading while fixing the URL identity problem at the same time? So the way we're going to do this is a new collection of browser technologies called web packaging. So we believe this can enable privacy-preserving prefetchers, pre prefetching, have trouble saying that, while displaying to the user the URL of the document author. In particular, we're interested in a web packaging technology called signed exchange. So signed exchanges provide digital proof that to the browser that a document delivered has not been notified from what the author intended. This allows a third-party cache, such as the AMP cache, to manage the delivery of the signed exchange. When a browser sees this digital signature, it can display the publisher's URL regardless of who delivered the file on the last network connection, be it a Wi-Fi router, the AMP cache, or the original server. The result is a navigation to the publisher's own URL while maintaining a privacy-preserving prefetch. So I want to go into a little bit of detail what's required in order to be able to implement signed exchanges on your own site. So the first thing is you'll need a new digital certificate for your domain name. If you've ever worked at TLS before, HTTPS, you've seen this, and this is a very familiar process. There's a few small differences. The new certificate requires a new extension called Can Signed HTTP Exchanges, which allows for use in signed exchanges. The certificates also can have a max of 90-day lifetime. The typical process involves providing proof to a certificate authority that you control the domain in question, upload a CSR, a certificate signing request, and receive a certificate file back from the authority. If you've ever done this before with TLS certificates, exactly the same process. Currently, the only certificate authority that I know of that's issuing these certificates is DigiCert. But as other certificates add support, you can search for Can Signed HTTP Exchanges certificate, and you should be able to find some more information. So it's important that users are served regular web pages while AMP caches are served as signed exchange. As a result, your web server must be able to vary the content type based on the request headers in the HTTP request. This is how you're similar to how your web server would handle gzip, for instance. If your web browser doesn't understand how to unzip it, don't send gzip. If it does, you do. A very simple site demonstrating this can be found at amppackageexample.com. So this is a simplified example of a standard HTTP request and response pair. It probably looks very familiar. The only change when serving normal responses for signed exchanges is to add a very HTTP header. The very header here shows that we want that the browser, uh, that the website can vary based on the, these headers, except an AMP cache transform. The document itself is AMP as we know it. However, when a participating AMP cache crawler, such as Googlebot, visits, it will then send the HTTP request headers advertising that is capable of understanding a signed exchange. It does this via some new request headers. The first is a simple accept header that specifies, hey, I can accept an application signed exchange. The second is a new header called AMP cache transform. That, that tells the server that the request is coming from the AMP cache, so a signed exchange is preferred over normal HTML. It also conveys some additional information that helps the AMP packager optimize the document it's serving. The server then responds with a new file, application signed exchange, as the content type, it's a binary format, so there's not much to see that's readable here. But the first three bytes will be SXG. In order to support signed exchanges with AMP, we have open sourced a web server. Uh, this implementation can uh, perform all the necessary transformation and signing that is necessary. It's called the AMP Packager. The AMP Packager is implemented in Go as a binary. You can run it on your own infrastructure today, and it can sign and package AMP documents. 
let's look briefly at its deployment requirements. Expanding out the, the diagram for a few slides ago, the AMP Packager is a back-end web server component. It's designed to sit behind your own front-end reverse proxy. You would configure your server to send AMP cache requests to the Packager, and user requests would be uh, operating the same way. The AMP Packager, in turn, fetches the original AMP documents from your own back-end, optimizes, and signs them. A few other things to mention. The AMP Packager needs regular updates, roughly every six weeks, and it will need to make infrequent outgoing internet connections to a certificate authority to update certs and so forth, as well as to cdnantproject.org to grab new CSS and JavaScript. There's additional news. Oh, sorry. At this point, I would like to uh, in <laughs> introduce Jack Bloom from Cloudflare. Thank you. Sorry. Hello. He'll be back. So I work at Cloudflare, and Cloudflare is a CDN. It's also a global edge network. We sit in front of 15 million websites, and we help protect them from threats, and we help make them faster. We sit in front of so many websites that you've probably used Cloudflare today already without realizing it. When we heard about signed exchanges, this thing that I think Malta described yesterday as the solution to the single biggest problem with AMP, we started thinking. And what we wanted to think about was, is there a way that we can solve this problem without requiring people to do cryptography, without requiring people to provision certificates, do all these steps that aren't particularly easy? And the reason that's important is because we believe in the AMP vision, this idea that the web it can't just be possible to build really great things on the web. It has to be easy. And it has to be accessible for everyone if we want the web to be great. So we started thinking, is there a way we can solve this really hard technical problem not for one site or 10 sites or 100 sites, but for 15 million sites. And so what we came up with is, is what I'm going to show you right now. You can turn signed exchanges on your Cloudflare site right now. You can flip a switch, which you're going to look at right now. If you use Cloudflare, you're probably familiar with our dashboard. If you don't use Cloudflare, you will become very familiar with it. If you click the speed button that looks suspiciously similar to an AMP logo in an unintentional way, we were, we were first. You scroll down, and you find this lovely section called AMP Real URL, and then you turn it on. This is the end of the instructions. <laughs> and we will start doing this signature back and forth with Google whenever Google asks for an AMP copy of your domain. And your domain will start being served from Google search results on your actual website. Problem solved. We enabled this yesterday during Malta's talk. Over 2,000 people have already turned it on. So five times the number of people in this room have already enabled signed exchanges and, and, and are doing it hopefully close soon, in the very near future. So we would love for you to turn it on as well. Uh, we believe in the future of the internet. And we believe in AMP as a part of that. And we just really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of it. Thank you. Oh, and it's free. <laughs> so real quick, how would you test your site in whatever way you've set up signed exchanges? We're working on some adding better tooling in the future, but here's a few quick ways you can do it. First, check your browser. You need to be running the latest version of Chrome, 73 or later. It's currently a Chrome support-only feature, but we hope other browsers will add support soon. Next, you can try fetching your page through the AMP project cache. You'll need to change this URL up here to match your own. Basically, replace dots with hyphens, and the path ends in your full URL without the protocol. If you open Chrome Dual DevTools Network tab, you'll see something like this as this loads. It'll show the resource being loaded from the AMP cache as a type signed exchange. This will be immediately followed by a request for a certificate with a type cert chain CBOR. Lastly, you can see the document is loaded once the certificate has been verified. But since this requires no additional network request, it's loaded from the signed exchange itself. Finally, you can test this on Google Search, just like what you would with your normal AMP pages. This can take a few days as you wait for Google indexing to pick up your changes. Once everything is in place, you'll see the page with your own URL. There's more documentation to be found, uh, including details about all of these steps that I talked about at amp.dev. Check it out. 
Thanks, everyone, for your time. Have a great conference. はいえー、アンプキャッシュおよびクラウドフレアがどのように、えー、サイネ h t p エクシェンジを使っているかという、えー、面白い話でした。えー、ということで,です、ねえー、次は、えー、アフジャパンによる、えー、具体的にどういうふうにサイネ h t p エクシェンジを導入したかという話が入ります。えー、非常に楽しみです。All right, next move on to the next session. Maximize Yahoo Japan's UX with AMP and Sign HTTP exchanges. Please、uh, welcome Hirohito Shigeki Ryo from Yahoo Japan. じゃあやります、はい、<笑>皆さんこんにちはヤフージャパンの駒田ですヤフートラベルの開発部長をしています皆さんアンプカンファレンスは楽しまれてますかあのこちらは緊張で半分も楽しめてませんけど、はい、ではあの早速やっていきたいんですけれども今日はですねヤフージャパンのアンプとサインドエクスチェンジの取り組みということで少しお話をさせていただきます、えー、私の方からですねヤフージャパン全体の取り組みとあとはヤフートラベルの取り組みについてお話をさせていただいてその後、えー、サインデックスチェンジの技術部分について、えー、大津さんの方からヤフー検索の取り組みについて宗像さんの方からご紹介いただきます、えー、まずはヤフージャパン全体の取り組みですヤフージャパンはですね日本国内向けに事業展開をしていましてウェブ検索というプラットフォーマーである部分とさまざまなサービスを提供しているパブリッシャーであるというこの2つの領域を持っていますで我々はですねこの2つの領域でこれまでアンプに対して取り組みを進めてまいりましたヤフー検索はですね2017年11月からアンプ提供を開始しておりましてサービス側につきましても昨年来よりアンプへの取り組みを進めておりますあそこでサービス側、ヤフートラベルの取り組みについてご紹介いたします。昨年の7月、ヤフージャパンのサービスでは初めてヤフートラベルがアンプに対応いたしました。結果はご覧の通り、えー、コマースサービスとしては非常に嬉しい数値の改善が得られました。サポートいただいた方々、まあ、そしてこのアンプカンファレンスの MC をされている宇都宮さん、本当にありがとうございました。とはいえ、課題があります。パーソナライゼーションです。アンプの配信ドメインはサービスのドメインとは異なりますので、クッキーの操作ができなくなります。まあ、つまり、ログイン情報ですとか、えー、会員サービスの提供ということが、まあ、できなくなるというわけです。コマースサービスで会員,て会員サービスが提供できないということは、すごく致命的な問題なんですね。まあ、それもあって、私たちもサービスのメイン画面に対するアンプの導入を控えている状況ですあとはあの余計なヘッダーがついてくると思いますお客様が見た時にちょっと見栄えが悪いなというような問題もございます、まあ、とはいえ可能であればこの素晴らしい体験をもっと拡大したいともっと導入したいと思っているわけですそこで私たちはこの課題に対して取り組みを開始いたしましたサインドエクスチェンジを使うことでサービスのドメインでアンプを提供することが可能になりますサービスのドメインですからクッキーの操作もできますし会員サービスの提供もできるようになるというわけです私たちはこのサインドエクスチェンジを使って課題を解決しようと思いましたヤフージャパンは今年サインドエクスチェンジへの取り組みを開始いたしましたアンプの時と同様にプラットフォーマー側とパブリッシャー側、この2つの領域、同時での取り組みです。そして今年の2月、ヤフートラベルとグループ会社の一休が、アンプのサインドエクスチェンジ対応をリリースいたしました。えー、と日本国内初だそうです。ちょっとあのアニメーションを見てみましょう。動きますね。はい、トラベルヤフーでアンプが表示されていることがわかると思います。で、Google 検索の方がサインドエクスチェンジの表示を、まあ、リリースしたとアナウンスが確かあったと思いますので、お手持ちの Android の最新版 Chrome で、えー、検索をしてみてください。
と,とはいえなんですけども、今日ちょっと調子が悪いらしくてですね、<笑>あの品川プリンスホテルはちょっと表示できないと、あと品川プリンスホテル N タワーだったらサインデックスチェンジ行けますよという話がありますので、まあ、そっちの方で検索をしていただければと思います。でえー、私からはちょっと最後になってしまうんですけれども、ヤフージャパンのアンプに取り組んでいるサービスのステータス一覧です、注目すべきはヤフーショッピングが入っているところですね、彼らは非常にあの高い技術力を持ったエンジニアを抱えてますので、まあ、ここがアンプとサインドエクスチェンジのトライアルに興味を持っているというところで、今後、期待かなと思っています。まあ、ご覧の通りユーザーへの素晴らしい体験を求めて、ヤフージャパンのサービスは挑戦をしています。ぜひですね、皆さんと一緒に次の新しい体験を作っていきたいと思っていますので、一緒に頑張りましょう。で続きましてはですね、えー、サインデックスチェンジの技術部分について、大津の方から紹介いただきます。はい。はい、先ほどあの駒田のプレゼンでですね、ヤフートラベルが s e c 対応したと。いいうお話をさせてたただきましたで、えーとまあ、先ほどあのグレこの前のセッショングルックスのセッションで、まあ、あのクラウドフレアさんの,あのサービスの紹介ありましたねボタン一つでセクシー対応になりますと素晴らしい我々あの1ヶ月かけてですねあのシステムを作って、えー、日本最初のセクシーをランチしたというのがちょうど2月の、えー、後半でしたで今回ですねいろいろ試行錯誤があったり技術的な試行錯誤があったわけですけれども、まあ、どういうことに今後、えー、導入していくのに気をつけなければいけないのか我々ちょっとどういうふうな形の今後やっていかなきゃいけないのかっていうので、まああいうサービスではなく自前で SXC の対応するという場合にどういうシステムが必要なのかということのお話をさせていただきます。えー、SXC ですね、サインドエクスチェンジはあの実はアンプだけの、えー、と技術じゃないんですね、えー、もっともっと広い意味での、えー、とウェブの通信を変える、えー、技術です。で大きくですねあのそのユースケース2つに分かれます。1つがあのオンラインで使われること、今回のアンプ s x c っていうのは、えー、とこちら側になります。もう1つがオフラインです。でまずオンラインの本からなんですけれどもどういう形に流れるのかというので、えっと、先ほどよりもうちょっと詳しく、えっと、お話をさせていただきたいと思います、えー、まずあのパブリッシャーですね、えー、先ほどしたヤフートラベルですけれどもそちらの方でですね、えー、クライアントのリクエストとレスポンスを、えー、っとパックします、えー、それをそして署名をして s x c ファイルという形にしてディストリビューターですね我々というとキャッシュサーバーアンプキャッシュサーバーの方に、えー載せますでアンプキャッシュサーバーの方はそ,れその s x c ファイルと別にですねもう一つ、えー、と証明書先ほどあった s x c の証明書と執行情報 OCSP ですね証明書の執行情報を一緒にして、えーまあ、ユーザー側に、えー、取ってもらうという流れになってますでユーザーの端末はどうかといいますとこの2つを受信してまず証明書が本当にえっと、正当なものかどうか、気がないとか、いろいろチェックをして、えー、次に s x c ファイルの中にある、えー、署名を検証して、えー、表示をするというような流れになっています。でこの一メトルになった s x c ファイルとか証明書というものに関しては、えっと、オフラインで端末間同士でやり取りをすると、オフラインでウェブアプリケーションを、えー、とや割り取りするというような役割も、えー、できるようになっております。えー、セクシーの特徴で,特徴ですね、えっと、大きく5つ、えー、お話をさせていただきます。えー、先ほどあの話しましたけれども、どこから、誰からでも入手可能と、ディストリビューターが別に、えっと、いろんなところから、SXC ファイルと証明書のセットさえ取れれば、あどこからでも大丈夫です。そして、えっと、オフラインで、えー、必ずしもそのファイルがあれば、ネットワークに、えー、こう通信できる環境がなくても、えー、SXC が使えるようになります。そして、えっと、これがあのアンプで長年解決したかった問題です。パブリッシャーの URL で表示。で他にもですね、えっと、SXC に、えー、使うための、えっと、いくつかの縛りがあります。一つがあキャッシュ可能であるウェブコンテンツです。当然ですよね、中にプライベートの情報が入っていてはあダメなわけです、えー。パブリックなキャッシュに乗れるといったようなコンテンツがあ、えー、SXC の対象になります。もう一つが短期間。有効でであるとということですこれは普通の HTTPS 通信と違って SXG というのは
ネットワークを使わなくてもオフラインの状態でも使えるような形になりますそうなるので今までの HBS 通信よりもより厳しいセキュリティ情報状態が必要だということで最大1週間になっています1週間以内にまた更新をしていくというサイクルになっていますこういう機能はどういうふうにして実現されているのかその中身をちょっと見てみると分かります SX のファイルの中身のフォーマットは一番上に書いてある通りです一番最初は SXG1B3 というマジックコードが入っていますその次にですねフェールバック URL SXG を検証したときに失敗した場合にオリジンのところにアクセスがいくわけですねでその次が署名データで色が変わっているところが署名されているヘッダーですねここが署名されるわけですで一番最後にコンテンツボディが入ります実際にはそのコンテンツを全部署名するわけじゃなくてそこのダイジェストをヘッダーに入れてヘッダーに署名をするという形になっていますえー、こういうことによって HTTP のリクエストとレスポンスに全体に対して署名が入ったことになります、えー、中間者ですね、まあ、ここで言うとディストリビューターになるんですけれども、えー、コンテンツの中身を改ざんしたりとか成りすましをしたりとかいうようなセキュリティ防止にもなってですね、えー、ユーザーの側に届けることができると、えー、それによってブラウザーはセキュリティ上,セキュリティ上安心して、えー、自分の URL としてあ、えー、出すことができると。いう仕組みになっていますこれはあの我々のシステムの概要です先ほどのえっとものとえっとグレクさんのものとちょっとあのバリエーション違いますけれどもえっと大きくですね4つのコンポーネントが成り立っています HTTPS プロキシー SXG ルーターでアンプパッケージャーとアンプサーバーアンプのコンテンツを提供しているサーバーですねこちらの方は、えっと、SXG 対応前から従来で使っていたサーバーですこの青で書いている3つのコンポーネントについて説明させていただきます HTTPS プロキシーですねこれはあの今回のトラベルだけではなくて Yahoo サービスの、えー、多,く多くをです、ね、集約しているものですインターネットからの HTTPS 通信を、えっと、全て集端するような形ですでオプションですけれども、えっと、キャッシュの機能を持っていますそして内部のサービスへの振り分けを行います。今回、えー、Yahoo トラベル向けのアンプのリクエストとそれ以外のものというのをこの HPS プレクシーで振り分けています。次に SXG ルーターですね。えー、これはですね、えー、とクローラーが、えー、とコンテンツを取りに来るんですけれども、そのボットにですね、えー、我々のサイトが SXG 対応であることを知らせる、えー、ヘッダーを返します。具体的にはバリーアンプキャッシュトランスフォームというヘッダーを返すことによって、えー、ボットの方はですね、えー、あここのサイトは SXG 対応してるんだじゃあ次からは SXG を取りに行こうというような流れになりますそして、えー、今度来る、えー、SXG、えー、クローラーのボットはですね、えー、アンプキャッシュトランスフォームのヘッダーを,のをリクエストにつけて、えーえー、取りに来ますそしたらあこの SXG ルーターの方はアンプパッケージャーの方にリクエストを流しますそうでなければ通常のユーザーと同じようにアンプサーバーの方に投げてアンプコンテンツを提供するという流れになっていますあとこれ以外にですねログとか監視とかいろいろシステム周りのマネージメントをするような機能も持たせていますその次がアンプパッケージャーですこれはあの、えー、と昨日も紹介ありましたけれども、えー、GitHub 上で、えー、とアンプ、えー、プロジェクトからですね OSS で、えー、提供されているソフトウェアですこれはアンプコンテンツから SXG を生成して提供する機能を持っています。で、えー、と単に変換するのではなくて、えー、アンプ最適化、トランスフォームという、えー、を行います。これはあのこれまで従来ですね、SXG 前ですとアンプのキャッシュサーバーの上でいろいろ Google のアップ、えー、の最適化が行われてたんですけれども、今回、えー、とコンテンツに署名をしてしまうということで改変することがもうできません。ですので、このアンプパッケージャー内で、えー、と最適化を行って SXG としてキャッシュサーバーに渡すということが必要になってきたわけです。でもう一つがですね、えっと、証明書と執行情報 OCSP をまとめたデータを生成して提供する機能があります。これができてないと、えっと、証明書が、えっと、古い証明書だったりと証明書の更新ができなかったりとかあ本当にバリットなものかというのの、えー、執行情報を、えー、出すことができなくなります。でえっと、もう一つがですね先ほどありましたようにパブリックキャッシュに適さない
ヘッダーとかチェックして削除しますでもしダメな場合にはあエラーとかあーいうふうに形で、えー、行いますで今回中心となっているのが SXC の証明書です、えー、っと SXC の証明書がないと SXC の、えー、っとサービスはできませんこれは通常の HTTPS の ECC 証明書大暗号方式の証明書に SXC の拡張が一つついたものでございますでこの拡張がついていることによって普通のウェブサーバーと SXC っていうのを明確に分けるような形になってますこれを普通のウェブサーバーに使うことは禁止されております現在デジサート社のみ発行しているものでございますで来月からですね結構縛りがきつくなりまして証明書の有効期限が90日に制限される予定ですそしてその発行先を DNS の登録しておかなければいけなくなりました DNS の CA レコードの登録が必須化される予定です我々があの、えー、と導入してきたシステムなんですけれども結構いろいろ学びがありましたここであの振り返りの方を、えー、といくつか挙げさせていただきます良、えー、かったことはですねあの既存インフラの、えー、影響を最小限にして導入が可能でした先ほどもありましたようにアンプコンテンツの方はほぼ、えー、変更がありません間に差し込むだけで、えー、SXC の対応ができましたそして従来ですねクローラーからのボットです、えー、ボットからのクロールがあの中心でしたのでユーザーへ直接、えー、影響を与えるようなことは気にせずに導入が可能でしたただしあの問題としてですねやっぱり事前にステージング環境やテスト環境での、ねえー、テストがです、ね、限定的だったことがあります、えー、本当にボットはクロール来るのだろうか SXG を取りに来るだろうかアンプは本当にです、ね、キャッシュされて SXG として提供されるだろうか、えー、こういったところはです、ねえっと、リリース後じゃないとわからないですねインターネットにさらしてみないとわからないような状況です、えー、これはやっぱり最初に導入するとしては非常に不安ですよねですのであのクローラーのシミュレーターだったりとか SXC のバリデーターだったりとか事前に検証できるツール類というのはもうちょっと充実してほしいなとアンプチームには要望したいと思っております、えー、次ですね導入に関する注意事項です一つだけです本当にアンプコンテンツの中身をちゃんと把握してくださいこれは本当にキャッシュ可能なコンテンツか個人情報とかですねセキュリティ情報が入っていないか具体的に言うとキャッシュコントロールプライベートとかですねセットクッキーなどしているようなコンテンツはダメです外部に漏れていけないようなヘッダーとかですね、えー、含まれていないか十分注意した上で、えー、行いましょうこれはですね SXG ファイルというのは外部に保存されるものですいくら有効期限が切れても、えー、とそのまま残されて自動的に消えることはありませんセキュリティ事故には本当に気をつけた方が、えー、必要がありますでもう一つですね、えっと、いくつかあ注意事項としましては、セイムオリジンになったことでエラーになってしまうようなコンテンツがあります。アンプアイフレームですね。我々としてはちょっとクロスオリジンで使ってたのが、そのままセイムオリジンになってエラーになってしまったりとか、あとリダイレクションとかですね、エラーを200番で返すようなことをしていると、なかなかあのクローラーボットとの相性が悪くなって、えー、注意が必要です。最後にですけれども今後の課題という形で、えー、先ほど言いましたように証明書が90日になりますですので、えっと、運用的にですねやっぱり、えっと、サービスが増えてくると、えー、非常に大変です証明書更新をデジ,、えー、デジサートの API と連携して自動化することを現在予定していますそして、えっと、認証局を制限させる、えー、CAA の設定も、えー、進めていますで今後、ですね2、3ヶ月のうちにソフトウェアがあトランスフォーマーとかですねソフトウェアがバージョンアップしていくという宣言がされていますのでそれに向けても、えー、追随していくように今、準備を行っています。でもう1つはですね Android 端末と iOS 端末この2つがアクセスくるんですけども、えー、現在サポートしているのは Android だけです、えー、未サポートの端末との併用をどういうふうな形にしていくのかというのがこれからの検討事項です。そして、えっと、直接アクセスが来るものに対してインフラをどう、えー、で増強していくのかといったことも考える必要があります、えー、最後にですね、えー、次にレポートの機能とかですねバンドルの機能が入ってくる予定です、えー、こういったものに対する準備も必要だというふうに考えております次はあのヤフー検索の対応について宗像より説明させていただきますはい、えー、ではここからはヤフー検索の取り組みということでヤフー検索フロントエンドチームの宗像から発表させていただきますまず最初にヤフー検索のアンプ対応についてです
ヤフー検索では2017年11月からアンプ対応を開始しましたテンブルリンクスいわゆるオーガニックの検索結果とそれに紐づくリッチリザウトの一部でアンプ対応サイトの表示を行っていますアンプ対応サイトにはおなじみのアンプアイコンが表示されヤフー検索オリジナルのアンプビュアが実装されています次に先ほど説明にあったサインドエクスチェンジについてヤフー検索上でこのサインドエクスチェンジがどのように動作するのか高速表示のためのリソース先読みについても注目しながらお話ししたいと思いますヤフー検索上でサインドエクスチェンジの動作は現在実施中のデベロッパープレビューで確認することができますこちらにデベロッパープレビューにアクセスするための特別な URL を用意しましたので対応端末をお持ちの方はぜひお試しくださいえー、今日は、えー、せっかくの機会ですので先ほどアニメーションでお見せしたところを実際にこのデベロッパープレビューでデモとして動かしてみたいと思いますはい、えー、では左側のスクリーンにご注目くださいえー、デベロッパープレビューの検索窓からサインドエクスチェンジ対応サイトを検索します、えー、ここでは先ほどのですね、えー、品川プリンスホテルの N タワーを検索したいと思いますはい、えー、こちらですね、えー、品川プリンスホテル N タワーはい打ってないですかはい、えー、失礼しましたこちらですね、えー、品川プリンスホテル N タワー、えー、とこちらがサインドエクスチェンジ対応サイトに、えー、なっています、えー、サインドエクスチェンジ対応サイトにはアンプアイコンに加えて、えー、SXG、えー、こちらの表示が追加されています、はい、では実際に、えー、クリックして遷移してみたいと思いますえー、非常に高速にページが表示されたのがわかると思います、えー、URL、こちらですね、えー、と検索結果の SearchYahooCOJP ではなく、えー、オリジンであるトラベル YahooCOJP の URL が表示されているのがわかるかと思います、はいえー、ちょっと見えにくかった方もいらっしゃると思うので、えー、ぜひお手元の端末でもえご覧いただけたらと思います、はいえー、ではスライドに戻ってこのサインドエクスチェンジの動作をもう少し細かく見ていきたいと思います、えー、まずこちらのシーケンス図をご覧ください、えー、サインドエクスチェンジ対応サイトを含む検索結果の表示アンプキャッシュに対してサインドエクスチェンジファイルの先読みそして関連するサブリソースの先読みそして当該サイトへの遷移までの流れを簡単に示したものになりますえー、では実際にこの流れに対応する Chrome のデベロッパーツールのスクリーンショットを用意しましたので、えー、実際に見ていきたいと思います、はいえー、こちらが先ほどのデベロッパーツールの、えー、検索結果画面になりますこの場合ですねこの Yahoo トラベルのサイトがサインドエクスチェンジ対応サイトになっていますこの時アンプキャッシュに対してサインドエクスチェンジファイルの先読み処理が実行されるのですがこれにはリンクタグのプリフェッチ機能が利用されていますえー、こちらが実際の HTML になります A タグの HREF に指定されたアンプキャッシュの URL がリンクタグの HREF にも指定されているのがわかると思いますこの時の通信を見てみます、えー、プリフェッチのリクエストに対してアンプキャッシュがサインドエクスチェンジのレスポンスを返しているのがわかります次にバリデートされたサインドエクスチェンジファイルから署名済みのアンプドキュメントを取得します署名済みのオリジンであるトラベルヤフー COJP として認識され、from サインドエクスチェンジという表示も確認できます。えー、この時のレスポンスヘッダーとして、クリティカルリソースとなるサブリソースが指定されており、この,この指定に従ってブラウザはサブリソースの先読みを実行します。実際にいくつかの JavaScript ファイルが読み込まれているのが確認できると思います。えー、これでサインドエクスチェンジ表示前の準備はすべて整ったことになります。実際にサイトへリンクをクリックし遷移した画面です
サインドエクスチェンジファイルがブラウザキャッシュから読み込まれサインドオリジンとしてハンプドキュメントを取得サブリソースがブラウザキャッシュから読み込まれているのがわかると思います、えー、このようにサインドエクスチェンジの表示はブラウザの既存機能を利用した非常にシンプルな方法でリソースの先読みを行って高速な表示を実現しています以上ヤフー検索の取り組みということで紹介させていただきました、えー、最後にですね私たちヤフージャパンはユーザーファーストを掲げ最高の課題解決ができるサービスを目指していますそのためにアンプやサインドエクスチェンジなどの最新技術の取り込みをこれからも積極的に続けていきたいと思っています以上となりますありがとうございました非常に技術情報が多くあの教材として今後もずっと使えそうなそんないい内容でした。It was amazing talk.、Um, I was really impressed. Yeah, absolutely incredible.、Uh, those slides had so much、um, great information and、right. great graphics. Yep. えー、なのでつ、えー、と今ここからここから、えー、とコーヒーブレイク、えー、休憩に入りますそして、えー、次はです、ね、30分後4時半から再開しますので、えー、ぜひともそれまでに戻ってきていただきたいですし最後の休憩になるので、えー、ぜひともです、ねえー、チュートリアルルームやブースを使っていろんな人と話していただけたらなというふうに思います。Yep, and we just learned so much about signed exchange, so much about email. So please take the opportunity at this last break to go meet with them at the booths and the tutorials、um, and have that last bit of coffee and come back here at 4 30 30 for the last bit of AmpComp 2019. Thank you. Yeah, see you soon.
from break, everyone. Glad to see so many faces still here and excited. It is this bittersweet moment where we realize that we've had so many fantastic talks, and the fact that we've had so many fantastic talks means we're starting to come to the end. The great news is we have three more still lined up for you, and I'm so excited to introduce our next one. All the way from Milan, Italy, we're going to have Kristen and Fabio, and they're going to be talking about how they modernize their AMP pages by turning their, e they modernize their pages by turning them into AMP. So please join me in a round of applause as we welcome them to the stage. Great audience. I'm sure you enjoyed the coffee break. Uh, Unfortunately, the only uh, word we know in Japanese is arigato, so I hope you, with the transcript and the translation in real time, you'll be able to enjoy the talk uh, anyway. So, uh, my name is Fabio Zecchini, I'm CTO and co-founder of Musement. Uh, here with me on the stage, uh, Christian, our so uh, front-end software architect Hello in everyone. Musement. Okay, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. By the way, probably we are the only European base <laughs> founded the company presenting on the stage. Uh, and uh, I think it's interesting, not just because we are sharing with all of you how we implemented Vue uh, MP pages on our platform, but also because we had a great business impact uh, on our company using this kind of uh, technology. Let me just give you a bit of a view uh, on Musement. Musement was founded uh, six years ago. Uh, the initial idea was to create a one-stop shop uh, uh, website, e-commerce, uh, to buy a museum ticket uh, and art exhibition all around the world. Uh, then we launched uh, in TechCrunch New York, uh, 1st of May 2013, uh, so we are almost uh, uh, celebrating this sixth uh, uh, years old. And, and then when we come back, we fundraising uh, a couple of million and we start uh, the company. Uh, make a long story short, we are now 160 person in the company, 20 from 25 different nationalities. Our quarter is based in Milan, but we already have offices in Berlin, um, Barcelona, uh, London, New York, uh, San Francisco, Dubai, etc. Uh, right now we are not selling just uh, cultural events, but uh, we are covering many different verticals. For example, uh, sport exhibition, uh, food and wine experiences, uh, um, wellness, uh, nightlife, uh, etc. We have been acquired last year, September, uh, by the TUI Group, uh, the most important, the most largest uh, uh, travel tour operator in the world, uh, because they are very focused on the offline business uh, and they are, you know, uh, acquire us uh, to recreate all the digital touch points uh, within the company. So right now, uh, within the group, we are more than 70,000 employees uh, covering uh, uh, with an inventory catalog of more 150,000 different products, uh, covering more than 500 uh, cities in the world, and we have approximately 21 million customers per year. Since the very beginning, Amusement uh, has been a really data-driven company. This means that every decision we took on our company was uh, uh, based on data and insight uh, fr from, our, from our BI team, but also from different uh, uh, business units of the company. So we received an input from the marketing team uh, where uh, we had an issue a couple of years ago. Um, and the issue was about a specific device channel. It was mobile. Keep in mind that 70% uh, of our revenues and traffic uh, was coming uh, directly from uh, Google Ads campaign. Uh, so we've been able to track uh, every single touch point on our, on our customer journey. And we identify a gap uh, just for the mobile devices uh, uh, visits. So, Receiving this alert from the, from the marketing team, we decided to tackle this kind of issue. And we first, uh, 
decide uh, which kind of goal we want to achieve. First one was, uh, okay, of course, make it easier and faster for our customer uh, navigate uh, on our web page uh, and decide between different uh, events and activities. Uh, we also wanted to uh, improve our click-through rate and conversion rate, of course, because of the business impact we have in this kind of uh, KPIs. But at the same time, we also wanted to uh, improve our, our ROI, our return of investment, uh, and margin per sales. So, first time I heard about AMP um, pages was uh, back in the day uh, during a Chrome Dev Summit conference in San Francisco three years ago. Um, in that moment, uh, AMP pages were mostly being developed for publishers, so it's not, no, it wasn't, uh, we weren't able to replicate our, our platform uh, on, uh, on ARM pages. Uh, but a few years later, so one, is one and a half years ago, we st because of the new uh, deployment with the new integration and the new feature has been uh, uh, updated on the, on the ARM technology, we tried to want we, we decided to take this uh, as a technology to tackle this kind of issue. So with that in mind, uh, we decided, uh, I challenge uh, uh, Christian and his team asking uh, how can we create uh, HAM pages on our platform. And now I'll leave uh, Christian uh, explain how we did it. Yeah. Hello, everyone. It is uh, a pleasure for me to be here in Tokyo. You have an amazing city. It's, uh, it's something that never ends when uh, you, look at, you uh, look at it from, uh, from the top. So congratulations. OK, so the first AMP release. So um, the first uh, AMP we released has a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, things to consider because uh, he made, Fabio made uh, the challenge and uh, we accepted it. In amusement, uh, once a week, we are lucky. We are a lucky development team. Mm -hmm. So we have a whole day to research, to spend time making experiments, to find new solutions. And uh, we call it Tech Friday. So we don't have to publish anything in production. We don't develop to the product itself, but it's just research. And in that context, I started to think on the right way to uh, make this AMP page prototype. So since we used uh, Vue.js so for our canonical website, Vue.js is a, a popular JavaScript framework like React. Um, and the front-end team is familiar with it. And most important, we wanted to reuse what we already had for the canonical website. The first concern was, can we use Vue.js to generate AMP pages? So is there anything specific for AMP? The answer was no. So we should have created our own. OK, so uh, thus we defined this constraint, OK? So we wanted to use Vue.js. And uh, we decided to share this idea with the creator of the framework, Evan Yu. So in February 2018, we went to the Vue.js conference in Amsterdam another amazing city. And uh, we had the pleasure to stay with Evan in a training uh, day. So besides looking under the hood of Vue.js itself, we also had the chance to, um, to tell him about the idea, um, the idea to generate M pages using the, the framework. In the end, our thoughts were positive despite what we could not have used. So I'm talking about the client-side reactivity, obviously, because uh, we could have used the template engine, the great template engine of Vue.js, and the server-side render module. So the morning after this training day, uh, well, to be honest, 
after an amazing <laughs> night in Amsterdam, you can imagine. <laughs> we started to, to code <laughs> our first amusement AMP page from scratch, okay? So first things first, right? Okay, we started by writing the basic camp HTML. We plug it to the render script, done, easy. And uh, since JavaScript is not allowed in AMP, well, was not allowed because yesterday I have heard AMP script, so, <laughs> but at that time, it was not allowed. We had to remove the Webpack step, so we had to create the client-side bundle. So remove this step, okay? No bundle for client-side. And by removing it, we remove the client-side reactivity, even listeners, data bindings, and so on. Thus, we have a static page, just a static page, with AMP on board. And uh, we can start work, uh, work uh, in, uh, in the framework on this, uh, with this static page, okay? By coding uh, the very first version of uh, our AMP page, we soon had to tackle one of the most common tasks in the front-end development. And uh, I'm talking about reuse components. So our UI building blocks. And uh, the snippet you see on this slide shows the canonical approach uh, with Vue.js. And uh, once you fetch data using uh, the API, you have uh, a list item component in a for loop, and it works on server and client side. So when you navigate between pages uh, in a single page up uh, mode, the navigation and the component is the same. But the client-side canonical approach doesn't work implementing AMP, because uh, on server we can use uh, the view list item component. But we, if we want to hook the user interaction on the client and maybe apply the list item on a load more action, for instance, uh, we have to use mustache templates. So it's another version of the same component. This was the problem. And how we shaped the rendering process. Since, Vue, uh, since we, we use ES6 and Vue.js, we just need Webpack with few loaders. The bubble one is to transpile ES6 to ES5, okay? URL loader is to include fonts using uh, the URL path uh, when you import it uh, um, with, uh, with the syntax, and the view loader customized for SCSS files in order to put compiled style within a style tag in a head, uh, head tag in a page, instead of using uh, the external CSS file, which is an AMP requirement, indeed. We use Express to set page on node, and uh, therefore, we define a couple of routes, here you see, with the view component to render for that specific page, and a set of middleware functions to gather remote data and uh, uh, maybe set cache headers and so on, okay? Indeed, the last middleware function is the most interesting one. It's uh, actually the one which outputs the page using uh, the view server renderer module after injecting all the data in the template context. So we did it in the end. A couple of weeks of work. Everything seems fine. But the showdown has arrived. And we had a branch with uh, all this work with just some fine tuning tasks to do. In Milan, in Italy, the Google team runs an event called Google AMP and Speed Hackathon, just like a, a contest, okay? Which uh, is a, an end-zone workshop uh, where uh, front-end teams uh, coming from various companies try to work on their products uh, to improve the performances with the support of Google team, uh, Google uh, uh, experts, if, uh, if, uh, if needed. So this gave us the chance to close the amusement AMP epic 
and push this work in production that day. Awesome. So this was the result. So, and uh, uh, since it was a context, we won the first prize with this, uh, uh, with this page. The venue page, the attraction page, uh, the page Fabio was talking about. So Fabio, if you want to tell them about the insights of this yeah, page, some absolutely. results. So thank you, Christian. Uh, pretty amazing, right? Uh, especially if you think that everything was starting uh, after a night in Amsterdam. Um, yes, let me just uh, share some insights. So what happens later? We've been able to create, uh, uh, of course, as a, as a startup, you used to work uh, very, very lean. So we just create uh, 15 AMP pages of our top destination attraction page. Uh, and with our marketing team, we've been able to run uh, A-B testing campaign. Result was pretty impressive. I'm going to show you result uh, later. Uh, but on top of that, uh, after a few weeks, uh, we decided to go ahead. Uh, we decided to also implement not just the attraction page, but also the product page, what we call uh, event page. Uh, this is uh, how uh, it looks. Uh, and by the way, one of the major constraints on our side was to, to have feature parity parity between the canonical website and the AMP uh, uh, website, of course. Uh, and then uh, we, the purchasing process, of course, is on the canonical website. So now uh, let me just uh, show a video uh, with the result of this uh, uh, test campaign. Pretty cool, right? Thank you. So here are the, the main takeaway I want to share with you. Uh, so first, uh, um, OK, of course, you can find all this result in a success case story already published at Fink with Google website in different languages. This is the, uh, the English one. Uh, but yes, the main takeaway are the following. So we, we, we've been able to uh, improve the performance and the speed of 70% uh, compared with our canonical website. Uh, in a couple of weeks after the test, we've been able to deploy, because of the technology we use, more than 30,000 different AMP pages uh, across uh, uh, attraction page and product page. And also, the most important thing is about the business. So we've been able to increase 27% uh, uh, our revenue per visit. OK, it's uh, one of our most important KPI, but also 50% uh, higher conversion rate. Uh, on top of that, yes, uh, another thing I want to mention is that uh, we also, from the, from the first weeks, uh, we also start seeing uh, a side effect, so <laughs> a very nice side effect, uh, uh, the fact that uh, we start ranking organically on SEO with these pages uh, very, very fast. Uh, so also our organic traffic start increasing after the launch uh, of uh, AMP pages on our website. So what's next? Uh, 
uh, of course we are still improving our 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 product our arm pages uh, uh, but now we want to go ahead of course a lot of new feature has been released this week uh, we are going to implement for sure arm script uh, we're going to implement payment as soon as it will be ready uh, but yes in the meantime we also start uh, looking at uh, uh, creating a new framework emerging arm and pages and progressive web app. So it was another challenge I asked Christian and, and the team uh, uh, to work on because we want to be ready and we want to be uh, top of technology on our platform because uh, the idea is to provide always our customer the best uh, experience possible. Christian, tell us how it's going. Yeah, sure. Thanks again for the challenge, Fabio. <laughs> <laughs> so Not boring at all. <laughs> no, no, never. So uh, the idea is uh, to create a, web app, a progressive web app using AMP, OK? So you have two options, uh, at least two options, uh, to create uh, this kind of uh, uh, application using AMP. So the first one is uh, to create uh, a full progressive web app in which the AMP website is the progressive web app itself because all the pages are AMP, okay? So, and uh, the second one is uh, to create a progressive uh, web app using AMP pages to warm up the cache for the canonical pages, okay? So this is, uh, um, this is what you can do with the AMP in Service Worker Installer. So, I made a prototype, another one, and this time I've used always Vue.js, but using Nuxt. And uh, Nuxt is uh, the uh, equivalent of uh, uh, Next for React. So Nuxt is uh, for, uh, for Vue.js. It provides a lot of things, um, like um, the uh, zero configuration and uh, Server-side rendering is already, uh, is already working out of the box and so on. So I decided to use this tool. And uh, what you're looking at on the right is a progressive web application. Well, progressive web amp, I call it, because it makes sense in my opinion. And um, it has a service worker. So it's uh, an Acker News Reader client. Why an Acker News Reader? Because there's a website called hmpwa.com, seems like, I, I said it like a, a rap, but it's not rap, it's, it's, a, it's a true website. And I suggest, I suggest you to give, a, to give a look at it, because uh, this website um, lists a bunch of progressive web applications made with different front-end frameworks. And reported score uh, comes from um, Lighthouse Test Run. As you can see, the very, very first quick and dirty shot performs very well. 99 on 100. And to give you an idea uh, of what's inside the PWA in AMP, I can say that it provides, it provides the basic, okay? The basics, AMP boilerplate, the uh, client-side bundle removal, using Nuxt modules a powerful way to extend Nuxt. So another thing that's inside is the head meta tags handlers like canonical and uh, um, AMP HTML uh, links. A convention to use the mustache templates without clashing with the Vue.js template interpolator, the double curly braces. And of course, the Nuke server middleware convention, because you should work with remote data. The news is that we also published this uh, recipe, because it's a recipe. And since it's a recipe, I think I can be the AMP chef. Okay? Therefore, you can give it a try. And uh, if, you, um, if you want to contribute to improve it, yes. Welcome for feedbacks, pull requests, and so on. So thank you very much. Ooh. That's all. Thank you very much. Arigato. Arigato. <laughs>
はいということで非常に面白いセッションだったかと思います、えー、何点か気になる、えー、面白い使い方をしているかなと思いますやっぱりあのサーバーサイドレンダリングってこのアンプのケースだけじゃなくても、えー、いろいろなあパフォーマンス改善の文脈で今みんなが注目している技術かなというふうに思いますやっぱり、えー、FC FMP ファーストミーニングフルペイントとかスピードインデックスとかそういったものを改善するためにフロントエンドでやっている JavaScript をなるべく減らしてサーバーサイドで HTML を生成してそれを直にブラウザにこうレンダリングさせるっていう方が早いよねっていう、まあ、そういった文脈があったりするんですけど、まあ、それを今回はこちらはアンプでやられたという話なので、まあ、非常にいい例かなというふうに思いますしあともう一個やっぱり、あのーえー、見てて、あのー、感心したのがやっぱりアンプを使いながらもう PWA って当たり前だよねっていうようなそんな世界観が見れたのでやっぱりアンプと PWA なんか一番最初はなんかどっちがどっちなのみたいなあの話もなんかこうちょっと混乱するようなテーマもあったかと思うんですけど、えー、そうじゃなくてやっぱりアンプ、えー、を使って PWA も簡単に作れるというところも、えー、きれいに証明できたんじゃないかなというふうに思います。えー、ということでですね次は、えー、また CMS の話です。そして CMS も CMS で、えー、ワードプレスの話です、えー、ここの中で、えー、ワードプレス使ってる人どのくらいいらっしゃいますでしょうか、so、who here uses WordPress? Right now.、Uh, 40%, 50%? You better be excited for the next session.、えー、ということで、えー、ワードプレス、えー、毎回毎回、えー、Google IO でも、えー、Chrome Dev Summit でも、Amp Conf でも、えー、いろいろなタイミングでワ、えードプレスのアップデートを、えーえーえー、我々からあのこういったイベントを通じて、えー、していますが、その最新情報っていうのを、えー、お伝えするような形になるかと思います。All right, then let's move on to the next session. Building AMP for Sites the WordPress way. Please welcome Alberto and Jeannie from Google. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Yeah. So, this has been an awesome year for the AMP project. And one of the areas that we have made a lot of progress has been on building AMP content creation in the WordPress platform. Uh, what is this? this is, I need this.、Um, as you know,、uh, WordPress is a content management system. And what that means is that it is a software platform that adds layers of abstraction on top of the web to facilitate the creation, management, and publishing of content.、Okay? Uh, WordPress is certainly one of the biggest CMS players out there. And today, about a third of the web is powered by WordPress sites. Now, AMP first content creation in WordPress falls into a spectrum where, on one hand, we have a fully manual process where we, as developers, do all the work. And on the other hand, we have a fully automatic process where the platform, with a combination of core and extensions, does all the work for us. Now, the reality of what is possible today is a balance point somewhere in that spectrum where A lot of the process can be automatically generated, and there is still part of the process that requires developer intervention. Now, the exact location of that point depends on the status of the ecosystem with respect to AMP compatibility. And the, as the ecosystem evolves with time, that balance point is going to move further and further to maximizing automation and minimizing developer intervention. Now, A key enabling technology influencing the compatibility status of the WordPress ecosystem is the official AMP plugin for WordPress. The official AMP plugin for WordPress is an extension to the WordPress platform that plays three main roles. It automates large parts of the process of generating AMP content on the platform, it provides developer tooling and guidance for Helping developers on the parts that they have to do themselves. And it also acts as a monitor and enforcer as well as sites evolve to maintain AMP compatibility. Now, on the automation part of the equation, the plugin provides four main areas of functionality. The first one is integrating the AMP specification into the plugin.、Uh, Logic so that it becomes effectively a WordPress centric AMP validator. 
Okay? And that allows it to identify errors and contextualize them. In WordPress, content can be generated in different ways. You have widgets, embeds, blocks, um, and you name it. The, the WordPress plugin hooks its functionality into these standards mechanisms in which content is created in WordPress and generates incompatible components instead, whenever possible. Now, there are parts of the code that WordPress generates that could be generated also in terms of AMP compatible components, but cannot be done during template rendering. For these cases, what the plugin does is it takes the output of the template rendering phase, puts it into an output buffer, it parses it into a DOM document, and then applies a lot of, um, sorry, I <laughs> had to click, uh, applies a set of um, processing and conversion tasks. At the end of this functionality, the end result is a piece of AMP content that may or may not be um, compatible, um, AMP valid. Uh, depending on that outcome, then the plugin triggers one of several serving strategies that aim at minimizing the probability that AMP um, invalid content is going to be served. Now, this um, functionality has to do with the assistant generation part, and we don't have to worry about it. Instead, we have to focus our attention on the workflow for generating, for creating unfair experiences in WordPress. In this part, this is the part related to developer intervention. Uh, the first aspect that we need to understand is how the plugin integrates with the WordPress template system. In WordPress, the look and feel of sites is defined by a collection of templates that, when combined together, form what is usually called the theme of the site. The plugin can be configured to interact with the underlying theme of a site in three different ways. In native mode, the AMP plugin effectively makes AMP the framework of your WordPress site. It reuses the underlying theme, templates, of, and styles of your site, and renders only AMP responses. That means that your site is AMP first, uh, AMP first, and the canonical URL is also your AMP URL. Um, there may be cases in which you cannot make all the content of your site incompatible at once for all your content types. In those cases, you have the option of opting out of AMP for certain parts of your site, or you can take advantage of the plugin transitional mode. In transitional mode, the plugin also reuses the underlying templates of your theme, but in this case, it, it renders both an AMP version of the content and a non-AMP version of the content. And you, as the developer, make the decision of what goes in one or the other. Notice that this mode is called transitional because it's intended and providing you with a migration path that allows you to progressively expand the incompatibility of your site until you get to a point in which everything is incompatible and then you can switch to an unfair strategy. In this case, for example, the sites are exactly the same except for the text-to-speech widget that we had on the non amp version that we were not able to fully convert, and we want to have it because it's an accessibility feature that we want to provide to our users. Uh, still, there, are, there may be cases, um, the, both the native and the transitional mode, depending on the theme that you are using, require some developer work in order to make it fully incompatible. There may be cases in which you want to provide AMP experiences to at least some content in your site, but you don't have the resources to invest on the development required for the native or the transitional mode at this moment. In these cases, you can take advantage of the plugin reader mode. In reader mode, the plugin generates um, it doesn't the, the plugin generates content using separate templates that are simple, they are liked, they are neat, but may not match the design of your underlying theme. Uh, this mode is useful to provide basic AMP experiences, but we actually don't recommend it because it's restrictive. And given that as time passes, moving to a transitional or native uh, mode is getting easier and easier, there is no reason to stay in this mode for long. But it's an option that is provided. We understand 
with this, how to interact, what, how the plugin interacts with the template system of your site, with the theme. The next step is to understand the development workflow. So how do we go to making sites incompatible in WordPress? Uh, the first step is identifying any validation errors that your site may have. What is, are there problems that my site has? The second part is contextualizing those errors. What are those errors coming from? Was it a plugin? Was it a theme? Was the core platform? It's very important to know so that we can go and deal with them. And finally, we need to amplify the offending markup elements in our site so that the validation errors can be eliminated without compromising the functionality or the visual parity of your site, the visual functionality of your site. This uh, screenshot here gives you a glimpse of how content creation in WordPress looks nowadays. The WordPress editor is a block-based editor, which means that everybody, everything is a block. The, block. the blue rectangle that you see on the screen is a custom HTML block, and in there, we have put a piece of content that is not valid. When we try to update this content, the plugin identifies the error and immediately flags it in context, telling us that there is something wrong with the content that you just created. And it also offers us information on the top, telling us that we need to investigate the issue. In this particular case, it's very easy to see the error at the context, because we created it and we have it in front of us. But in WordPress, as I mentioned before, content can be created in many different ways. And contextualizing errors can be a difficult task. Luckily, the plugin does all the work for us. What the plugin does, it, as I mentioned, it hooks itself into the standard content creation mechanism of WordPress. And as the markup is generated, it annotates it with HTML comments. At the moment that a validation error is encountered during the validation process, the plugin walks back the DOM tree until, using the HTML comments, it can determine the particular source of the error and some contextual information for that particular problem. It then creates a validation error object containing the context information and then stores it in, database, in the database to expose it to the user, as we will see in a minute. Once the plugin has identified and contextualized the errors, the, sec the next part is what do we do with them? The plugin can be configured in two different ways to handle the errors. You can configure it to do automatic sanitization, which means that the plugin is going to remove the offending markup from your site. This doesn't mean that the plugin is fixing the error. It's just removing the offending markup so that the, pa the page remains valid. We still need to make sure that the functionality or the visual parity is there. Or you can configure the plugin to do manual sanitization, which means uh, please, you tell the plugin, keep the offending code, because I don't have a solution for it right now, and the functionality that it implements is important for my site, like the speech, text-to-speech widget that we saw. The ultimate fate of a validation error, or the markup that is generating, the creating a, a, a validation error, is your jurisdiction. As a developer, you decide what to do. You can either accept the plugin action, which basically you are telling the plugin, it's OK, you can take that markup away because I don't need it. It's not essential for my site. Or, no worry, I have an AMP compatible solution for it. Let's get going. Or you can say, oof, no, please don't remove that offending markup because I don't have a solution right now and I need it in my site, so let's not have AMP at this moment. Uh, the plugin puts all these capabilities at the fingertips of developers via a compatibility tool that is accessible in the admin screen of your site. I'm not going to, right now, go into the details of the, the compatibility tool too much, but it gives you all the details of each validation error, what is the status respect to the plugin, the user action, it was accepted, or it was rejected. It also tells you the source of each error. Was a theme? Was a plugin? Which plugin is injecting that piece of markup that is causing a problem? 
And what, what is the error type? It's a CSS, CSS error, it's an HTML error, JavaScript, and so on. And then you can interact with the errors directly with this UI. You can, as a user, you, as a developer, you can decide what to do with the errors there. Up to here, we have a very good idea of the capabilities of the plugin. Now let's put everything together, going over a simple but real-world example of how to make a theme uncompatible. Depending on the characteristics of your theme, the amount of work that requires to achieve this may vary. But although this example is not too complex, it gives you a very good idea of the workflow that you have to follow to make your theme uncompatible. The starting point is a baseline theme. It's a theme that we have tested the functionality that we want. And it's important that it has functional fallbacks so that it works properly when JavaScript is disabled by the browser. So we are starting from a good place. This thing in particular is the 2013 core theme. It's a classic simple WordPress theme with a side identity section. You have a search box. You have a hamburger menu when you are in, in you know, this certain form factors. You have images. You have galleries, YouTube embeds, um, widgets. It's a typical thing that you have in WordPress content. The first step is we install and activate the plugin. We go to the admin screen, we go to the settings. I'm going to configure it in transitional mode because I want to progressively move to AMP first. I'm going to keep the, the errors there to, to see how they behave. And then I'm going to save the changes. At the moment that I save the change, the plugin immediately notifies me that it has identified some issues in my site, and I have to look at it. So the next step, then, I have to go and see what's going on. The way that we do this is that we go and pick one of the posts. Um, we, we, because we are in transitional mode, this is the non AMP version. We can access the AMP version from the admin screen. We say view AMP version. Immediately, the plugin tells us this is not valid AMP. So we want to go to the compatibility tool to see what's going on. At this point, we see, wow, we have eight errors. <coughs> and here we can see that the plugin is telling us that AMP is disabled for the particular post because you don't have valid AMP. I'm going to give you a quick summary of the errors that are here so we don't you know, waste too much time. But if you concentrate on the sources and type columns to the right of the first window, you can see that there are two CSS errors that are introduced by the theme. And these are related to viewport add rules that in this case are easy to deal with because they are not needed and we can wipe them out. Then we have the following four errors are JavaScript errors that are attributed to the core platform, but are actually triggered because the plugin is using certain functionality that has dependencies that the core platform injects into the theme, into the markup. So we, we have that information there. And the end, then we have two JavaScript errors that are actually triggered by JavaScript files that the theme uh, integrated. So this is probably the most important, because that is that the theme developer put the functionality that they want there. So one, OK, now we have a good idea what's happening. The next step, then, is we are going to isolate the errors to see how they affect my site. The way to do this is that you go and you accept all the errors, causing the plugin to remove all the offending markup. And then you can see how it changed. And now we are going to use the preview capability to see how it's behaving. You can see that in the admin bar, the plugin made the page valid. Now we have the same. Visually, it looks pretty much the same. Uh, the search box works, so that's good. Now let's go to device mode and see, make sure that everything works. The search box still works, so that's not a problem. Oh, but this is not working. So this is telling me that one of the markup invalid elements that we remove, the plugin removed actually had the functionality, functionality that implemented the hamburger menu. So the next step then is we need to go and fix the errors. In this particular case, the things that we need to do are, first, let's get rid of the add rules, the viewport add rules that are not needed. Oops, I need to, to click this one. I know where that thing is because I saw the line, so I'm going to remove them. 
Uh, and then I'm going to go to the functions PHP file. I'm going to create a function that tells me if I am rendering an AMP response or not. It's called 2013 is AMP endpoint. And I'm going to use it to grab it, to grab around the pieces of code that are injected in the JavaScript files in the theme. And I'm going to prevent that from happening if I am rendering an AMP response. Okay, that's that code that I. And finally, we are going to solve the hamburger menu problem by telling the plugin that this theme supports AMP. We use the AMP theme support. We pass the AMP parameter. This is a, a standard function in, in WordPress. And then the next parameter, the pair equals true, tells the plugin that this theme is operating in transitional mode. And then we use the nav menu toggle parameter to pass information to the plugin that is associated with the markup that contains the navigation menu. And what this means is that most themes like, that, like this in WordPress has some kind of implementation that handles the hamburger menu as we saw. And we noticed that the implementations are very similar. So what we did is we put functionality into the plugin to implement the same functionality in terms of uncompatible uncompati components using unbind, and then we just tell the plugin, this is the piece of the navigation menu that I want you to deal with, and the plugin automatically does it for us. So these are the fixes. The next step then is see if these things work. <laughs> okay, so we go, we do the recheck, and fingers crossed, now it works. So all the errors are gone. Now I have to verify that the functionality is actually restored, so everything looks fine. Trust me, I check the other functionality, and then I'm going to, you know, I have a valid AMP, this is good. Go to device mode, and the hamburger menu is working. So at this point, I solve all the errors for this post. So the non AMP version and the AMP version are identical. So I don't have a reason to have two versions of the code. So the next step and final step is graduating this theme to AMP first. Big day for the 2013. And this is as simple as going to the AMP theme support function that we introduced and changing pair from true to false. And the, at that moment, you have an AMP first site. So with this, give you a very good sense of how to use the plugin. And I would like to invite Jenny to give us a taste of how the plugin has been used in the wild. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenny from the online partnership group here in Google. Our team works with publishers and help them grow their business sustainably. And I've been with the team with a little bit over four years now, and I realize how dynamic and competitive the publishing industry is. Publishers are constantly challenged to upgrade their offerings to win their users. And when it comes to winning your users, what are the one thing that you should avoid? So we ask your, publish we ask your user and we asked them about one thing that they, they disliked the most when browsing your website. And coming from the ad business, I always thought that it will be ads. But majority of your users fought for slow website. In fact, we are not alone, and there's a lot of study that suggests a correlation between speed and bounce rate. The longer you make your user wait, the higher the bounce rate will be. Now, while it's really imperative that speed should be the number one priority when it comes to upgrading your website, after working with publishers, I realized that not everybody are as lucky as you guys. Not everybody have the technical capability or bandwidth or able to justify the technical bandwidth to upgrade their website, Hardtune way, and meet the needs of their users. And this is the gap that I wish to fill, and this is why we built the AMP plugin. Our goal is to democratize speed and making sure that speed is accessible to all WordPress users. And we're really happy to see success story from uh, early adopters. And today, I would like to do two things. I would like to share some of stories of publishers who upgrade their user experiences with using our plugin. And not only that, I would, most importantly, I would like to highlight work from ecosystem player like you that bring this, um, this success a reality. So first thing first, I would like to share a story about Times of India. Of course, you know them as one of the largest publishers in India reaching over 400 million unique visitors. And they have a blog website they made of WordPress, and they decided to test full AMP experiences on their blog. And of course, when it comes to converting their page to legacy code, there's always an expected challenges in which they have to face CSS constraint, and they have to find a workaround for third-party JavaScript. In this, they leverage our plugin to assist them on the development, and they did it. 
they managed to reach 59% improvement in loading speed. And not only that, Mr. Rudra Kasuri, who unfortunately cannot join us today, actually shared that they see an uplift in page view within the first week of implementation. In fact, if you guys would like to see the native mode in action, I really recommend guys to try to open Times of India block. The whole block is actually empowered by AM. And next one, I would like to share a story about Java Post. They are one of reputable names in Indonesia, and they started their business in print since 1949. Only recently, in 2017, they decided to go digital and launch javapost.com. Soon, they realized that speed, web, and web performance are cru crucial to win their users. And because they would like to test M, they decided, after several considerations, to test on the transitional mode. And why transitional mode? Because they want to have an identical copy of the M and the non-M version, so that they can do an apple-to-apple -apple comparison in terms of their KPI achievement. And I'm really happy to say that the M version has 10 times lighter page, and not only that, they reported a higher revenue per ad impression by 38%. So I'm really happy for them, and we are right now in the process of thinking about moving to the native M. And so we have seen an example of native M in Times of India. We saw an example of transitional mode in Java Post, and I would like to share an example of reader mode. Meet HelloSehat.com. They are actually one of the largest healthcare publisher in Indonesia. They have about 13, 30 million unique visitors monthly. And their goal is to provide quality healthcare content to Indonesian users. And this is why for them, user experience is really important. And they're interested with M because M are able to provide them with fast and smooth loading content experiences for their user. And I'm really happy to say, even with reader, reader mode, they are able to see that users spending longer time on the M pages versus the non-M pages, almost three times. So we are really happy to see these successes, and we really want to scale this. Our vision is a WordPress ecosystem where fast websites are everywhere, and M is used as the key enabling component. And with that, we can't do it alone. We really need you. We need ecosystem players like you to take part and democratize the speed. And today, I would like to celebrate great contribution from three ecosystem player that has bring this vision a reality. First thing first, meet XWP. Of course, you guys know them as a WordPress development agency. But what you guys don't know is that they're not only contributing in commercial projects, they also contribute a lot in the ecosystem project. So I would like to give a shout out um, to Ryan. Can you stand up? <laughs> and of course, Mina. <laughs> So Ryan and Mina, and of course, friends from XWP, has contributed a lot to our plugin. Since 2017, we've been collaborating with XWP to bring the latest development of M into our plugin. And I'm really excited, and I really hope that more and more ecosystem players like you will also join us. And not only that, of course, as an agency, they also build solutions for their client. And they've been leveraging our plugin to upgrade their offering for reputable names such as Heavy.com and most recently, Nova Entertainment from Australia. And giving an example for Heavy.com, they utilize the plugin and they are able to reduce the first pane loading time from 8 seconds to less than 3 seconds in slow 3G. If you'd like to hear more about this, um, you can visit XWP website where they publish this case study. And next, I would like to introduce Setka, uh, which is a technique Tech, tech, technology company behind the Setka Editor plugin. And in case you're not so familiar, Setka Editor plugin is what you see, what you get kind of pitch builder that makes it easier for brands and publishers to build interactive and beautiful content without having to code at all. And they decided that they want their user to not only build beautiful content, but also have their content load really fast. This is why Setka Editor decided to integrate Setka Editor plugin with the AMP plugin. And they tasted this solution to one of their clients, which is Realtime Editor, who happened to choose the transitional mode. And as you can see here, the AMP version look equally beautiful, if not identical, but they look so much faster, not only on the mobile website, but also on the desktop website. And moving on, I'm excited to give a kudos to WP Engine, who happened to join us as well. Stefan and Corey, can you wave? <laughs> can we give a round of applause to Stefan and Corey? <laughs> so WP Engine is a hosting provider, but they also build Genesis Framework. And for those of you who are not familiar, 
Genesis Framework is a popular team framework in WordPress. They have empowered over 600,000 domain, and they act as a customizable foundation where you can build WordPress website. And a lot of team creators actually utilize this foundation to build a child teams. And I'm really happy to say that they decided to include AMP compatibility on their upcoming release of 3.0, which will be out in June. So stay tuned for that. And I'm personally really excited about this news because this will accelerate creation of AMP compatible teams. And not only that, this will give option to website owners. And just to give you a glimpse of beautiful AMP compatible teams that you can build with Genesis Framework, here's one example. This page is actually on AMP pages, and you can see it's equally beautiful and performed really well. So that's it from me. Just to recap, we've seen the importance of speed and how that correlates with publisher's win, and that publisher can leverage AMP plugin to achieve this goal and win their users. And most importantly, as developers here, I really hope that you'll be part of this ecosystem and help more and more WordPress users to achieve fast website. With that, I would like to call Alberto back on stage to share with us what's coming up next on the pipeline. Thank you. That is super awesome. And I would like to give a shout also to Katya and Igor from Setka that are here. And um, where are you? Yeah, so great work. <laughs> Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so certainly we have gone a long way during the past year, but there is still a lot of road ahead of us to, work, to get where we want to be. Uh, so to give you a just an, in a nutshell where we are going to be concentrated uh, the year to come until the next app comp, it basically four main areas. The first one is staying in sync with this continuous flow of innovation that keeps coming from the AMP project. So we want to make sure that we stay in sync with the AMP project so that the WordPress ecosystem doesn't meet one bit of it. The second area is we want to expand the capabilities of the plugin in terms of the level of automation that it provides, as well as the developer tooling and guidance that it provides for developers to do the part that they need to develop, uh, to do manually. Then, we want to make the plugin very easy to, to use as part of larger ecosystem solutions that remove friction points to bring the power of AMP to the whole WordPress ecosystem. And finally, we want to engage with those ecosystem players on building and developing and advancing those ecosystem solutions. Uh, and one more thing. So last uh, yesterday, you saw from Hon and John the awesome pro progress that has been made by the AMP Stories team. Um, and I'm very excited to announce that AMP Stories are coming to WordPress natively via a new capability of the AMP plugin that allows you to create fully featured AMP Stories, taking advantage of all the content management capabilities of the WordPress platform. Imagine that you are a writer or a content creator for a WordPress site that belongs to a company that sells travel packages. Your job is to write content pages for advertising and describing the travel adventures that the company sells. With AMP Story creation natively in WordPress, you can now expand the experience that you're going to provide to your users by creating awesome AMP Stories, embedding them in the content that you create in WordPress, and sharing them just by providing an URL in the domain of your WordPress site. This here is an example site. Oh. OK, is that, is that example? Oh, it's not going to work. Yeah. So this card here corresponds to the, to the packages uh, pages. Let's click. I want to go to Rome, because my friends from Italy just gave a talk. So we're going to go. And this is a description for the Rome. And this is an AMP story embedded directly on my page. So now we're going to click there. And now the user is imagining how the trip to Rome is going to be, engaging, you know, feeling excited about it. Uh, make, starting to make plans, you know, dreaming about it. And then at the end of the story, they can go back directly to the site and perhaps buy it. So this is something very exciting because it's going to open up the kind of experience that, we, that you can provide to your users. We don't have time to go 
over a full demo of the editor, but we created this time lapse of the full creation of the story that you just saw to give you an idea, if this is going to work, of how the content creation works for the AMP stories and also to spark your curiosity. Okay, so this is going to be high speed, but I just want to, get to tell you what we wanted to do. Gutenberg is a new editor that it was introduced to the WordPress platform recently, and it's a blog-based editor that has opened a world of possibilities to the WordPress ecosystem. And our main goal was to create an AMP Stories editing experience fully integrated with Gutenberg and the general content workflow, content creation workflow in WordPress. Um, the challenge that we faced was to provide a storytelling creation experience that actually bends Gutenberg to the needs of AMP Stories while maintaining the use of the editor as familiar as any other content creation on the platform. And the result, I am happy to say that we are succeeding, uh, is an AMP Stories WordPress editor that provides a very intuitive workflow with sensitive or uh, sensible uh, default. It gives you awesome templates to get you started with awesome story creation very quickly. It provides horizontal navigation during creation, which is actually contrary to the way that Gutenberg works normally in the vertical mode, and many other features that I hope that you're going to go and experiment very uh, soon. Um, the development of the editor is still taking place. It's going to be available in 1.2 version of the plugin. Right now we are in 1.1, and we are releasing today, um, or around today, uh, hopefully there was a little thing that we were fixing, but you know, um, th the beta version of that, the, of the plugin, so you can download it from the GitHub repository on the AMP, on the AMP project and start playing with it. If you do, please reach out. We are eager to work with you to make this story editing experience as much as enriching as possible. So. This is a lot of information that you can get later from the recording. There are links about the plugin, about the AMP project, the new AMP dev experience that is super duper awesome, and also a link to go and download the AMP Stories uh, beta plugin and start experimenting with it. And with that, uh, thank you very much, and I will see you next year in AMCOM. Alberto and Jenny. I really love that talk because of all of the hands that went up in the audience, proving that AMP is really a community effort to get all of these things out and open into the wild. So coming up next, we're going to have um, our very last talk of AMPConf 2019, feeling a lot of bittersweetness over here. Um, and I can sense it over there. I see smiles. I see some tears. We're laughing while we're crying. Um, and this next one is going to be about AMP analytics and what that's going to be looking like going forward. And I would really like to invite you to stay tuned because there's going to be a special surprise at the end. So please give a round of applause for Jeffrey, who has already joined me on stage. Thank you. Wow, we made it. This is the very, very last talk of AmpConf, and I'm super, super thrilled to be here. My name is Jeffrey, and I'm the product manager on AMP, working on the AMP analytics efforts. Um, so over the past two days, we've seen the AMP's mission several times. I think it's worth looking at it one more time. Provide a user-first format for web content, supporting the long-term su success of every publisher, merchant, and advertiser. As you see, long-term success is at the core of AMP's mission. And I'm happy to walk you through some of the things that we are doing on AMP Analytics directly supporting that. So when we set out to build AMP Analytics three and a half years back, you know, we knew that we were, had to build something really fast, something that was very flexible so that plugins and vendors could actually integrate on. And moreover, we had to be accurate. There is no point having bad data. So we often see developers on non-AMP pages tack on tag after tag onto AMP non-AMP pages. Most of these times, these tags do somewhat of the same thing. Now, nobody really wants to touch it because it just works. Now, AMP analytics takes a radically different approach here. In some senses, this is a very, very much a natural thing to do. It is a true measure once, notify many model. Uh, on an AMP page, when you integrate one more vendor, 
you are doing an O of one operation on a non-AMP page, that would have been O of N. Some of the biggest names uh, are already integrated with AMP analytics, and you can see that on the, on the screen right now. Uh, these are all analytics vendors that work with AMP analytics today, and I'm pretty sure that most of you are already using them. In fact, the growth that we've seen is tremendous. We started with just one in 2015, and we are over 70 today. And that would not have been possible without the vibrant community that is actually present in this room today. So thank you. Thank you so much for integrating with AMP Analytics and pushing and taking this open web forward. Now, if you're an AMP Analytics vendor who has not yet integrated with AMP Analytics, I encourage you to look at Bitly AMP Analytics integration. It is super easy to get started, and we have a lot of great documentation that walks you through how you can do it. A recent study from the University of Oxford found that, on average, new site sets almost eight times as many third-party cookies. Now, it is of no surprise that browser vendors have started responding with certain restrictions around third-party cookies. Unfortunately, without reliable metrics, it is hard to set the direction for the business. And that is why we launched AMP Linker last year. It is a framework that keeps sessions in sync. So if you own A.com and B.com, you can actually keep those things in sync. Now, what's more, this actually works great with AMP Cache and Origin. So if you've not taken a look at it, I encourage you to look at it. It is super easy to, again, get started. If you're using Google Analytics, it just requires one line change there. Now, if you're using Google's one global site tag, it is already enabled for you. You don't need to do anything. Let's dive a little deeper. If you are using your own analytics, you can set up linker like so. Here I'm specifying use a key called variable one, and I'm passing a bunch of values that I care about. And these help me keep my sessions in sync. Um, Google Analytics and Segment already supports this today. And if you're an analytics partner that is not, take, is not taking advantage of AMP linker, again, I encourage you to take a look at it. The details are super easy, and the link is also super easy. It's bit.ly slash AMP linker. All right, that's great. I love data if you have not figured it out by now. But there is one thing that I do not really like, and that is noise, the spam. Spam comes in a lot of different flavors. You know, Some of them are OK. Some of them are actually malicious. Protecting your site against these unwanted visitors is something that reCAPTCHA excels in. And now, with reCAPTCHA version 3, there are no more friction between when your users are actually trying to accomplish something on your site. And I'm happy to announce today that AMP has full support for reCAPTCHA version 3. reCAPTCHA input is easy to use. It integrates directly into your form elements. And, re and reCAPTCHA version 3 gives you a score and that then you can use to take appropriate action. Here's a quick example of how that actually looks. Here you see a site key that is very, very specific to you. And then you, you get a token that then you give it to reCAPTCHA servers, who will then give you a score on 0 to 1. And based on your thresholds, you can take a further action, whether to stop someone from signing up or you know, send, writing a review on your site or things like that. And the best part is, Normal users never see a challenge. Some of those you know, identify what a car is and what is not a car. Tasty, one of the, one of the very, very popular names that all of us know, is, has already been using it. On the second image that you see there, they have an email sign up. And they've been testing reCAPTCHA on it. And the results that they've seen are tremendous. And they've, they've deployed this over 4,000 pages today. So again, if you, if you deal with unwanted visitors on your site, reCAPTCHA version 3 works today with AMP. And to find out more, check out bit.ly slash AMP reCAPTCHA. And with the launch of AMP reCAPTCHA, we're making it easy to get accurate metrics. Great. So when I think about someone implementing AMP analytics on a page, we walk through three steps. There is a setup phase that you actually integrate your triggers, set up variables, hook up you know, elements. Then there's a debug phase. Nothing goes 
correct the first time, uh, certainly not for me. So I spent a lot of time debugging my setup. And then finally, I play with dashboards, look at pretty charts, try to find out insights from the page. Let's talk a, lot, uh, a little bit about the setup phase. When I talk to partners who are implementing AMP analytics, they are often not starting from scratch. More often than not, they have an existing analytics configuration that they want to bring over. You've got to figure out what technology works already in non-AMP page that can be ported over. And then there is the added complexity of understanding how AMP analytics need to be set up. It is fairly standardized, but that, that is one more thing to learn. I'm happy to present AMP Readiness, a Chrome extension that lets you get started with AMP analytics super duper easy. It looks like this, as you see on the screen. We recognize what technologies are actually used on the page, and we sort them into what is supported on AMP and what is not supported. So it's great because there is nothing that is really not supported on AMP. There's a little bit of, and you see an icon right next to some of the, some of the names there. That actually tells you, actually, when I go ahead and click it, that gives me copy-pasteable code. So no more hunting for documentation and reference material. It is right there for you. All you need to change is a couple of variables, possibly your account number, in this case with GA. We support 20 different uh, vendors today, and we are adding more. This engine uses Vapalizer under the hood, so we are very confident that the, 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 the technologies that are detected are actually accurate. Go over to bit.ly slash amp readiness to download the plugin, and uh, we want to hear your feedback on this. Let's talk about validating AMP analytics setup. One thing that developers validate, need to validate is how identifiers are passed between uh, sites. You know, you got you to gotta turn on Chrome DevTools, hunt for a particular request, look at the cookies, what the value is. It can take a little bit of time. Today, I'm happy to announce AMP Tag Test, a service that automates these mundane identifier testing. AMP Tag Test takes your URL and runs a battery of tests against it. And we do this twice, one for Chrome and one with Safari emulation, so that we can test whether identifiers are actually passed correctly. And what are some of these identifiers? These are identifiers such as GCLID, GCLSRC, which are very critical if you have ads on your page. And we summarize all of these things into a nice little table so you can feel confident that things are working correctly. Now, if you want to debug further, we also give you more information. Uh, we show you what cookie values were found between what, from the source to the destination. Now, let me quickly go back. Uh, so some of these things are also configurable. So you can change your user agent. You can change um, what the click-through click URL that you care about. And the great thing is we store these results so that you can share the URL with the report with others in case you want to take, have someone else take a look at it. It's available today at amptagtest.appspot.com or bit.ly slash amptagtest. Now let's turn our attention to the last phase of analytics, reporting. This is arguably the most important phase. It's probably why you set up AMP analytics. At Google, we have a lot of experience building AMP pages and looking at metrics. But one thing that we find out is publishers need to go through the same process again and again. So we asked ourselves, can we make this easy? Why should publisher, publishers have to set up everything from scratch? If only there existed some sort of a dashboard template that we can actually share, then you can get started and get going very, very quickly. That's when we heard about a product called Google Data Studio. It is exactly what we were looking for. It is a dashboard template. And what's great is you bring your data to it, and it shows you the results. And I'm happy to announce today that we are launching AMP Insights. AMP Insights, as I mentioned, you can bring your data, use the expertise that we've built over several years at Google to power some of the charts and dashboards that you might have. We've done the heavy lifting for you. As you see here, all the top line metrics that you care about, number of sessions, number of page views, all of them are ready. So if you are dabbling with AMP and if you're worried about how analytics should look like, this is a great opportunity. This dashboard can save you a lot of time, and it actually shows you all the relevant metrics that you care for. There are some nice positive trends. I really like looking at the positive trends uh, in some of these charts up there. 
Um, if you're doing A-B testing, comparing some of the old performances with AMP's performance, we have that ready to go. You can configure what URLs you care. We also break down by devices. So if you care about what the performance of a certain device versus others, certain country versus another, uh, that is all ready to go. So we built this so that you can get to your insights much faster. AMP Analytics, I'm sorry, AMP Insights are available today at bit.ly slash AMP Insights. All right, so I've talked a lot about you know, looking at data, getting insights, but I've conveniently avoided one point. How do we even generate this data? It's sort of like a chicken and egg problem, really. So do we launch something and then measure and then say, oh my god, let's go back and do it all over again? Or do we do something that is already very safe? I don't think that is how we should be doing things. A-B testing is a principal way of doing a testing and iterating. A-B testing simply takes the guesswork out of the equation. So you launch two, ver two or more versions of something, you test against all of those, and you pick the winner. In fact, you see A-B testing on most of the pages on the web today. But unfortunately, A-B testing has, comes at a cost. This comes at a cost in terms of performance for the user, who are really, they are the folks that you're trying to win and make a loyal customer in the long term. AMP has long supported A-B testing through the component called AMP Experiment. But it has required developers to build the site with A-B testing in mind. But you have told us that that is not how companies operate. You have a base page, and someone comes along and says, you know what, I need to experiment on certain things. In fact, developer teams build the page, and then there is a separate team. Some call it marketing, some call it SEO, some call it growth. They come on top of it and then start experimenting. So we figured that we could do a lot more work here. And most of these times, th these teams rely on a third-party A-B testing vendor to run these experiments, look at the results, and uh, do other things. I'm happy to announce today that we are working with Optimizely and Oracle Maximizer to bring true A-B testing to AMP pages. In the updated version, the co component integrates seamlessly with your, your choice of A-B testing vendor. Your teams can retain the same workflow, and you know that they are AMP pages because there is no impact to performance. In fact, I'm really thrilled to show you a demo of AMP experiment working with Optimizely right now. So Action Network is a, is a media company that is direct to consumer that creates a lot of original content. So here I am on their NFL, NHL page. They create original content like articles such as these. You know, you can see this is a beautiful AMP page. There's a lot of great content in it. At the top, you see a banner. That banner invites the users to su subscribe to a premium product. They call it the Edge. Now you see it's already green in color, but the growth teams at the experiment teams at Action Network has a hypothesis. Maybe we should test with a different color. Maybe the wording could be changed. So they rely on Optimizely to actually accomplish some of these things. So let's see how you would do that in Optimizely. So here I am with, in Optimizely's homepage. I'm going to go ahead and create a new experiment. Right off the bat, you see that the, you see the AMP logo there. That means A-B testing is actually supported in Optimizely's UI. All right, I want to do A-B test. I'm going to name it AMP Comp Demo. I'll pull this URL because this is where I want to test. While it spins up, Optimizely is already going to give me two variations. There's an original variation which is what I would call as control. I'm not going to touch that. And then there's a variation one, you know, some, some funky colors that I might want to try. Maybe a pink, maybe an orange. I don't know. All right, so let's go to original here. If you've never seen Optimizer's UI, on the right side, you see the exact same page. The page is loaded. On the left side, you see a place where I can edit attributes. All right, so in the original, I'm not going to touch anything, but it looks good. I'm going to go to variation one here. You know what? I want to change the color of this. It's as easy as selecting there. 
scroll down here, maybe you change the background, you know what, I want to try a blue now. 0079 F0. All right, and I'm going to save. So in fact, before I walked in, I actually set up this thing so that we could save some time. Let me show you that really quick. So I have four variations here, and this is actually what Action Network is running today. They have two variations of green with different texts, and last two are two variations of blue with different texts as well. In fact, this looks like this. And this is actually what we are trying to test against. The original, you saw the green. The variation one with a different text there, variation two with blue and blue. And the text also comes from this hypothesis that maybe we need to have an assertive message, something that actually talks to the user in, to have an emotional connect. All right, so th this is the part that is going to be a little nerve-wracking for me. As you know, A-B testing is actually random. And I'm trying to show you how I can fall into these things. So I'm going to throw my dice a couple of times, and hopefully things will work out. All right, I'm going to open Incognito. Let me, let me pick up the URL. I'm going to go to Google. All right, I'm going to click here. Let's see what bucket I fall into right now. There you go. It is showing me the blue. And if I look closely, uh, this is probably the variation four. I'm sorry, variation three. That's actually what I'm seeing here. Now, let me try that one more time. Oh, this is again the blue. All right. I will try this one more. Nope, it is the same thing. <laughs> Worry not. I have a way. So let me see if I can force variation one into this. This is a way that you, as a developer, can test. There is no reason to throw the dice and hope that something would work. AMP experiment gives you a way to force you to do a certain experiment. So you know what? I'm going to do variation one right now. I have the URL copied here. I go here. It's going to show me variation two here. And you see that at the top, that actually forces me to go to that. And this is a great way of testing. Let me pick up variation two. If all goes well, this is going to show me blue here with a different text than before. So I want to highlight two more partners here. You already saw Optimizely working with Action Network. Oracle Maximizer, as I mentioned, is working with Signet Jewelers, a really big jewelry retailer. In fact, they have over 3,500 stores in the US, and they operate brands such as Jared, Zales, Ed Samuel, and many, many more. Exceptional user experience is a top of mind for them, which is why they dabble with experimentation and personalization. Partnerships such as these not only help push the, the web forward, but is also great for the business. So I showed you a bunch of things today. Here's a quick recap. I showed you AMP Linker, a great way to keep sessions in sync between your domains. Works great between AMP cache and your origin as well. Bitly slash AMP Linker is a place that you want to go. AMP Recapture, we're bringing Recapture version 3 to AMP. Bitly AMP Recapture helps you protect against unwanted visitors, the spam, from, from your site. AMP Readiness is a Chrome extension that I showed you that helps you quickly get started with AMP Analytics. There is copy-pasteable snippets so that you don't have to worry about typos. AMP Tag Test is a way to automate ID testing. You don't have to play around and fiddle around with Chrome Dev Tools. We've done the heavy lifting for you. AMP Insights is a great way to get started with reporting in AMP Analytics. We are leaning onto the years of experience at Google in building out this dashboard template so that you can bring your data and see the results without knowing, without, without having to worry about what actually, what custom dimensions need to be set, what custom reports need to be set, and things like that. And finally, I showed you about AMP Experiment. AMP Experiment, we are bringing true A-B testing to AMP pages without compromising on AMP, uh, on the speed of AMP. 
Optimizely is in closed beta right now. They are looking for partners. So talk to your account managers at Optimizely if you're a customer. Oracle Maximizer is working on their product as well. Talk to your account manager uh, if you're interested in Oracle's product as well. In closing, I want you to leave with one of my favorite quotes. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. I hope with the tools that I showed you today, you and your business can be set up for a long-term success using AMP. Thank you again for joining here at Tokyo, and thank you for your attention. It was amazing two days for me. あの、今日もこんな風な形でアンプコンフが終えられたこと本当にこの会場に来てくださってそしてライブストリームにいらっしゃる皆さんのおかげだと思います。本当にありがとうございました。Big, big thank you to all of all of the AMP contributors, um, and the, yeah, I, I lost for words. <laughs> you can do it. I know it. Yeah. Um, arigatou gozaimashita. <laughs> and uh, of course, a big thank you to all the crew, everyone who has been tirelessly working on making this event a big success. Uh, all of the speakers, of course, as well. Uh, everyone who helped uh, create the panels, all the panelists, uh, all of them have came, come together to make this event a great success. So, thank you. <laughs> or, as in, uh, in Japanese, you would say, I guess, uh, otsukare. Otsukare, otsukare. <laughs> Might be too early to say otsukare. <laughs> Maybe a bit too early. <laughs> all right. Um, I guess that's really it, yeah. Uh, we don't have much more to say um, other than thank you. And uh, uh, one more thing, actually, uh, maybe you can all stand up because we want to like uh, want to do one big picture with all of you in the room. So we're just. Just to stand up, you can all stand up. So we're just. Just to stand up, you can all stand up. We had the whole AMP team come in as well. Um, Malte, come up here. Yay! Woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, すごい、すごい。Nice. Thank you so much, everyone. どうも皆さんありがとうございました。本当に2日間お疲れ様でした。本当に。最高でした。See you next year. Yeah. <laughs> See you on the AMP webs. Thank you very much.